introduce some concepts and talk about what we mean about computer security and network security. Because we're going to focus this topic more on network security. And we'll try and explain the difference. What is security? Uh, here's a definition of computer security. The protection afforded to an automated information system in order to attain the applicable objectives in preserving integrity, availability and confidentiality of information system resources. So here's one definition coming from the National Institute of Standards, NIST, an organization in the US that, among other things, creates a lot of standards about security protocols and techniques and their view of what they mean by computer security. So, an automated information system, think of a computer system, whether it's one computer or many computers connected together, some computer system, we want to protect it to achieve some ad objectives and the ob objectives are preserving integrity, availability and confidentiality of some resources. Okay, so, protect our system to uh, make sure, well, we preserve integrity, availability and confidentiality. We need to define those three uh, objectives and we'll do that on the next slide, talk about what they mean. Here's another definition, actually from the textbook by Stallings, about network security. Measures to deter, prevent, detect, correct security violations that involve the transmission of information. So, network security is about when we're sending information across some network, some computer network. Computer security is more general. Computer security includes network security, but computer security also includes the security of the actual PC or computer itself. So we can have computer security issues without having a network at all. I need my own laptop, I need to protect uh, the files on it, I may want to encrypt. They are issues of computer security but not network security. Network security is when we want to send data between two computers or between many computers. So we're going to focus in this course mainly on uh, network security. So some aspects of computer security we'll skip over, we'll not cover. And what's the main network that we use every day? The internet, so sometimes referred to as net internet security. But the first definition mentioned these three things, confidentiality, integrity and availability. CIA. The tri triad of CIA, as some people refers to it. The most important objectives in securing a system. We'll see some definitions a little bit later of those three again, but confidentiality, keeping things secret, keeping information secret. A common objective is if I send information from one computer to another, and that information is authorized for use only by that other computer or the user of that other computer, I don't want someone else, as I send it across the network, to be able to intercept and read that information. I want to keep that information confidential. Okay. So that's the idea of confidentiality. Keep information private or secret or confidential. Integrity is making sure the information is not changed. So it's related to confidentiality, but we also want to make sure if I send information from one computer to another, then the information received by the destination computer is exactly the same as what was sent by the source computer. It would be bad if I have an email message and I'm saying, sending an email to someone, uh, what's an example? I'm sending an email to the secretary saying, change this student's grade from A to B. No, no, that's a bad example. Change this student's grade from B to C. Okay, I made a mistake with marking, so I sent an email to the secretary saying, this student needs their grade change from B to C. 
But w one of the students, and that one uh, that the email is about, somehow intercepts a message on the network and modifies the message and changes the message to say, change the e grade from B to A. It's received by the secretary. The secretary thinks it came from me. It did originally, but it's been modified along the way. That's what we don't want. Integrity is about not allowing that to happen. Maintain the integrity of the data. That's a common requirement or objective of security. And availability is the other common objective of security. We have a network and we have a computer system which has normal users. We want to make sure that network and computer system is available to those normal users. It would be bad if that network becomes unavailable due to some malicious actions. So an example is a web server. Web server is part of our network or an entity in our network. It has the role of, say, the Amazon web server. Right? It's just spread across many web servers. But think of Amazon, the company. They sell many things via their web server. They make billions of dollars by people going to their website and ordering products. What if the Amazon web server was not available for 24 hours? Something happened. There was an attack on the web server, which mean it was down. Well, I'm sure the company Amazon would lose millions of dollars in lost sales if the web server was down for a day. If no one could access Amazon for a day, then that would be a financial loss to the company. So some security attacks try to make the service unavailable. Availability is the objective, okay, our system must be available to the intended users. We shouldn't allow it to become unavailable. Now the three key objectives of securing networks. Some related ones or other ones which are also considered important. This is one of the earlier um, concepts that people arrived at, these three, but they later added talking about authenticity. Make sure that the data you receive is authentic, is genuine. It's coming from a genuine user. It's not coming from someone who's pretending to be someone else. And accountability. Make sure that if something goes wrong, we can track what went wrong and make someone accountable for what went wrong. For example, a student breaks into the ICT server and gets all the answers to the quizzes for this course. So you can do the quizzes on Moodle and get 100% all the time. Okay, if that happens, what I would like to be able to do is to detect that it happened and even better, trace back to which student did it. And then I can take action on that student. Outside of the network, I can take other action, like give them some penalty. So accountability is the ability to uh, detect things going wrong, keep traces and logs of what happens, so that later on you can respond and take action if things do go wrong in a network. So some of the objectives of securing computer systems and computer networks. What happens if something does go wrong? What if we have a security breach? How does it impact upon the users or an organization? Uh, there are different, different classifications to look at. Okay, when we're planning the, sec the security for our organization, we'd like to predict in advance. What if this goes wrong? What are the consequences? Here are some of the mo most common impacts of security breaches. The effectiveness of primary operations are reduced. That means if you think of an organization, a company, a university, SIT, what happens if someone breaks the security of our network, of our databases, of our servers? Well, one thing that can go wrong is that we have to spend a lot of time fixing and we waste time fixing what went wrong as opposed to 
uh, providing the normal service to students and others. That is, the organisation does not work as well if things go wrong. Uh, a simple example, I create an exam for this course, I store it on my office computer before the exam, you take, before you take the midterm exam, I create it a week before and I've prepared it, it's stored on my office computer. What happens if a student accesses that exam one week before the, the time for the exam? If I detect that, what happens? Well, it means I have to recreate the exam. I must rewrite the exam because I know if some students got the exam, most likely every student will have the answers by the time you sit the exam. That reduces my effectiveness. That is, I have to now rewrite the exam, wasting my time rewriting a second exam. I can spend less time doing the other things that I should be doing. So the effective, effectiveness of my operations are reduced in that case. Other impacts may be a financial loss. We lose money. Okay. The example for Amazon. If the Amazon web server goes down for a day because of some attack on the Amazon web server, the company will lose money. Okay. So that's a, a potential breach, a potential impact. Damage to assets, damage to hardware, damage to software. For example, someone gets access to uh, the source code of Microsoft Windows. They break into the Microsoft network and gets access to the original source code. And they make changes to the source code without people detecting. So we can think that that's going to potentially damage the, the software product that's produced. You can have damage to computer hardware. And the example I uh, was recent is uh, the Stux, Stuxnet worm. It was a worm uh, one or two years ago which was distributed by usually by USB keys. And there was a worm. And we talk about worms in one of our topics. Actually, no, I've removed that course. Uh, we may mention it. Um, I've removed the topic. But some malicious software such that it was carried on a USB key and when people plugged it into the computer it distributed onto the network and the target of this malicious software was the I think the centrifuges in a, a nuclear power reactor okay. and people think the target was one in Iran where this malicious software made this, the hardware, the centrifuge, operate in an uh, abnormal way. For example, make it go fast, faster than it, it should go, and which caused the hardware to break down, which had the effect of then they cannot process the, the material that they wanted to process. So that was a case of a soft malicious software, which was part of a so, uh, security attack, that damaged some assets, in this case hardware assets. You've seen on movies or TV shows maybe that People can break into the, the heart monitors and the, the, uh, the heart rate controllers that people wear. And in theory, if you could attack that and make it do something that it's not supposed to do, you could have an impact on someone and harm individuals. Okay. So the impacts of security breaches may be very small. I have to rewrite an exam to be very serious, financial, human loss of life, uh, and damage to assets. There are different approaches to, from an organization's perspective to think, okay, in advance, what are the potential breaches that can occur? What are the likely impacts? And to give some ratings to look at, well, what actions should I take to make sure those impacts uh, are minimized? And there are some standards that we won't go through that talk about that. We need to treat security uh, importantly. We need to uh, consider it carefully because the impacts may be large. Let's look at a, a view of or a perspective of network security and the components of securing computer networks. 
And this perspective comes from ITU, uh, the International Telecommunications Union. They create standards about telecommunications, including securing computer networks. We don't care so much about that they created it and how the standard is. Uh, there's some document that describes security aspects from their perspective. We're going to use the notation and terminology that they introduce to talk about what we require for computer security. And the main things that they introduce that we'll, we'll use is that they talk about security aspects. Attacks, mechanisms and services. So we'll define those three over the next few slides. Different types of security attacks, mechanisms and services. And some terminology we'll use is we'll talk about a threat and an attack. We have some desire for operating our organization network or computer system in some way and we usually define some policy that we'd like. For example, a policy should be uh, no student can access the exam on my computer. Okay? That's obvious, a simple policy from my perspective of who can access that information. A threat is a potential violation of some security policy. So my policy or my aim, no student can access the exam on my computer, there are some threats. One threat is that a student walks into my office and takes my computer and then they can access the exam. Another threat potentially is that they can get remote access over a network to my computer. Okay, so there are multiple threats that are potential violations of my policy in that case. An attack is an, a an assault on a system that comes from a threat. In simple terms, an attack is a threat carried out. So the threat is that someone takes my computer and reads the exam. Well, an attack would be if someone actually comes and grabs my computer and, and reads the exam. So an attack is an actual implementation of a threat. Who performs attacks? I'm not sure if there's a slide about this, maybe later, but some terminology for what do we call someone who performs an attack. Sometimes we'll talk about an attacker, maybe a malicious user, uh, an adversary is another word used. Um, sometimes you'll hear a hacker, someone hacks into the network. Okay, I'll usually use malicious user or an attacker. But when we talk about all the techniques through this course, when we talk about the attacker or malicious user, they don't necessarily have to be a bad person. Sometimes the attack may be coming from someone who's doing something good or something legal. Okay. Uh, law enforcement agencies may use legal techniques to intercept other people's messages and read other people's messages. From the perspective of the security technique, they are the attacker or malicious user. But they may be doing something good or legal. Okay. So. When I say malicious user, I don't always mean someone who's bad. Often the case. Let's look at those three aspects. What is a security attack, mechanism, and service? An attack, an action that attempts to compromise the security of information or facilities. Information or facilities, so information, data, Facilities, think of hardware or software, or even communication lines. Compromise them to get access to information that they shouldn't be allowed to, to modify information to make the system unavailable, for example. A threat is a potential violation of security. An attack is an actual violation. We usually analyze the threats, look at what are the possible threats, and try and implement measures so that the attacks cannot occur, or successful attacks cannot occur. A security mechanism is a method for preventing, detecting, or recovering from an attack. Right? I'd like to prevent attacks. So if I know of some threat, I would apply some mechanism to prevent an attack from being successful. 
I know the threat for someone accessing the exam on my computer. One threat is that they take the laptop and then just read the file from my computer. Well, what mechanism could I use in that case? To prevent that attack, what could I use? Guessing from Sorry? Guessing from locks. Guessing. Guessing from locks. Now, why don't they use to lock the laptop? Yeah, OK. All right. Physical locks on the, on the laptop. What else? Yep, correct. I, I can't. I can't uh, secure my computer all the time physically. What else could I do such that even if someone steals my laptop, they cannot read the exam on my laptop? Encrypted? Password, I hear. OK, some, some basic techniques. And we'll, through this course, we'll look at how effective they may, may be. But OK. If I have a password to log into my laptop, such that if I leave it for five minutes, I need to type the password again, then that may provide some primitive protection. We may see how effective it is later. Or I could make sure the file is encrypted, so that to unencrypt, to decrypt, I need, again, some password or special key to, to read it. More generally, encrypt the hard disk, even if someone can steal my hard disk, access the computer, log into the computer, they still need some password to decrypt the hard disk. So there may be ways to prevent or to... There may be mechanisms. There's a threat and we can apply mechanisms to try and prevent an attack. But sometimes we cannot prevent an attack. So the next best thing is try and detect if an attack has or is occurring. Uh, maybe hard on the laptop, but in some other cases we can detect that something's, uh, some attack is occurring. And if we can detect, either we can quickly try and respond or we can take other means to try and recover. Again, if I detect, if I could detect that if someone got hold of the exam, if I could trace it back to you, then that acts as a good deterrence from you trying to access the exam. Because if you know, it's very easy to steal my laptop, but if you steal the laptop and read the exam, if you knew I could trace that back to you as an individual, then unlikely you're going to do, do that. I know no one's going to steal my laptop anyway, but if we had a malicious user, the, active, or the deterrence is also a good mechanism. Because if I can trace back to you, I can take other action. So there are different mechanisms for doing this, for detecting, preventing, recovering. And in fact, this course is about those mechanisms. We'll look at those mechanisms in this course. Security service, we use the mechanisms to improve or enhance the security of our information and facilities. So we stop attacks. We can think of the services as some requirements what we'd like to achieve. So the next few slides go through services, attacks then services. Let's go through attacks first. Now my example of the laptop is maybe not the best one for this course because we're going to focus on network communications. So we're not going to deal with, okay, what if someone uh, steals my laptop? But we're going to deal with the cases, all right, what if I send the exam in an email to the secretary to print, can someone intercept across the network and steal the exam that way? Let's look at security attacks and classify them. First classification of security attacks on networks, uh, passive and active. A passive attack makes use of some information to perform the attack, but it doesn't affect the system resources. So the system consists of the users, the computers, and the network. A passive attack doesn't modify how the system operates. It just observes, but still performs an attack. 
Uh, all right, we'll define active and then we'll compare them in a moment. An active attack somehow modifies or alters how the system works, the resources or operations. Let's come back and talk about them after we go through some specific instances. So with passive attack, there are two types we'll talk about, releasing the message contents and traffic analysis, and then with active, four types. So I'm going to go through those six specific attacks, and then we'll come back and explain again what we mean by passive and active. It'll become clearer, and we'll compare them. So now let's go through six attacks. And these nice pictures from the textbook I'm going to use to, to illustrate. So we have a communications network with some users. This picture shows, okay, as the blue cloud is the network, whether it's some link, or it's the entire internet, but some network that users use to communicate with each other. And in this example, we have Alice and Bob, two normal users of the network. They're not malicious, they're just normal users. And Bob sends information to Alice. That's the normal operation. He sends emails or messages to Alice. For example, um, Bob and Alice work in the same company and Bob is sending some uh, secrets of the company to Alice. Uh, some secret designs of their new product that they're going to build and sell. Okay. Now, an attack where we release the message contents is one of the most obvious ones, the one that most people think about when we talk about cryptography, is that we have some malicious user, Darth in this example, that somehow, as Bob sends messages to Alice's, to Alice, gets gets that message and is able to read the contents of that message. So we show it as the message going to Alice and also going to Darth. And Darth can read the contents of the message if the message is some secret designs of their up-and-coming product and if Darth is a competitor then he can go and build the product and sell it first. So this is the case of an attack where we release the message contents. Same as if I send the exam to the secretary to print I'm Bob, Alice is the secretary, and some student intercepts somehow on the network and reads the exam, then that's an attack that releases the message contents. Okay. This is the case where we'd like to keep that message confidential. Note that and let's try and explain an active and passive. This is an example of a passive attack. Imagine there's no attack. Darth is not there. Then what happens? Bob has a message and sends it across the network to Alice. That is, Bob sends one message. Alice receives that same message, that identical message, if there was no attack in that case. Now, we introduce the attack. Bob sends the same message. Alice receives that message, but with the attack, Darth also receives the message. But from the perspective of Bob and Alice, nothing has changed. Whether there's an attack or no attack, from the normal user's perspective, from the system's perspective, nothing's changed. And that's why it's called a passive attack. Nothing has been altered from the normal system operation, but still an attack has occurred. Here's another passive attack, traffic analysis. Bob sends messages to Alice in the normal operation. In this attack, while Bob is sending messages to Alice, Darth, the malicious user, somehow intercepts those messages, may not be able to read the contents of those messages, but can make some conclusions based upon observing the messages being sent, the time when they're sent, the frequency that they're sent for example. So by analyzing the messages being sent, by analyzing the traffic on the network, the attacker, the malicious user, may be able to make some conclusions which they couldn't make without analyzing them.
an example. Uh, Bob is, let's see, Bob is a, a known terrorist. Okay? Law enforcement agency uh, know that Bob is some terrorist. He's done some, done some illegal things in the past. And they're monitoring what Bob is sending. And it turns out they also know Alice is a, some potential terrorist. And the malicious user, Darth, here is the law enforcement agency that monitors how these two entities are communicating. And by monitoring as to how many messages are sent, at what time of day, uh, from what computer addresses they're being sent from, they may be able to make observations about what potentially may happen. For example, they see that over a period of one month there are no messages, and then on one day there's a lot of messages from Bob to Alice, and they make the conclusion or they infer that that may mean that some attack is about to occur. So by analyzing the frequency of communication, the malicious user can make some observations. Even without seeing the contents of the messages, even if they cannot see what's inside the messages, just seeing that there are messages sent can be an attack. And I think most of you heard about Snowden and the NSA and, and what's happening with uh, the, the revelation that NSA are monitoring many US citizens. Well, it was revealed that they are monitoring not the actual phone calls, not the contents of what people are saying on the phones, but just monitoring who you're calling and when you're calling. So that would be considered a traffic analysis attack, to be able to make observations not based on the contents of the message, but just on who the messages are going to and how often, when they're going to people, is some form of an attack. It's still a passive attack. With no attack, Bob sends messages to Alice. With the attack, from Bob and Alice's perspective, nothing changes. So the system resources have not been modified. Go back to the first one. How do we protect? protect? What's a security mechanism to stop the release of message contents? What's a mechanism we can use? I send the exam to the secretary across the Wi-Fi network in SIT. I want her to print it. How can I stop someone from receiving the message and reading the exam contents? What's a mechanism we can use? I'm sure you know of, of something. You've probably used it in many cases. Anyone? I could encrypt the message, encrypt the file. What I do is I take the exam file, I encrypt it using some software, and I don't send the original exam file, I send the encrypted form of that exam across the network, from Bob to Alice. It's encrypted. And what happens, even though the malicious user may receive that message, the encrypt encryption should be done such that without having some special secret, a key or a password, if you receive the message, you cannot get the original contents back. Okay. So even though the malicious user receives the message, they cannot see the contents of the message. So encryption is a common mechanism used to prevent such attacks. And in a lot of this course we'll talk about, well, what is encryption and, and what are the algorithms that can be used for encryption. What about traffic analysis? How do I stop some malicious user from analyzing the patterns of communications between Bob and Alice? Does encryption help? 
encryption doesn't help in this case because Darth is not care, does not care necessarily about the contents of the messages. Even if they're encrypted, he still sees that Bob is sending messages to Alice. Still knows the time of day, how often. How could I stop that attack? Stop someone from analysing the traffic? Any ideas? Send, send some fake messages? change the pattern of communication. So let's say normally Bob sends, uh, was, is going to send three messages to Alice, uh, uh, one every minute, then and from that pattern of one every minute, Darth makes some observations, then what Bob can do is change the pattern in which they communicate by sending some fake messages in there. Uh, sending at different times at different frequencies. So by changing the pattern you may be able to hide your communication patterns. Not easy though. Okay? And changing your patterns of communications is an inconvenience as well. It introduce, introduces some overhead uh, and some inconvenience for the users. Keep going. Another attack, an active attack, masquerade. Masquerade means pretend to be someone else. Bob and Alice, normal users. Alice is the, the finance officer for the organization. Bob is the, the CEO or the director of SIT. And normally what happens is at the end of the financial year, Bob sends a message to Alice saying uh, potentially about increasing or decreasing the salary of employees. And when Alice receives a message from Bob, she changes the, the salaries in, in the database. Well, what happens in this case is Darth, a malicious user, pretends to be Bob, sends Alice an email saying, from Bob, I am Bob, please increase the salary of Steve by 10,000 baht. Okay, so, or in salary of Darth in this case. One user pretends to be another user to do something malicious. How do we stop that? How, how can we stop some malicious user from sending messages pretended, pretending to be from Bob? Use some kind of digital signature. Signature. All right. Correct. And let's step back. Well, first, we cannot stop Darth from sending messages to Alice normally. Okay. So we cannot stop Darth from sending them to Alice. What we want to do is make sure Alice can detect if it's from Bob or if it's from someone pretending to be from Bob. That's what we need to do. The receiver needs to be able to verify the message that they receive, who did it really come from? And the concept is called authentication. The receiver wants to be able to authenticate who is the original source. And one mechanism is using digital signatures. We'll see other mechanisms in this course. And that's related to this one of this fa uh, famous comic on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog because when someone posts something on the internet or you uh, visit a website, you don't know what's at the other endpoint. In the internet, there's no inbuilt mechanism for authenticating users. So it's very hard to trust what you receive on the internet. A replay attack. Here. Bob the director, or the, the, the boss, normally, no attack, normally sends a message to Alice, please increase the salary of Darth by 10,000 baht. Okay, that's the typical message, because Darth did some good work. Salary rise. One month later, da no, when that normal message was sent, Darth intercepted and took a copy of that message. It was from Bob. It had Bob's signature. 
One month later, Darth replays that same message, sends it to Alice. Alice receives a message from Bob, signed by Bob, increase the salary of Darth by 10,000 baht. So now she's received two messages saying increase the salary of Darth by 10,000 baht, so it's now up 20,000 baht. Okay, the first month and the second month. So in this case, the malicious user intercepts a message, a normal message, and at some time later resends or replays that message to achieve some outcome. So a replay attack. How do we stop that? Same message, yes. Replay the exact same message, not modified. Then we need to keep track of time. Okay? In the first message that Bob sends, he dates the, the message saying, this is on the, the 12th of November 2013, please increase the, the salary by 10,000. If Darth replays that exact same message one month later, Alice receives it in December, but it says it's in November. Hopefully Alice is smart enough to realize that, okay, this something's gone wrong here. Let's take some action. Okay. And of course, this is just a simplistic example. In network protocols, we can automate those techniques and use timestamps. But it's still not easy. Modification attack. Darth intercepts a message. Bob sends a message, please decrease the salary of Darth by 10,000 baht. That's what Bob sends to Alice. But Darth intercepts, changes decrease to increase, and forwards it on to Alice. Alice receives the message and has uh, increased the salary. So here, the malicious user modifies the message along the way. Replay the message is not modified, it's an exact copy of a previous one. Another one which is different than the others, denial of service attack. We have some web server. Uh, Bob normally accesses that web server to get his job done. Okay, he needs access to the web server every day. If he can't access the server, then he cannot do his normal job and we start to lose money in the company. What Darth does is sends many packets, a lot of data to the server to overload the server. Once the server is overloaded, no one else can access the server, including Bob, and Bob has been denied service. The normal user is denied access to the, the server in this case. So a denial of service attack. There are the six main classifications of attacks. There are some other exceptions, but these are common ones that we'll see. The first two we were, were classified as passive attacks, and the last four active attacks. Active because the best way to think is if there was no attack versus if there is an attack, from the normal user's perspective, does something change? If yes, then it's an active attack. If no, passive. So in this case, if there was no attack, then Bob sends nothing and the server receives nothing. But with an attack, Darth sends something and importantly, the server receives something. So something's changed from the server's perspective when the attack has taken place. So we consider that active. Similar here. Modification attack. Bob sends message A in the normal operation and Alice would receive message A in the normal operation but with an attack Bob sends message A Darth changes that to message B and Alice receives message B so from the perspective of Alice and Bob something has changed because with no attack Alice receives message A but with an attack Alice receives message B it's changed it's an active attack and you can look at replay and masquerade and see that they are active attacks as well. So passive attacks, 
don't modify the system resources, the messages sent, the contents of those messages. An active attack does. Passive attacks are relatively hard to detect. Because they don't modify anything, it's hard to detect that they're taking place. But they're relatively easy to prevent. By using encryption and timestamps, we can see, compared to the others, easy to prevent those attacks. Active attacks, harder to pre prevent. It's harder to stop someone from sending the message. You can't, in fact, normally. But easy to detect. Even though I cannot stop, I cannot stop Darth sending messages to Alice, I can detect it using security mechanisms. I can usually detect something's happening here uh, using some of the security mechanisms we'll go through. So six types of attacks and classification into active and passive. So we said there are three aspects of security. Services, attacks, mechanisms. We've gone through attacks, let's look at services. And different people have tried to, to list the main services needed in network security. And ITU is one organization, IETF is another, they've given definitions of what is a security service. But let's go straight to a list which is one of the most common lists. There are some variations, some people divide it into six services, some more or less or use different names, but you'll see that these are common security services in most network systems. Authentication. So these are the things that we want to achieve in a network to prevent the attacks. Authentication. Make sure that the communicating entity is the one that it claims to be. Someone sends you a message, you want to authenticate that message. You want to make sure that the message you received came from the person who claims to be the sender. This was uh, going back the masquerade attack, for example. What we want is a service such that Alice, when she receives a message, can verify that that message came from Bob or not. So that if we had such a service, if she receives from Darth saying it's from Bob, she can verify and see, ah, there's something wrong here this message didn't come from Bob. So authentication is this service to make sure that we can verify where did the message really come from such that a masquerade attack cannot be performed or can, can be detected at least. Uh, sometimes we split authentication into peer entity authentication and data origin. Uh, an example, peer entity is like making sure the person that sent it is the, the right person. Data origin authentication, uh, make sure the data uh, comes from a valid origin, a val valid entity, not necessarily caring which one in that case. Access control, another service. It's common that we want to control who can access particular resources on our network in our computer system. Okay, I, SIT has a, has a network covering the, the campus here. We want to control who from outside in the internet can access the servers, can access the Wi-Fi, can access the data in our network. So we need some access control mechanisms. So the service is to prevent unauthorized use of some resource, software resource, hardware resource, data, or some communications network. An example of an access control mechanism is a firewall. 
So SIT has a firewall that sits between our, inter our internal network and the rest of the world and it has the role of stopping what data comes into our network and also what goes out. So it controls the access to resources inside our network. So that's another desired service in security systems. Data confidentiality. This is one of the ob more obvious ones. Protect data from unauthorized disclosure. Okay. I want to keep my data secret, confidential. It's a common service is I have my exam, I don't want others to read it who are not authorized to read it. So the service of providing confidentiality of the data. Data integrity. Make sure that the data received is the same as what was sent. So I send a message, the receiver should be able to confirm that what's received is exactly the same as what was sent. It hasn't been modified along the way. So if a modification attack is successful, then it means we don't have the data integrity service. Maintain the integrity of the data being communicated. Availability. Skip five. Availability. Make sure the system is accessible for the normal users. So think of the denial of service attack, one of the last attacks there. The service which we usually want is to make sure the servers, the data, the resources in general are available to the users as, as they're intended. And the one we skipped, actually let's go back to the other five, uh, some of the others first, we'll come back to the five in a moment. Availability is the desired service an example of an attack on that service is denial of service. Okay. If DARF can perform a denial of service attack, then we haven't got the availability service. Modification attack is an attack on data integrity. Because if a modification attack is successful, then the data received is not the same as what was sent. Masquerade is an attack on authentication. We should not be able to pretend to be someone else. If we can, we don't have authentication service. And confidentiality is an attack on releasing the message contents. Uh, sorry, the other way around. Releasing the message contents is an attack on confidentiality. What about non-repudiation? Non-repudiation, to repudiate something is to deny something. So the non-repudiation service is we need to have the ability such that entities cannot deny something happening. And the most common things is denying that we've sent or received a message. Let's say a oh, Bob sends a message to Alice. Alice receives that. Later, Bob denies that he sent the message. I didn't send it. That can be a problem in some cases. Non-repudiation is about making sure that Bob can't do that. Making sure that if Bob sends a message to Alice, then later Bob will not be able to deny that he sent that message. If he could, that could cause problems. And same from the other end point. Alice should not be able to deny that she received the message. That's the feature of non-repudiation. The sender cannot deny that they sent the message. The receiver cannot deny that they received the message. We need that in a number of services. Financial transactions are important. Okay? When we're buying something, we'd like to be able to have some confirmation, some proof that we've sent the money. Proof that we sent and proof that they received it, such that no one can come back later and say, I didn't receive it when they actually did. Okay, so non-repudiation is providing that service so that no one can deny something that happened. Now 
these are the main things that we look for in securing computer networks. We don't necessarily want all of them, depending upon the goal of our network, but we often want one or more of these services. For my sending the exam from me to the secretary to print, I want confidentiality. I want to make sure that no one can intercept and read the exam. And maybe I also want data integrity. I want to make sure that no one can intercept and modify somehow the, the exam. And potentially we also want authentication. That is, the secretary wants to be able to be sure that the exam she just received came from me, not from some student pretending to be me. Okay. The other services are not so important for that application. But for other applications, we may choose different services. So these are the things that we want in our computer network. To implement the services, we use security mechanisms. We've already mentioned some. We've mentioned for confidentiality, use encryption. Maybe use some timestamps, some digital signatures. These are mechanisms. The techniques to prevent, detect, and recover from attacks. There's no single technique that does everything. Okay, so we usually combine. There are multiple mechanisms, and we use one or more to achieve some service. And the most common mechanisms are built around crypto cryptography, cryptographic techniques. And that's what a lot of this course is about, talking about what are these cryptographic techniques. Some examples are listed here, but we'll go through these in the course. Encryption or encipherment, digital signatures, access control, firewalls, uh, authentication exchange, so there are protocols for authenticating users, for hiding from traffic analysis, traffic padding, sending extra messages, Notarization, have some third party uh, verify that two entities just communicated to avoid non-repudiation. So we'll look at some of these techniques in this course. And another view of those techniques, the services listed and some techniques and, uh, sorry, some mechanisms and which services those mechanisms are used to implement. For example, to provide confidentiality, we normally use encipherment or we'll call it encryption. To avoid non or to provide non-repudiation, we use digital signatures and data integrity techniques. What we're going to do in this course is look at encryption and then a fair bit of time looking at digital signatures, data integrity, authentication. Some of the others we'll touch upon. And that's our introduction to security. The next topic and the next several topics are about encryption. How do we encrypt data? And um, we'll look at it from different perspectives starting with some very, very simple encryption techniques. Simple, insecure, but demonstrate the concepts. That finishes for today. Thursday, next topic, classical encryption techniques. Between now and Thursday, I'll assume that you've uh, browsed the website. You have any questions, you ask me Thursday or, or before next week, and then We'll continue with, how do we do encryption? Before we start to go into block ciphers and, and, uh, and the main example of the block cipher, DES, we'll just recap on what we know, or some parts of what we know from classical ciphers. We went through several example very simple ciphers, starting from 2,000 years old, the Caesar cipher, and they were transposition techniques. We, sorry, wrong way around, substitution techniques. We substitute one element with another. We used 
English characters. Uh, so we were substituting a H with a J, for example. And then there were transposition techniques where we take the plain text set of characters and rearrange them, transpose, we change the position of the characters. Uh, did we finish? Actually, I think we've got, we can go back to that one last transposition techniques. We got to rail fence. Oh, we still have one more thing to do. We got through some examples of the two transposition techniques, just two basic ones. Tran rail fence, where we write the plain text in a set of rows, writing the first letter in the first row, the second letter in the second row, and so on, so that the key, in fact, was the depth, the number of rows. And then we finish with an example of rows columns transposition, where, again, we write our plain text in rows, and then the key determines which columns we read first to get our plain text, sorry, to get our ciphertext. So we, we write security and cryptography in a set of rows, and then the key is a set of integers that says the second column is read first, because the one is in the second position of the key. The fifth column is read second, and we read column by column to get our ciphertext. So we had an example of that. Both of them simply rearranged the letters. This, tries to, this example tries to illustrate the case that when we repeatedly apply the same algorithm, we can improve the security of the resulting ciphertext. And this simple case uses a rows column cipher. So we're not doing it on the... I've got the answers here. We start with some plain text. Attack postponed until 2 a.m. X, Y, Z. The X, Y, Z we're going to use to, to, to pad out. To, so we've got a, a, a correct number of characters. Because our key, 4, 3, 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, tells us that we're going to have to write this plain text in seven columns. And with seven columns, I think the, if you count the characters, how many are there? Anyone count for me? How many characters? 28, I think, I hope so. How many characters in the plain text? Yeah, 28 characters. We'll see here. I've got numbers. Okay, 28 characters, seven columns. So we write our plain text in four rows. 28 divided by seven. And then, so attack post, so the first seven letters and in the first row, the next seven letters, and the second row, and so on. And then to get the ciphertext, we read the third column, because the one in the key is in the third position. Read the third column, so down, and that produces TTNA. So if you looked at the third column, you'll see TTNA under each other. And then we read the fourth column, because that's where the two is in the fourth position. And we'd get this ciphertext. So you can try that in your own time. We're not going through it now. What we show, and we'll do it again in a moment, but what we show here is, let's not worry about the individual letters. Let's look at the ordering and see how the transposition rearranges the le these letters and see the patterns. Let's say we number these 28 letters from 1 through to 28. And I can't fit it all on one line, so I've wrapped it across two lines. So... A, T, T, A, C, K, P, and so on. That's how we interpret. So, 1, 2, 3, 28. Z is character 28 in our plain text. So just number them, 1 through to 28. And we get these. Then we apply the rows, columns, transposition cipher, and we get this cipher text. But remember transposition, transposition, we just rearrange. So if we follow, where do the letters end up? Where does the first letter A end up in the ciphertext? That's what 
this set of numbers tell us. The first letter, 0, 1 here, ends up in which position? It's here, the 13th letter. I think it's this A here. If you follow through the cipher, you'll see that this A ends up here. Or if we look at it numbers, the first letter in the plain text ends up in the 13th position in the cipher text after the uh, rearrangement, after the transposition. The third letter in the plain text, which was a T, ends up in the first position of the cipher text. Actually moves to here when we apply this out. So that's all these numbers are showing us. How did we rearrange them? Because we want to do some analysis and see how good this rearrangement, this transposition is. So if we start with some plain text, after applying our cipher, we get this arrangement of the letters. Now look at these numbers. On, your, on the screen, on the printout in front of you, look at this set of numbers. What pattern do you see? Looking at this set of numbers. Describe the pattern you see. If you, just tell me if you see any pattern. If so, what is the pattern? Just look at the numbers. Yep. I will check that later, okay? All right. Thank you. Someone made a point that maybe there's a mistake in one of these, uh, and you good chance of being correct. Uh, there may be a, uh, a mistake in one of these, but we'll survive with this mistake until later, okay? I don't know. Uh, but I think it won't make any difference. Maybe one, one letter has shifted, but I'll check that later. looking at the coming back to these numbers this is let's say it's all correct this is the output uh, after the first encryption what pattern do you see in these numbers just looking at the numbers does anyone see a pattern so look at those 28 numbers do you see some ordering of the numbers that makes some uh, some pattern makes some sense, or is it all random? These numbers, random? What's the pattern we see? What do you see there? Hmm? Plus seven, okay. Look at the numbers, easy. I, I don't ask complex questions, okay. Look at these numbers, three. 10, 17, 24, there's a difference of 7 between these four numbers, just incrementing. All right, 24 to 4, oh, that's strange, that's not a difference of 7, but 4, 11, 18, 25, a difference of 7. Okay. If I ask you, does this sequence of numbers look random? Yes or no? Hands up for yes, do they look random? Do they look random, this sequence of numbers? If I tell you, here's a random sequence, 3, 4, 3, 10, 17, 24, I think you'll start to see a pattern. A random sequence should not have any pattern. There should be no structure in a random sequence. This has some structure that we can obviously see. 4, 11, 18, 25, a difference of 7. 2, 9, 16, 23, a difference of 7. So every four digits, every four numbers, have a difference of seven. Why? Well, the way that the rows column works in that we have seven columns, and every four numbers, because we had 28 characters, seven columns, groups of four. The point is, when we apply a cipher, we take some structured plain text, we'd like to get random looking cipher text. Cipher text should be hard to work out what the plain text is, so it should be, we say, simply random looking. This is obviously not random. We can easily see the pattern. So it's not very secure, this, this cipher on its own. But if we take this cipher text and apply the exact same cipher with the same key again on the cipher text, 
we, and you can check, we get this ciphertext as an output. And instead of looking at the letters, we look at where do the original plain text letters end up. After the first transposition, the first letter ended up in the 13th position. But after the second application of our cipher, the first letter ends up in wherever, the 20-something position. Here. Similar. The third letter of plain text, the T, after the first time we applied the cipher, went to the first position of the output. But then we apply the cipher again on this, and that third letter moves to here, the 13th position. Now look at these numbers. Sequence of numbers. 17, 9, 5, 27, 24. Tell me the pattern you see. So in the, in the previous sequence we saw this difference of 7. What do you see in the next sequence? Try and find it. Look at those numbers at the bottom of the slide and see what pattern you see between the, the numbers, if, if any. These ones. Of course, I think you'll quickly see our difference of 7 has disappeared. We don't have a difference of 7 between uh, the neighbour numbers. 17 down to 9, some difference of 8, down to 5, minus 4, but up to 27, plus 12. Okay, there's uh, some differences in how they differ between those numbers. Anyone else? Anyone want to guess? Not so obvious to see any pattern in these numbers. To me, and I hopefully to most of you that are following, these sequence of numbers look more random than this sequence of numbers. This one we can see a pattern, plus 7, plus 7, plus 7 and then plus 777. Seven, seven. In this one, there's no similar pattern, no obvious pattern at least. They're going down and then up. The point is that this second output of applying the cipher is more random, if we can say that, than the first application. And less of an obvious pattern in this case, using the same cipher, and leads to a more secure ciphertext. What we'd like is a ciphertext which is completely random. That is, uh, there's no pattern that can be observed by the, uh, by the attacker. The point is here that by applying the transposition twice, we've improved the security of the output ciphertext. And it's a concept that's applied in most ciphers today. Take some simple operation, rearrange these letters, and repeat it multiple times. So after the first application, maybe the output's not very secure, but after you apply it again, it's better, and again and again and again. It keeps mixing things up, and the more mixed up it is, the harder it is for the attacker to take the resulting ciphertext and work back and find the original plaintext. So this is an important concept that we use in in real ciphers. Apply simple operations multiple times. And similar with substitutions, not just with transpositions. So we've covered the two main techniques, substitution, transposition. Last one. What's the message? For those who haven't sat in my lecture before, what's the uh, plain text? Give you one or two minutes. Here's a message you receive. It has a hidden message. What is it? And then we'll come back and explain what we're doing in this one. There's a hidden message in there. It's in fact a real message, but there's some um, secret hidden. 
it's some real message between two professors or two, two people at a university, someone sending a greeting to George. Anyone want to have an attempt? What's the first word? Okay. Second word. Okay, he has the lecture notes from last year. He's got it. Anyone else? What's the message? We'll come back, give you a chance. Let's explain what we're doing. This is another... Uh, a different thing than what we're going to cover in this course, steganography. This is the process of hiding a real message inside a fake but meaningful message. So what we do is I send some message that makes sense, not encrypted. So I send this letter to someone, but inside that real message that inside that message that makes sense I hide another secret message one that I don't want other people to know this is the process of steganography and this assumes that the person who receives this message knows the method I'm using to hide the secret and there are different examples of how to hide a secret in, in some other message in the old days for example a written letter you write a letter and you put small pinholes above the characters that make up your secret message and if you hold it up for the light or you hold it so you can see the pinholes then you identify the characters and read off the secret message or some form of invisible ink where you write a normal message but something's marked such that there's some secret identified in there as well. We'll see in the next slide our, our secret message in a moment. Today, more practical, you send an image or a video across a network, say a JPEG, and you modify that JPEG a little bit such that some bits in the binary uh, representation of that, that image make up some hidden message. The output is that the from the user's perspective, it doesn't look like the image is any different from some original image. Some bits are changed, meaning maybe some pixels change in color, but from the human eye, it's hard to detect. But in fact, there's some coded message included, and similar can be done with videos. This is not encryption, but we can use it for a similar purpose of hiding a secret and communicating between two entities. And the advantage of this compared to encryption is it doesn't look like you're hiding anything. I send someone a normal message from an attacker's or an observer's perspective. They cannot, it doesn't look like I'm communicating a secret to the other person. And that can be a benefit sometimes, for, for example, to, to avoid traffic analysis. The problem with steganography is that once the attacker knows how I'm hiding the mess message, they can find everything that I've sent in those messages. And it can be inefficient in that I need to send a large amount of information to get a short message from A to B. We're not going to cover steganography in this course, but it's an interesting thing for you to do uh, outside of the course. But we'll finish. Anyone else have the message? What's the secret? Well, George knows the procedure in this case. George knows when he receives this message. From an attacker's perspective, it just looks like a normal message or email or letter someone would send someone in a university. But George, the receiver, knows the method is to read the last word of each line. Try. The last word of each line. Your package ready Friday 21st, room 3, please destroy this immediately. Chaos yours. Okay, so here's the secret message included inside this fake message. Of course, it, once you know 
that method, read the last word of each line, it's very easy to see. And it's very easy for the attacker to find it. But if you don't know the method, it's hard to find what that secret is. But again, steganography will not cover that anymore in this course. What's the best cipher we've got so far? Which cipher is the most secure? I've gone through Caesar, Monoalphabetic, uh, Playfair, Visionaire, One Time Pad, Rail Fence, Rose Columns. They'll all be in your quiz online and all be in your quiz next week uh, in, in the lecture. Which one's the best? those seven. One time pad is the best. Um, best in terms of security, okay? Uh, so it's the most secure. And in fact it's the most secure cipher that we know of. We saw the one time pad, we applied the Caesar cipher changing the, the uh, assuming we had a random key as long as the input plain text. you can implement the one-time pad in practice as an exclusive OR. Let's move from English to uh, computing. And instead of A to Z, we'll look at zeros and ones, binary. I don't think you have this one, sorry, but uh, let's. you don't need it, it's just an example. Uh, no need to copy it down. Let's just have a quick look and just demonstrate that, okay, I want to send a message. So this is actually an example of a brute force attack, but that's not so important. I have a message, hello, I want to send that to someone. Well, we represent that in binary. So how do we do that? We can use an ASCII conversion, where we do a lookup and see the, upper, the letter uppercase H converts to some 7-bit value. And I've done that. And it turns out that uppercase H corresponds to one zero zero one zero zero zero. Uh, you look up in an ASCII table and it'll tell you that. And similar for the other. So we can treat any message as binary and we'll do so when we look at our ciphers from now on. Zeros and ones. Uh, and a second example, okay, let's say we have the message Steve is what we want to send. Then here's the binary form of, of the four letters and of course E is repeated at the end. So in decimal from the ASCII table and the binary form. So Steve can be represented as a what, 7 by 5, 35 bit plain text value. So now, from now on, we're going to deal in binary for our ciphers, not with English characters. One uh, operation that we can use to encrypt and it becomes, in fact, the one-time pad, is to take our plain text and apply the exclusive OR operation. Take the plain text input and exclusive OR with a key. And it's the same as the one-time pad that we saw where we take our plain text as a set of letters and apply the Caesar cipher where our key is as long as the plain text. If our key is as long as the plain text and random, just applying the exclusive OR between the plain text and the uh, key, and I, I will not show the example yet, the plain text and a key is the same length as, a, as the plain text, will give us ciphertext which is perfectly secure. There will be no way for the attacker to take that ciphertext and determine the correct key, nor uh, do a brute force attack. So exclusive OR is a way to implement a one-time pad. Everyone remember exclusive OR? Zero, XOR zero, zero, XOR one, one XOR zero, one XOR one. When they are different, one is the answer. When they are the same, zero is the answer. Zero, XOR zero is zero, for example. 
we're going to see XOR used and some other operations used when we look at our real cycles. So just a warning. Let's treat everything as binary from now on. So let's look at some real or a real cipher and the first generally the concepts of block ciphers the principles so so we're going to talk about block ciphers but first we need to define what do we mean by a block cipher well there's an alternative a stream cipher and we distinguish sometimes between stream ciphers and block ciphers and the main difference is on how much of plain text do they operate on at a time. Stream cipher typically operates and encrypts one bit, or more commonly one byte at a time. Block cipher usually encrypts, say, 64 bits or 128 bits at a time. We'll see some examples. We'll, we'll not cover much of stream ciphers yet, we'll see an example later. Uh, stream ciphers normally use some plain, take some plain text as input and generate some random sequence of bits and apply the XOR operation, exclusive OR, between that random sequence of bits and the plain text and get our cipher text. So stream ciphers usually use exclusive OR and the complexity of stream ciphers is in generating a random sequence of bits. So we'll return to that later when we look at random numbers. How do we gener generate them? The one-time pad is an example of a stream cipher. Assuming we have a random, a long random sequence of bits, that's our key, simply XOR with the plain text, and you get your cipher text. Block ciphers operate on some block of plain text at a time. Typically 64 or 128 bits in most ciphers we'll see. We take the input bits and apply some encryption algorithm and we'll see that usually much more complex than just uh, an exclusive OR and we get our ciphertext as output. And of course that encryption algorithm takes a key as input. We're going to focus on block ciphers for now. We'll return to stream ciphers later and discuss the differences. So some characteristics of block ciphers. In fact, this is a characteristic of any cipher. But we need uh, reversible mappings. What a cipher does is take some plain text and produces cipher text. So it maps the plain text bits to a set of ciphertext bits to form some mapping. These bits become these other bits. Reversible means that we must be able to successfully decrypt. If we have some mapping as defined in this table where we have two bits of plain text at a time, a block size of two bits, and we define the mapping that if we encrypt 0, 0, we get 1, 1 as an output, if we encrypt 0, 1, we get 1, 0, 1, 0 maps to 0, 0, 1, 1 maps to 0, 1. Then this mapping is reversible. Because if we take our cipher text, we can get the original plain text back. If my plain cipher text, if my cipher text is 1, 1, then I know for sure the plain text is 0, 0. Because we have a 1 to 1 mapping. The table on the right here is an example of an irreversible mapping. If I encrypt plain text 0, 0, I get 1, 1. 0, 1 maps to 1, 0. 1, 0 to 0, 1. 1, 1 to 0, 1. Now, I receive some ciphertext. I receive the ciphertext 0, 1. What's the plain text? If I receive 0, 1, I need to decrypt and get the original plain text back, but I cannot do it because if I have ciphertext 0, 1, I don't know whether the original plain text was 1, 0 or 1, 1. So it's not a reversible mapping. We cannot do the opposite uh, mapping. So we must have a one to one mapping between plain text and ciphertext. 
the plain text cannot map to a different plain text cannot map to the same value ciphertext. That's the, the principle. There. Otherwise, we cannot decrypt. So let's look at let's look at a cipher and and then talk about a block ideal block cipher. Uh, you have the one I'm about to show. It's an example of an ideal block cipher. You have this in your lecture notes. We'll start with a very simple block cipher that we'll treat it as a mapping, and it maps two bits of plain text to a set of possible ciphertext values. So if you find this one, I'll show just the mapping and explain it on, on, on the screen. Let's say our block size is two bits. That means what we do when we, we have a plain text message to send, let's assume we have a cipher that encrypts two bits at a time. Okay, we take two bits of plain text, encrypt, and get two bits of cipher text. Then we take the next two bits of plain text and get two more bits of cipher text, and we keep doing so. That's our encryption approach. So we can think of the cipher as mapping two bits of plain text to two bits of cipher text. What this diagram, and it's from the, the printout you have, it shows all possible mappings for every two bits of plain text given 24 different keys. So we have a two bit block in this example. That means our plain text and our cipher text will be two bits long. If our plain text is longer, we separate it into blocks. So what this diagram is showing is that if we just look at the top, if my plain text is zero, zero, and if I use key one, then the cipher text will be zero, zero as an output. That's one mapping. Using the same key, key one, plain text zero, one, Output is zero one, and one zero goes to one zero, one one to one one. There's one mapping using a particular key. So, how many possible plain text values do we have? We see there are two to the power of two possible input plain texts. This is, I think, on your handout. With a two-bit block cipher, the set of plain text values we can have is four to the power of two. And we've listed them uh, in the first column. And our cipher maps plain text bits to cipher text bits. How many possible mappings do we have? and the answer's in front of you, it's on the screen, well, there are 24 possible mappings. They're all listed here, so the first 12 are on the top and the second 12 underneath that. There are 24 possible mappings from those four plain text values to uh, reversible mappings to ciphertext values. Why 24? What's the equation? How do we get 24? Four factorial. There are four factorial is 24 in this case. We have four inputs. We can rearrange them in how many ways? Well, you can check and see that this this all 24 possible rearrangements of them. 
four by three by two by one, you know, 24 or four factorial arrangements or combinations. So if you look at the first column at the top, you'll see that's a one arrangement of those four values. And so this is one of the arrangements and with K2 that's a different arrangement and so on. So we have a total of 24 possible uh, different arrangements of those four values. And they are our possible mappings from plain text to ciphertext. What arrangement do we use to encrypt? Well, that is the key. That is the key for our cipher. So, this is a, a definition, or this is an example of a ideal block cipher. So, how it works is we take some plain text as input, and we encrypt and produce a ciphertext as output, where the input to the encryption is also a key. That's our normal operation. For example, plain text 0, 1. The encryption is defined by this, all of this data here. Plain text 0, 1, okay, we find the plain text value, and then the key determines which mapping do we use of those 24 possible mappings. So if, for example, we have a key of, uh, if we choose a key of uh, K17, for example, key 17, mapping 17 in our list, what's the ciphertext? Well, plain text 01, plain text 01, the third row, key 17, mapping number 17, the output will be 00, zero as the ciphertext. Plain text, sorry, plain text is 0, 01, let's try that again. Plain text is the second row, 0, 01, key 17, output 0, 01. Key 17, plain text 01, output 01 for this case. So here's a cipher. What we do is we take all possible plain text values and define all possible mappings or all possible arrangements of those plain text values. And the key determines which arrangement we use to determine the cipher text. This is what we call an ideal block cipher. We can implement any block cipher like this. How big is the key? What is the key length in this case? What is the key? I said key K17. Well, the key tells us which mapping to use. So K17 means use mapping number 17. So what the, the source does, the source that has the plain text, they have this table, these tables. They define the mappings, all possible mappings, and they take their plain text and they choose the secret key, and they get their ciphertext, they send the ciphertext to the recipient, the recipient must have the same set of tables to decrypt. But in fact, the key can tell us the mapping to use. K17, we could write as those eight bits. Which eight bits? These eight bits. K17 
17 we can say is 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. How that works is that we read this, so this is meaning, okay, 0, the plain text 0, 0 maps to this value, plain text 0, 1 maps to the second value, plain text 1, 0 maps to the third, and plain text 1, 1 maps to the fourth value. So in order of the plain text. So if this is the key, what we do now is that the, the source chooses the key, that is this specific mapping, they encrypt and they get 0, 1 as the output. They send 0, 1 to the recipient. If the recipient also knows this key, then what do they get as the output? Well, they receive ciphertext 0, 1, which is in the second position of the key, and therefore the plain text is 0, 1 of output. Because Let's write it. In blue we have our cipher text, and in red the plain text. The key is the blue value. And this is just the values in order. So we always write these in order. So if the recipient receives 0, 1 from the key, they know that 0, 1 goes to 0, 1. In the text. If the recipient received 1, 0 as the ciphertext, they know the plain text is 1, 1. If they receive 1, 1, they know the plain text is 0, 0. So the, the key in this case defines the mapping. This is an ideal block cipher in that we can implement any block cipher just as this mapping from plain text values to its ciphertext. The problem with using this is that it's impractical to, to implement. Let's return to our slides for a moment. An ideal block cipher, we take an n bit input, n bit plain text, and that can map to 2 to the power of n possible states, we can think of them. So we had our 2 bit plain text, we got 4 possible plain text inputs, 2 to the power of 2. And we do some substitution. We take the input and replace it with one of the other possible values, uh, one other, one possible value. So there are 2 to the power of n possible outputs, which map back to a 2-bit a input, a 2-bit output. Getting confused. This allows for all possible combinations of plain text to ciphertext mappings. And an, another example, the one that was we saw, another example is shown on this slide, but maybe better to show just as these tables. Just one other example, where here's a mapping from, on the left-hand table, the encryption table, these 16 plain text values can map to these 16 ciphertext values. That's one possible mapping. In this cipher, how many mappings are there in total? How many possible mappings? We saw in our previous example we had 24 possible mappings, 24 possible keys. Here I've shown just one mapping for a different cipher. How many possible in total? How many possible mappings? If you want to find the answer, maybe start writing them all out. It'll take you a long time, though. But just focus on the left table. The other one's the decryption.
let's go back to our, sorry, wrong direction. Our first example, we had a two-bit block. Two bits of plain text. Gives us four possible plain text values. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And how many arrangements of those four values can we have? How many different ways can we arrange them? All of these 24 values are the, the possible arrangements. There are 24 or 4 factorial arrangements, combinations. So with this was a 2-bit block cipher, what about with our other cipher? How many possible mappings? Sixteen factorial. Why? It is a four bit block cipher, plain text, four bits. How many possible plain text values are there? Sixteen. They are listed here. Okay, two to the power of four. Sixteen possible plain text. I challenge you to go and write those 16 values, or if you want to do it in decimal rather than binary, write the values 0 to 15 and then try an arrangement, arrange them in different orders, see how many different arrangements you can make. And it'll be 16 factorial, which is what? Uh, I don't know, calculator? How many arrangements? We have a 4-bit block cipher. So 2 to the power of 4 possible plain text. 16 factorial possible arrangements. Again, 16 factorial to 20 trillion different arrangements. Okay, so you go and write them all, all down and that's how many possible arrangements we have in that case. Maybe that should be the penalty for those uh, who cannot answer the quiz in the next lecture. Anyone who gets less than 50% has to write them all down. Sounds okay? Doesn't sound that hard to write tw 20 trillion different arrangements. Oh, okay, all right. So, so the point is that this is just one of those 20 trillion different arrangements. We have many others. Which arrangement do we use to encrypt? This is one. Well, the one that we use is defined by the key. How long is our key in this case? What is the key? And go back to our easier example where we have just 24 arrangements. We have a 2-bit block cipher, 24 possible arrangements. The key de determines the arrangement we're using. For example, key 17 was tells us the order in which our plain text values map to our cipher text, so we could write the key, key 17, as, in fact, 11010010, 8 bits. And the way that we interpret the key is that, is that since we know it's a 2-bit block cipher, we know that, okay, the first two bits in the key map to 00, the second two bits map to 01, the third two one zero and the last two to one one. So in that case we could represent the key as eight bits. How big is our key with our other cipher? In this case. Well, the key would be all of these values. What we would send, or what we could store as the key, is 1110. So every four bits identify the ciphertext for the in order plain text. So 4 by 16 or 64 bits would be the length of the key in this case. Because if we know the key, if we know these 
64 bits and store them in order. When I receive ciphertext 1010 from the key, I can determine, well, that's in the, what is it, in the ninth position, and therefore it maps to decimal 9 or binary 1001. So we could use a key in that way. So the key in this case in general is how big? This is with 4 bits. We have 4 by 16. With a 4 bit block cipher, 4 by 16. Or an n bit block cipher, n by 2 to the power of n. 4 by 16. 4 by 2 to the power of 4 is the key length. In, in bits in this case. So, what? Yeah. The key tells us the mapping. Let's go back to our simple, simpler one. The wrong way. 24 mappings. Okay. And we, let, let's keep it simple. But which mapping, in which order do we do these mappings? We need to define that. Yeah, the key length. Uh, yes, correct. What did I say? Uh, sorry, n, n times 2 to the power of n. Correct. So in our case, 64. 4 by 2 to the power of 4. Yeah. So in this case, we have a block size of 2 bits, n equals to 2. The key is 2 times 2 to the power of 2, or 8 bits. That is, these 8 bits is key 17. If I want to encrypt using a different mapping, for example, key 13, then I could set the key to be 01100011. And when the receiver receives the ciphertext 00, if they know this key, from the key they determine that the plain text is 10. But that leads to our problem with this ideal block cipher. Let's say we have a large block size. N, for example, is 64, 64 bits. So we've seen an example of a block of 2 bits, a block of 4 bits. Let's say we have a block of 64 bits, which we'll see is typical. Then the key length is 64 times 2 to the power of 64 bits, which is too large, because it's too large to be able to distribute to someone. It's too hard to, to write down and, and to, to record. And it becomes very hard to implement when you have such large uh, values. So using a large block size is, it, is not possible if we use such a cipher. Using a small block size, therefore, makes the key more manageable. But it turns out the smaller the block, if we have a typically large plain text, we have more blocks, and it becomes much easier to perform an attack by using the stati statistical characteristics of the plain text. So we have a problem. We can't use a small block size because it makes attacks easier based on st statistical analysis. But we can't use a large block size because it makes the key too large. So we need some alternative approach. So an ideal block cipher allows all possible mappings. Real block ciphers today do not use this approach. They only allow a select number of mappings. But they make the trade-off of being able to use a large block by keeping the key small. And there are different ways of doing it. And there was one, there's one common approach that was devised by a guy called Feistel. The approach in general is to use simple ciphers, smaller blocks, but apply them multiple times and in some structured manner to make the output cryptographically strong. So to use two or more simple ciphers, but 
repeat one after another. And, and that's the concept that we started to introduce with our classical ciphers. By repeating the same simple cipher, we can get more strength in the output cipher text. And what did we have? We had in our ideal cipher, and let's write it down, with our ideal cipher, we said with an n bit block, n bit block size. How many transformations or mappings did we have? We had 2 to the power of n factorial transformations or mappings, which is good. We want as many as possible. But the key, key length, becomes n times 2 to the power of n, which is bad, because if n is large, that key length becomes too large. If n is, n is 10, for example, then this is a thousand times ten. This ten thousand bits is the key length. La it's bad because of the management problem for the key, distributing the key. With a Feistel block cipher, it makes a trade-off. We have an n-bit block size, and the mappings is not determined by the block size, but by the key length. We also define a k-bit key, so we set the key length, and the number of mappings depends upon the key length. So, key length is k bits, the number of mappings is 2 to the power of k. which is this trade-off of we, drew, we reduce the number of mappings in practice. Uh, let's say n and k are the same length. With an ideal block cipher, we have 2 to the power of n factorial mappings, which is much, much more than just 2 to the power of n, if n and k are the same. So we reduce the number of mappings, but we have a manageable key length, k bits, so if we define k as 64, say, 64 bits, we have 2 to the power of 64 possible mappings, uh, but we have a manageable key length. If we have a 64-bit block with the ideal cipher, the key length is 2 to the power of 64, uh, 2 to the, yeah, 2 to the power of 64 times 64, which is just too large. Here it's just 64 bits. So Faisal structure allows us a much more manageable size in the key length. But by re repeating the simple encryption operations provides almost equal security as what an ideal block is and sufficient security. The picture on the next slide shows the structure, actually the next one. We will not go into much detail because we'll see it in DES. Uh, it repeats the, the general design of a cipher. It's not a specific cipher, it's a general design. And it breaks uh, the cipher into a set of rounds. A round is the same each time, the same algorithm. We just repeat this algorithm multiple times or multiple rounds. And it involves splitting the plain text into left and right halves. So if we have a 64-bit plain text, we break it into two 32-bit portions. Swapping the halves, we'll see some different operations like swapping the halves, using an exclusive OR and applying some function. And he generalized that some function, we'll see some specific instances. 
and a key as an input, and repeating, and repeat, and repeat, as, as per how many rounds we have. So we'll come back to that when we see deaths, because it's an example of the Feistel structure. But the concepts, there's an alter alternation between substitutions and transpositions. So coming back to our classical ciphers, we're using these basic operations. Replacing and rearranging. Substitution is replacing, transposition is rearranging, or permutations. And we'll see shortly that we talk about S operations and P. P for permutation is commonly used. P operations. And applies the concepts of diffusion and confusion. Anyone understand confusion? I think everyone's experts. Because many people look confused. We will look and come back to these concepts of what do we mean by dif diffusion and confusion with respect to ciphers. But let's move on from some of the abstract concepts and, and look at some specific examples. We'll come back to them ne next lecture. Let's go to DES, and then we'll see a few examples before going through the details. The data encryption standard. It was probably, it would maybe still is, the, it was the most widely used cipher in the world. Symmetric block cipher. It was developed about 40 years ago. Okay, designed by people at uh, uh, IBM and NSA apparently had input. And it was standardized by what was then called NBS, but is now called the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. So a U.S. standards organization created the standard for DES. And the idea was that when this organization creates the standard, all the U.S. government departments must use that for encryption. And because the U.S. government is using it for encryption, many companies use it for encryption, and not just in the U.S., outside and it spread across the world and that DES become effectively a worldwide standard for encryption. A symmetric block cipher, it operates on a 64-bit input block. So to encrypt, we take 64 bits of plain text and we produce 64 bits output. So we produce 64-bit cipher text. What if my plain text is larger than 64 bits? Well, we break our plain text into blocks of 64 bits in length, encrypt them one at a time, and then we've got different ways of combining those output ciphertexts together. And the next topic we'll talk about how to combine them, modes of operation. So DES just looks at 64 bits at a time. It has a 64-bit key, but we'll see when we look at the details that only 56 bits of that of those 64 were actually used in the encryption. The other 8 bits were used as a parity check. So a parity check to check if there's any errors. So from a security perspective, it's effectively a 56-bit key. How long does our brute force take against 64 bits? A 56 bits brute force. Worst case, we need to do a brute force of 2 to the power of 56 operations. If you go back to the last set of lecture notes, what? Days, hours, seconds, if we have ultra-fast machines. From a key length perspective, it's insecure. It's too short nowadays. But in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was okay. But now it's, it's not okay. The principles used in DES have been applied in other ciphers. So the, to overcome the short key length, there were improvements like triple DES. And they uh, are still in use today. So the principles used are, are used, we'll see in other ciphers. What we're going to do, and we'll not go through the details today, but in the next lecture, we're going to go through the details of how DES works. But because it's quite complex, what I'll use is take a cut down version. It works on 64 bits. I cannot write 64 bits on the board and do an operation on it. It takes too long. So some people have developed a one for teaching called Simplified Desk, which will cut things down to smaller chunks, smaller sizes. 
8 bits, 10 bits. And we'll go through one example to show the operations. Uh, it's not a real cipher, it's just for teaching. But we'll go through that next week. So we'll go through simplified DES as an example, and then we'll look at, well, real DES, and look at the details and some of the design issues and, and possible attacks on real DES. To finish today, I want to move on and look at some software that we can use for encryption. I know we've talked about a lot of uh, concepts today, so let's look at some practice. First, let's remind you what your uh, homework tasks are. You have a quiz to do before the lecture next week. Okay, you must do the quiz. And there's a new exercise that I've added. But the exercise is not marked or anything. And you should only do the exercise if you understand from the quiz. Okay, I've just added it today. Uh, don't, it's, you don't have to do it. It may just help you with understanding some of the, the more advanced concepts. But before I talk about the exercise, uh, I've mentioned before, and I also pointed on the website, there are some... That's the wrong one. I've written up some examples using classical ciphers and attacking classic, classical ciphers. So in this web page, and you've got a printout, described how to do a brute force, and more importantly, how to do frequency analysis attacks on very simple classical ciphers. I recommend you read that and understand that. Because if you can understand how the attacks can be performed, then you understand the limitations and, and approaches for your attacks on real ciphers. And there's another one about the one-time pad. So I recommend reading that and looking at the example to see, well, why is the one-time pad unbreakable? Why does it provide perfect security? If you don't understand, then, then have a read through this. And it talks about, with an example, why even a brute force attack on the one-time pad will be unsuccessful. So read them. Coming back, exercise one. Only do this if you are okay with all the other concepts so far, because it can be time consuming. Quite simple. Here's some ciphertext find the plain text or key. Okay. I give you, I think there's four different ciphertext values. For example, this. I give you a hint. All right. Caesar cipher was used. Find the key. Find the plain, te plain text and key. Some are easy. The first one should be easy. Second one, here's some ciphertext. Braille fence was used. Find the key. Then you'll find the plain text. And I think that one's easy. Most people could do that. Three. Some ciphertext. Rose columns was used. This takes a little bit of thinking and a bit of trial and error to break that one. Okay, maybe you could write some software to automate it, but you can do it on paper as well, that one. Those you can do on paper. You can do it with software, fine. But what I don't suggest is find some website that solves it for you. No point. But I... I, if you want to write software or use a spreadsheet or, or some some scripting language to automate the tasks, for sure, recommend it. And especially for the last one, ciphertext four, monoalphabetic cipher was used using English only, so the key length is 26 characters, effectively randomly arranged. Here's the ciphertext. Find the plain text. I think most people can do one and two quite easily. Three and four take a bit more time and thinking. But if you can do them, then you probably fully understand both how the ciphers work and how the attacks work. Let's move to real ciphers for the last five, five minutes or so. Another printout I've provided you and on the website here is, well, let's use some software to encrypt. Once we go through DES, let's encrypt something with DES. 
So you can get different software implementations of many of the ciphers that we, we talk about. One common open source uh, library and application for encryption is OpenSSL. And we'll use it for demos and examples throughout the course, OpenSSL. It provides a command line interface. It's in, usually on available for most Linux and, and Mac uh, operating systems already installed. I'll just quickly show some examples. So this web page describes how to use it. Let's look at a few examples of how to use it. Let's encrypt some data. First, let's encrypt some plain text. And I'll take a plain text file, for example. OK, so I've created a plain text file, which is just some text message. Hello, this is our super secret message. Keep it secret. Uh, let's encrypt it using OpenSSL. And yet, let's, uh, we'll choose a cipher as we go. Different ways of doing it. First, let's find some details about our plain text. Sorry. How long is the plain text? I have a piece of software word count. It tells me it's 72 characters long. Okay, let's start with that. It's 72 characters. In fact, it's 72 bytes. One character is one byte. If we look at our plain text.txt file, it's 72 bytes. So we're going to encrypt a 72 byte plain text. Uh, I have to have a look at the details in maybe hexadecimal. Everything I'm doing is on the website on those instructions, so I would not explain too much, just do the steps. So that's our message. So this is the ASCII, this is the hexadecimal. Remember, our ASCII maps back to binary. Or we can represent that binary as hexadecimal values. So H-E-L-L-O uh, dot space T is in fact represented as these hexadecimal digits. Or even nicer, binary. Yeah, hard to see. Do it again. Harder to see. Okay. Of course, I don't expect you to, to read this, but this is H E L L O. Uh, where we get O dot space T. Okay. So just a binary representation. So when we're applying our rule cipher, we're actually operating on the binary form. When we apply DES, AES, and others, we take the binary values and apply our cipher on those binary values. But of course, hard hard to uh, show the binary values sometimes. So let's encrypt, and I'll encrypt using DES. But we need a key. Okay. I need to encrypt with some key. And with DES, we have a 64-bit key. Although we only use 56, we need to specify a 64-bit key. Uh, it turns out with the software we can use, we can use hexadecimal. I don't have to I can write in binary 64 bits or 16 hexadecimal digits. Anyone suggest a key for me? 64 bit value or 16 hexadecimal digits? Well, it's best to choose a random key. Remember, a key should be such that, it should be secret, so I shouldn't tell you, but it should be such that no one can guess it. If I choose a key of all zeros, well, an attacker could just try all zeros, and uh, it's not very sensible to choose that value. So ideally, your key should be generated randomly. You should not choose it. You should let a computer generate it for you. So generate some random number. Different ways to generate random numbers. Uh, the program that we're going to use to encrypt is called OpenSSL. And it includes many different encryption operations, including random number generation. 
it has an operation to generate a random number, eight hexadecimal, uh, eight bytes in hexadecimal. That's what we're saying here. There it is. So what I did is generate an eight byte random number and output in hexadecimal. And that's the value. Sorry if we lose a little bit. Let's make sure you can see it. Again. Uh, we haven't explained it yet, but it turns out to encrypt we need a key and some initial value. And I'm going to use some at random initial value. But let's encrypt. And we use OpenSSL. We say we want to encrypt with a symmetric cipher. What cipher? DES. And in the next topic, we'll see that ECB means something, electronic code book, but not so important yet. But DES, ECB, encrypt, minus E, input, plain text file, output, cipher text. Dot e and C, whatever extension I like, it's not so important. Input key, my random value. So use my key to encrypt. And we need some initial value. Let's not explain that yet, but we'll need that. Uh, and I'll choose this other random number for an initial value. And sometimes our cipher, when our text is not of a particular length, will pad, pad the plain text. I don't want to do any padding here. Uh, it's not necessary. So I'm going to specify an option to not pad. No pad. And done. We encrypted. Okay, so you don't have to remember all these operations. I'm so just giving you an, an example. And. We have our ciphertext, which is 72 bytes long. That's our ciphertext. Let's look at the ciphertext now. There it is. There's our ciphertext. From encrypting our message, hello, uh, this is a super secret message, here's our ciphertext. And as you see, it's just a random set of, these are hexadecimal digits. There's no meaning in ASCII, so it doesn't make sense to look at this from a text file perspective because we get any of those uh, uh, ASCII characters. The dots mean unprintable. And we could look at in binary as well, but I will not show you in binary. You could convert to binary. So we've encrypted using uh, OpenSSL. You can do that on any file. It doesn't have to be a text file. It can be an image. It can be a Word document. Uh, any file you like because OpenSSL SSL just treats it in its binary form as zeros and ones. And to finish, of course, let's decrypt. And decrypt is almost the same as encrypt, so I'll almost repeat the command. Instead of minus E, what do we have? Minus D to decrypt. And the input is, of course, the ciphertext. And the output is some file, let's say it's my uh, received message. Same key, we need to decrypt with the same key as we encrypted with, and the same initial value. And let's look at our received message. And it should be the same as our plain text message. Yes. Okay, so we decrypted successfully, that's all. Our received message, which was output from the decryption, is identical to the original plain text, which was the input to the encryption. So, just a taster. Become experts in OpenSSL, because you use that, you may use that in your homeworks, and you will use it in practice in the future to encrypt data. So, have a look on some of the websites to see how OpenSSL works and start to use it, uh, especially as we go through the real science. Enough for today. To, next week we'll look at the details of DES by going through simplified DES. Uh, 
symmetric block cipher that takes 64 bits of plain text input and produces 64 bits of cipher text as output. So it encrypts 64 bits at a time. It uses a 64-bit key as input, but in fact only 56 of those 64 bits of key are actually used in the encryption. The other eight bits are a parity check. To, to demonstrate DES, I'm going to use this academic version of DES called Simplified DES. It uses the similar operations, but it just cuts down, instead of using 64-bit blocks, it cuts down to 8 bits, just so we can go through an actual full example, or at least uh, some parts of the example on the screen or on the board. So Simplified DES is not for real-world use, but we'll see and compare it to real DES after we go through the example. Simplified DES, we deal with 8-bit blocks, so it's just cut down to, to operate similar to DES. 8-bit, we look at 8 bits of plain text and we'll produce 8 bits of ciphertext. The key will be 10 bits. And we, in real DES, we have 16 rounds, that is, we apply some function and then repeat it 16 times. In Simplified DES, just two to, to speed things up. Uh, the steps that we'll see in the diagram of what what is the in, the steps we apply. This captures the overall diagram for simplified DES, and it looks similar to real DES, except it has only two rounds in this diagram. Real DES has 16. How we read this is that we have to encrypt plain text to get cipher text. If we have cipher text and want to decrypt to get plain text, we go in this direction, and we'll explain the blocks. But in fact, in both cases, we take uh, our original key, in this case a 10-bit key, and we generate what's called round keys or sub-keys, K1 and K2. And this will be round 1, round 2. We'll use sub-key or round key K1 in round 1 and K2 in round 2. In real DES, we do a similar thing where we generate 16 round keys and use one in each of the rounds. So there's this key generation step followed by the encryption. What are all these blocks? We'll go through them, but in, in summary, the ones with a P, initial permutation, permutation 10, permutation 8, we'll see another one I think, permutation 4, they are permutations, which means transpositions or simply rearrangements. They take some input and rearrange the bits. We're operating on bits now, not, not English letters. But remember rows column? We took, right, going backwards, we took some characters and rearranged them. We did a transposition or a permutation on those input characters. We'll do the same in all of these. IP is an initial permutation. P10 and P8 are different permutations. In fact, switch or swap, SW here, is also a permutation. It takes eight bits and swaps the halves. So it puts the first four bits last and the last four bits first. We'll see that in the example. A shift is a left shift. Again, a permutation. Take eight bits, shift it all to the left, wrap the first bit around to the end. Similar to a Caesar cipher, which shifts to the right. Okay, so just a permutation. That will not help us. So there's permutations, and then we'll see in detail that this f, this function, it's called a round function, is where the details are, and that will include some permutations as well as a substitution. And the substitution is what adds the security. We need the substitution in there. Without it, then it'll be very easy to break. Simplified DES as well as real DES, the actual permutations, how we rearrange the bits, is defined. It's standard and it's known by everyone. So we'll, these are the definition of them. We'll return them and return to them when we need them. Not quite yet. So we'll return to them through our example. Let's start with an example and generate a key. And we'll see the steps in detail. The example. 
I think you have a printout in your handouts of an example. I'll try and go through it on the screen and we'll calculate it as we go, but you, you have it already printed out. I'll show you. You have this document which goes gives all the details of what we're going to go through at the moment. So try and follow along and see what's happening. Let's try and start with a key and generate the round keys. And I've just chosen a random key for this example, so our key that we'll start with, key K, 10 bits, That's the key that we've chosen. For example, the user chooses a random key and shares it with the, the recipient. So both sides, the encryptor and decryptor, must have this shared secret key. We'll have some plain text I'll introduce in a moment. The first thing that we must do is generate subkeys. And the steps are defined here. We take 10 bits as input. The 10-bit key is input, and the way we read this diagram, so this arrow with the slash through it and 10 means 10 bits are flowing through here in order. P10 is a permutation. It takes 10 bits in and rearranges them in some way, in some defined way, and produces 10 bits out, of course. It's just a permutation in this case. And we'll, in fact, we'll treat it as two different halves, the left and the right half, five bits at a time. Then we'll do a left shift on each half. LS means left shift. Shift the bits to the left by one position. So with five bits, move them to the left, where the leftmost bit will become the rightmost bit. It'll wrap around. We do it on each half, and then we'll feed them in and do another permutation, P8. In fact, this permutation will take 10 bits in and will juice, re produce eight bits out. So it permutates n deletes two bits to get the output K1, the first round key. And the outputs of those left shifts will be fed down to do another left shift, left shift by two positions. P8 will be applied again, we'll get the second round key K2 out. So let's, let's go through that with our 10 bits, our 10 bit key. So the first thing is we apply P10. So with our key, after applying P10, that rearranges those 10 bits. But how? And that's defined on one of the slides. P10, if we go back, is defined as... If these are the 10 bits coming in, bit 1 through to bit 10, then the order in which they come out are defined by the second row. The first bit moves to the seventh position, the tenth bit moves to the sixth position, the third bit moves to the first position, and so on. So that's a fixed permutation. It just rearranges the bits. We'll see when we look at real desk, it has the same. There's a, a large defini a large uh, list of bits that says, of these 64 bits, we rearrange them in this manner. Why is that coming up? Connect. Let's get rid of this error. Okay, so let's do that permutation P10 where the, what, the third bit will become the first bit and so on. You do it and just check that it makes sense. And I'll write it down just so it's clear in this instance, not for all the others. What do we have? These we 
what do we have? Three five seven three five two seven four ten. That's a two. We'll go through slowly in the first case and then we'll speed up as we go through the uh, the next steps. So the result after we apply permutation P10 is that the third bit, 1, becomes the first bit. The fifth bit, 0, becomes the second bit. The second bit, 0, becomes the third bit and so on. 7, 4, 10, bit 1, bit 9, bit 8, bit 6. So that's all. Very simple. Rearrange the bits. And we'll see the other per permutations are very similar. Uh, different arrangements, and we'll talk about why uh, particular arrangements are chosen later but let's just go through and, and perform the operations. That is the first step. So the 10 bits that come out, we're at this position, we treat them as two halves and do a left shift on each half. Left shift by one position. So you split them into two halves now and after doing a left shift focusing on the first five bits everything moves to the left where the leftmost bit ends up as the rightmost bit. And similar for the right half. And next, so that's the output of the left shifts, they feed into P8, another permutation. But note that P8 takes 10 bits in, produces 8 bits out. And it's defined as this select and permutate. So two bits are going to be removed as the output, bits 1 and 2. So we get 6, 3, 7, 4, 8, 5, 10, 9 as the rearrangement. Bits 1 and 2 are going to disappear. And after P8, we'll get 8 bits and they'll be 8. following P8. The first two bits disappear, so now we have 10 bits, they're going to disappear and these remaining 8 bits are going to be rearranged according to P8, the definition of P8. I will not write down the rearrangement, you need to check back on the, the, the slide as to what that definition is. But just mix them up. That is in fact key, key 1, round key for round 1. We'll use that later. That's this output here, K1. The previous input to P8 is taken again and perform. we perform another left shift on each of the halves by two positions. So we'll continue and we'll do another left shift by two positions this time, not one, and that is taking this one and this value. So take those five bits and do a left shift by two positions. Of course, wrapping around where necessary. So just focusing, for example, here, this bit, if we shift to the left by two positions, comes to here, then here. This second bit, one, two positions, so the two ones end up here on the output and the three zeros of course will be there. 
So we skipped over P8, that was just used to get K, K1. And the last, last step, P8 is applied again. On those 10 bits, apply P8 and you'll get K2. And P8 is the same as it was defined before. Remove the first two bits and rearrange the remaining eight. And we get, I have the answers from before, you can check. That will be K2. So the operations are very simple. In fact, in real desk, they, they're that simple. We're shifting bits, we're rearranging bits. Transpositions in this case. Yep. Yes. It, in this case, it, it, this is the algorithm. It's defined like this. Whenever you have a key, the, the steps we're doing now is generating the round keys. The output of this step, we started with our 10-bit key, we get K1 and K2 as output. We always apply those steps that we've gone through, always using that fixed definition of P8, left shift, and P10. It doesn't change. So very simple. And the same in DES. We'll just see that the, the permutations have more bits than, than what we're dealing with here. So we get two round keys. This is the key generation stage. We'll use them in a moment. Just go back, put everything into context. What we just did was this middle part. Whenever we have our input key, the user chosen key, we generate two round keys, K1 and K2, by P10, left shift, P8, left shift, P8. And then we'll use those two keys when we encrypt our plaintext, and we'll go through that step of encrypting the plaintext. But it turns out with simplified DES and even real DES, decryption also uses those same round keys. So when someone receives ciphertext and they want to decrypt, they take the same 10-bit key, follow those exact same steps, and they'll get the same values of K1 and K2. And we'll return to it, but we'll notice that decryption follows the exact same steps as encryption. Encryption we'll see is IP, F of K, SW, F of K, IP, the inverse IP. Decryption, exactly the same steps. The only difference is that we'll use the round keys in the opposite order. In encryption, K1 is used first and then K2. In decryption, K2 and then K1. The benefits of encryption and decryption being the same operations is that you only need to implement it once. You implement encryption and you now have an implementation of decryption. That's a, a significant practical advantage. So let's now encrypt some plain text. Any questions? Easy so far and it will only get easier as we go. We will not go through all the steps, don't worry. We're just some st initial steps. Let's try again. We'll need K1 and K2, and we'll need some plain text to encrypt. I've chosen some plain text. We'll return to K1 when we need it. Some random plain text. So that we want to encrypt this 8-bit block. If I had a thousand bits of plain text, then I'd have to break it into 8-bit blocks and encrypt one block at a time. So what do we do to encrypt? The details are here. A little bit more detailed than the overall diagram. This is the encryption phase. And it's hard to see uh, at this size, but 
We start with 8 bits plain text. IP is what we call the initial permutation. It's a permutation we do just at the start. We only do it once in the encryption. We'll see at the end we do an inverse initial permutation. Okay. Nothing complex there. And then these two dark grey boxes are the rounds. And they involve some permutations. In fact, EP is expand and permutate, meaning we're going to take 4 bits in and produce 8 bits out. So we take 4 bits, expand to get 8 bits, rearrange. We're going to take our key K1, which we just generated, an exclusive OR with the output here. We're going to split it into two halves and feed four bits at a time into the two S boxes. S0, S1 are called S boxes. Substitution boxes. So the operations we've seen so far are just transpositions, permutations. The other main operation in cryptography is a substitution. We're going to replace bits with other, or sets of bits with other sets of bits. So we'll see the details of them. We'll take the output, they'll produce two bits out. We'll have another permutation. We're going to XOR with the left half of our original output here. We'll get four bits and four bits, and then we'll swap the halves, and we'll do it all again. One round, a second round. Let's go through just the first few steps, and then we'll uh, give you the answer, so you can check if you need. First, the initial permutation. And like the other permutations, it's defined. Bits 1 to 8 become rearranged in, in this order. Okay, so that's fixed. It's always fixed. It's always those values. Rearrange, and you get what do you get? Tell me the values. Try it. Bit 2, become the second bit on the input becomes the first bit on the output. The sixth becomes the second. And so on. What have I done wrong? I've got the wrong answer in front of me. Sorry, I'm going to go back and start again. I've got the wrong plain text. Lucky I noticed before we got halfway through. Let's try a different plain text because I only have the answer to that one. I misread my notes. This is the plain text I want to try because uh, I have the answers and we can check and confirm at the end. Let's forget about the first plain text. But we do the same initial permutation. The second bit becomes the first and the sixth bit becomes the second and so on. And in fact, where I misread is that that becomes one six And what do you get? This is where I misread the plain text. That will be the output after we rearrange those 8 bits according to IP. That is the output of IP. And in fact, now we, we operate on two halves. The right half, we're going to feed into this block here denoted as F, uppercase F. The left half we'll return to later. We'll need it later. So the right half, the right four bits, we expand and permutate. 
and then XOR with the key K1. And expand and permutate is defined as this. Four bits in, we're going to repeat those four bits and rearrange them as defined at the first bit becomes the second bit and the eighth bit. The second bit on input becomes the third and the fifth bit on output and so on. So we expand and permutate. Only on the rightmost half. So that was just on those four bits. Then we XOR with K1. And K1 is what we generated before. From before, K1 was... What do we have? If you do an XOR between those eight bits, one XOR one. Everyone remember their their basics of XOR. When they're the same, we get zero. When they're different, we get one. And then we're going to input, split that into two halves and input that into our S boxes. And that's really the next step that we need to go through that's different from before, then we, the rest is easy. So just to show where we're at. We had eight bits out of our expand and permutate. We XOR with the K1 and take four bits into S0 and four bits into S1. Where the S boxes, we perform a substitution. And the way that we use it, we're going to, the S boxes are also defined. The substitutions, like our uh, monoalphabetic cipher defines how we, what do we replace our plain text characters with? What do we get on output? This defines, given an input, what is going to come out. And it's defined, we define it as two matrices, S box 0, S box S1. So focusing on S0, we have four bits in. The way that we interpret this, so this is the S box, we have a four bit input, bits one through to bit four. Bit one and bit four specify the row, bit two and bit three specify the column. And we just do a simple matrix lookup and with the element that we find becomes the output. Where we label our columns and rows in, in binary. So zero, one, two, three in decimal. So row zero or in binary, zero, zero. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and column 0, 1, 2, 3. And bit 1 and 4 specify the row, 2 and 3 specify the column. So what's the output? Find out the output when we feed these values into our two S boxes. Four bits are going to come in and two bits are going to come out. With S1, the row is going to be 0, 0, and the column 
1, 1. Bits 1 and... Let's go back. Bits 1 and 4 specify the row, 2 and 3 specify the column. So row 0, 0, column 1, 1, or in decimal, row 0, column 3, look up your S box. Row 0, the first row, column 3, the last row, output 1, 0. Okay, so it's just a look up on that defined substitution box. So the output for S1 will be 1, 0. And then do the same for the, the right four bits to get S1. What does S1 give us? First and fourth bit, column, second and third bit, and just do a lookup in the S box. If we can get past the S boxes, you'll see that the rest is all permutations and easy. Any questions on the S boxes or, or the other aspects of simplified desk so far? Find out the output of S1. Is it 1, 1? Row. Now, think of the rows and columns in binary. It's the easiest way. Row 0, 1, column 1, 1. So when we look at our matrix, we uh, if you want to convert a decimal, then 0 through to 3. 0, 1, 1, 1. In S box, S1. The second row, z 0, 1, the last column, 1, 1, produce output 1, 1. Okay. Just a look up on that matrix, our substitution. We are the output of S0 and S1. We have four bits. We permutate with P4. We'll get four bits out. Then we XOR those four bits with the left half that came out of the initial permutation. Let's quickly do that and then we'll get to our answer. So we're going to apply P4 now. Four bits in to P4. We'll produce those four bits out. Where does that come from? Four bits in, 1, 0, 1, 1. P4 is defined here. A rearrangement. Bit 2 becomes the first bit, and then the remaining three bits at the end. And XOR that with the left half, we have it up somewhere, this left half of the initial permutation, if we can bring it down, is then reused down here, 1010. Zero, one, zero. This 1010 one, zero, one, zero is the left half from our initial permutation output. You can follow it up on here or on the slide. 
it comes from the initial permutation. Exclusive or. And now we bring back to our slide. What do we just do? We just took the four bits out of P4, exclusive all with the four bits from the initial permutation. We get four bits out. Combine it with the original right half of the initial permutation. I'll bring that down. The right half here is now reused. One zero zero one. And the last, in fact, that's the end of our round. That's the end of the round. We swap the halves and then repeat all of it again, repeat the round again. What we've just done is we started with plain text, we did the initial permutation, then we did everything inside this dark grey block. Now we're going to swap the halves and then we repeat everything inside the dark grey block but using K2 as an input at this step. And then we'll get some 8 bits out, do an inverse initial permutation, we'll get our ciphertext. So let's swap the halves and then I'll give you the answer. You can do the rest in your own time. Swap the halves. So this is the swap. then you apply our round function denoted on the diagram as f of k using k2 as an input. You'll get as an output, I've done it before, I hope, As the output, you'll get 8 bits of then you'll do the inverse initial permutation and you get your output ciphertext. We, don't worry, we'll not go through many ciphers in this much detail. We'll just use this one to demonstrate that in fact complex ciphers are just made up of simple operations. So as the output of our swap, swapping the halves, we get these eight bits. You apply the, the dark grey block again, but use a K2 as an input. And we calculated K2 before. You get some 8 bits, you apply the inverse initial permutation, and then you get 8 bits of ciphertext, and we're done. You, as homework, will try and work out what the in inverse initial permutation is. Well, the inverse of IP. So try and work out what it means to do the inverse of this operation, this permutation. Try. Oh, it's the inverse, yes. Let's see what happens. It's, it's like thinking about the, the rows columns a little bit. Just be careful with it.
So we're done. We've encrypted using simplified DES. If we want to decrypt, in fact, we do the exact same steps, we, except we take our ciphertext, 8 bits, exact same steps, but we use K2 first in the first round and then K1. Okay? So we just rearrange the ordering of the keys. So you know simplified DES now. To finish in the last two minutes, that was the example we went through. Comparison of simplified DES and real DES, some, some aspects. So simplified DES is just for educational purposes. Real DES, some of the differences. All right, we, now we have 64-bit blocks, not 8. And we have 16 round keys. It turns out the round keys in real DES are 48 bits. So K1, K2, K3, up to K16 will each be 48 bits. They'll be derived from the original input key. Right? The initial permutation is 64 bits. The function F, if you look in the diagram, operates on 32 bits. Simplified DES had two S boxes. Real DES has eight S boxes. But the same concepts. 16 rounds, not two rounds. This is this concept of keep applying transpositions and substitutions and you get a better and better ciphertext from a security perspective. So you could go away and do simplified DES if you had the definition of all those operations. And for your reference, I included them here, just taken from the textbook. Real DES goes through 16 rounds. Here's the in initial permutation, IP, and the inverse. 64 bits in, we rearrange those 64 bits, so the first bit ends up here, the 58th bit becomes the first bit, and so on. That's all. The expand and permutate, permutation functions, a single round, we take our right half, expand and permutate, XOR, S box, permutate, XOR, and keep going. All right. The S boxes. With simplified desk, we just had our two 4x4 four four matri matrices. Here we have eight S boxes. But same concept. We just do a lookup in the S box to get the output. In this case, we get output four bits. I think we have a decimal four bit value there. And it's slightly different in the key generation, but uh, it's not much uh, more complex. So, we now know simplified DES. You could now expand that knowledge to real DES. And real DES is one of the most used ciphers in the world. It's no longer recommended, but if you consider the, its use over the last 30 or 40 years, it's one of the most used ciphers in the world. Uh, and many other ciphers use similar concepts. Rounds, substitutions, transpositions, XOR, generate keys, and so on. So this is one example of uh, a real and relevant cipher. On Thursday, we'll talk about some of, the, some of the reasons it uses these operations and some of the limitations of them and then move on to the next topic. Okay. Let's stop there. This is from the previous set of lecture notes on the classical ciphers but generally talked about attacks. And we skipped over one slide and I forgot to come back to it so now's the time because we mention some of the concepts as we move forward. Coming back to an attacker, what they want to do is discover the plain text or the key. Getting the key is better because then you can, uh, if the other users don't know, then you can easily decrypt subsequent ciphertext that you come across. The attacker, we assume, knows ciphertext, so we can obtain the ciphertext, and we know the algorithm being used. So that's an assumption. Uh, hiding the algorithm is usually not possible. Uh, adds very little extra security. We'll see 
and we'll see today in some at attack where the attacker often makes use of known pairs of plain text ciphertext, and that's what we'll see in some extra attacks, some different attacks. We've mentioned brute force again before, so you know about brute force. Try all keys. So you need to know how many keys and how how many keys we can try per second to work out how long a brute force attack takes. Cryptanalysis, we've seen some attacks, for example, in the quiz, the monoalphabetic cipher, we can use frequency analysis. That is, take advantage of the fact that the plain text and the cipher text exhibit similar characteristics in the frequency of letters, diagrams, and so on. And there are other types of attacks that can be performed on real ciphers. Often, so now moving away from brute force, often the other types of attacks, there are some common techniques which are applied across against different ciphers. So there may be attacks specific to one cipher, like DES, but it, but it won't work on AES. But then there may be some general techniques that may work across a set of ciphers. And we're not going to go into any details of those techniques. We may see, today we'll see one example, we may see a few later, but uh, just to mention some of the methods, the general methods Linear cryptanalysis is really trying to find some, think of some linear equation that relates the ciphertext back to the key and back to the, the plaintext and solve effectively that equation. But it's, it, it can be very complex. And differential cryptanalysis is looking at differences in, uh, across different uh, ciphertext values to try and work out how that maps back to a key. We'll see meet in the middle attack today. That'll become clearer. Side channel attacks, and there are others. Side channel is using uh, some outside information to try and use determine the key or the, the plain text. An example, and it's, it's used in a number of systems, is when I encrypt something on my computer, say I'm implementing, I've implemented DES, and I'm encrypt, encrypting some data, there are many different operations of DES. We saw simplified DES yesterday, the rounds, the XOR, the uh, permutations, and so on. It turns out, in some cases, if you can measure how long it takes your hardware to do each operation, you can get some extra information and try and then use that to try and determine the key or plaintext. So one example of a side channel attack is actually measuring how long the the hardware takes for each operation in the encryption. And because depending on different keys and different plaintexts, the operations may take different amounts of time, so by analyzing that you can start to work backwards from the ciphertext to a key or plaintext. So using extra information, some other information from some other channel. Often Attacks are compared against the worst case brute force. So the, if we can do brute force, then fine, we can defeat the cipher. But often the, the success of other attacks is compared against, well, how long does it, does it take compared to brute force? We'd like to be faster than brute force. Okay, so brute force is the, the worst case approach. If we can come up with an attack which is better, faster than brute force, then that's a good thing from an attacker's perspective, defeating the security. So with brute force, we normally measure the number of operations. So how many decrypts do we need to do to defeat the cipher, to find the key, for example? Which depends entirely on the, the number of keys and the time, or, and the time depends upon how long each operation takes. So a cipher with a 64-bit key takes, worst case with brute force, 2 to the power of 64 operations to find the key. So we use a similar metric to measure other attacks. How many operations does it take to find the key? It should be better than brute force if that attack is ever any use. So if a brute force attack takes 2 to the 64 operations and we've got some other attack that takes 2 to the power of 60 operations, then we'd say that's better than brute force and is the weakness in the cipher. 
But the other thing we'll see that other attacks use is not just that they take many operations, but to work, often they require some memory to store information while they're performing the attack. The less memory required, the better it is from the attacker's perspective. And often they require knowledge, the attacker requires knowledge of past pairs of plain text ciphertext. So the attacker has some ciphertext, they're trying to find the key. Often attacks assume that the attacker also knows some other ciphertext values which were produced with the same key from same, some plaintext, and the attacker knows both the pair of plaintext and ciphertext, but they don't know the key. So how many pairs of plaintext ciphertext and, uh, or, uh, and particular um, can we choose particular values has an impact on how we measure how successful an attack is. Some classification of that information known by the attacker, not this slide, is here. What is known? From the attacker's perspective, okay, let's imagine we're the attacker trying to defeat a cipher. The worst case for us, well, first, in general, the more information I know, the, more, the better it is for me to be able to attack a cipher. So the worst case for the attacker is knowing very little. The worst case is knowing just the ciphertext and the algorithm. We assume in all these cases we know the algorithm, and if we just know the ciphertext, then we need to take that ciphertext and the algorithm and determine the key or the plaintext for that ciphertext. Normally we look for the key. But it can be a little bit easier for the attacker if they know some pairs. In addition to the algorithm and ciphertext, they know some pairs of past plaintext ciphertext. Somehow, they've discovered some past ciphertext values and the corresponding plaintext, but not the key. So that's what we mean by plaintext ciphertext, ciphertext pairs. Plaintext was encrypted with a key to get a ciphertext. The attacker knows the plaintext and ciphertext, but they don't know the key. They're trying to find that. That information can help the attacker to try and find the key. How do we get a past pair of plaintext ciphertext? Uh, maybe the plaintext became not important and is no longer considered secure and is made available. So the attacker can... Uh, learn the plain text without knowing the key. Uh, the, the simple example, I think I may, may have mentioned it before, is that okay, um, some ciphertext is some information about some event happening in the future. The event will happen at this time, at this location. After the event happens, the attacker knows the ciphertext, they also can determine the plaintext because they know that the event happened at this time and at this position so they can determine what the original plaintext was without knowing the key. So there are a number of cases when the attacker, we assume, knows pairs of plaintext ciphertext. If the attacker can choose what pairs it can learn, it can make the attacker even or the attack even easier. So a known plaintext is the case where the attacker is able to find some plaintext ciphertext pairs. Chosen plaintext is where they've chosen particular plaintext values and found the corresponding ciphertext values. An example: I choose a, a plaintext value as the attacker. And somehow I get the user to encrypt that plain text with their key and I intercept their ciphertext. So now I know the plain text and ciphertext. Choosing the plain text allows the attacker to choose values that may help breaking the cipher by finding weaknesses that depend upon that plain text. So being able to choose the specific value can help in some attacks. Chosen ciphertext is similar, except the attacker gets to choose the ciphertext. 
and can find the corresponding plain text. Chosen text is when we can have both. The attacker can choose both plain text and ciphertext and get the other value in the pair. Generally, as we go down, the more information the attacker knows, the greater the chance they can perform a successful attack. With ciphertext only, then it's harder for the attacker. With chosen text, it's generally easier for the attacker. We'd like to design ciphers such that we can defend against any attack, preferably. Even if the attacker knows chosen plain text, chosen ciphertext, or even chosen text. Sometimes we can, can def defend against all, sometimes just a selection. So the more info that the more information the attacker knows, generally the easier it is for them to attack. We'll see this come up when we perform an attack in a moment. Well, soon. Hopefully at the end of this lecture. And the last thing that we missed over how do we measure security? Well, the absolute measure, we can say a cipher is unconditionally secure means it's perfect in terms of security. That is, the cipher text has no information such that an attacker can find out the correct plain text or key. So a cipher which is unconditionally secure has that property. The only known the only known cipher that is unconditionally secure is the one-time pad. We've seen the example of the one-time pad. Even if we try a brute force attack, given some ciphertext, we cannot determine the correct plain text or key. So it's perfect in terms of security. It's unconditionally secure. Under no conditions is it insecure. No other ciphers are known to be unconditionally secure. There are conditions in which they are insecure. So therefore, to be practical to compare ciphers, we talk more about computational security. And in general, a cipher is considered to be computationally secure if the cost of breaking it exceeds the cost of the information encrypted, or the time required to break exceeds the useful lifetime of that in encrypted information. Example, I have 100,000 baht in my bank account and my password to get access to my bank account is encrypted and someone finds the encrypted password, some malicious user, a student, and they want to get my 100,000 baht. So they go and they buy many computers and do a brute force attack against my password and they spend a million baht to find the password. They get the password. They get into my bank account. They steal my 100,000 baht. This information, we'd say, is computationally secure because the value of the information was 100,000 baht for the attacker, but the cost of breaking it was 1 million. So it costs them more to break it than it is to, than they get in return. So a simple example that we need to evaluate how much is the information worth? That one was easy, but uh, I encrypt I encrypt a confident, confidential information about trade secrets for my company. I don't want other companies to get that. What's that information worth? It's very hard to put a value on lots of information. So it's hard to put numbers on how much is the information actually worth and how much would it take to cost uh, to break that? How much cost would it take? It's hard to estimate the value of a lot of information. The other one is the exam. I have the exam on my laptop for the midterm. The midterm is in what? Four weeks time. And I encrypt the exam. You can have the cipher text. You again, you have all these computers, the lab computers, and you start your attack. And it takes you seven weeks to find the 
exam answers but the exam's over okay you had the you sat the exam you needed the exam answers in four weeks it took you seven weeks to get them so again in that case we'd say it's computationally secure because the time required to break the cipher exceeded the the value or the useful lifetime of the the encrypted exam in that case again it's hard to put or it's hard to estimate what the lifetime of some information is so although the concept is easy in practice knowing how valuable information is how long do we need to keep it secure is not easy to predict and how how long does it take to break is again not easy to predict So one time pad is the only, only unconditionally secure cipher. All others are conditionally secure. That, so therefore we look at the computational security. How much effort, how much cost or time does it re require to break it? And we'll come to some of that when we look at DES. So let's go back to our DES slides, our block cipher. And there's two concepts we skipped there on DES as well. DES and the FISL structure and many block ciphers in general use the concepts of diffusion and confusion. And one of your favorite uh, scientists come up with these concepts, Claude Shannon. Some of you took ITS 323, we saw Shannon capacity equation about how much information we can send across a channel. Shannon came up with that. Uh, Shannon also did a lot of work on security or the concepts of security. Security and data communications are closely aligned. It's about representing information and getting a information in a, an efficient way from A to B. So there's similar concepts. So Shannon come up or define the concepts of with ciphers we'd like to have a cipher that has diffusion and confusion. What do they mean in simple terms? And just go back, the Feistel structure and including DES use or apply these concepts. So they do have this. Diffusion is spreading out the plain text when we get the ciphertext. Our plain text always has some structure. Think of an English phrase or document. There's some structure in the frequency of letters. When we apply our cipher, we'd like that structure to be diffused to be spread out across the entire ciphertext. So the structure is no longer present in the ciphertext. That's the idea there. So that the structure in the plain text or the statistical nature of the plain text is reduced in the ciphertext. So preferably that it looks random in the end. How to achieve that? Apply permutations or transpositions repeatedly and then on the input uh, plain text and apply some function to uh, like a substitution function in the same way that DES has some basic permutations P we saw those P boxes we saw in simplified DES P10 P8 P4 permutations but also some S boxes for substitutions and repeat each round. So that increases the amount of diffusion of the plain text. The other part is confusion. Make the relationship between the cipher text and the key complex with the intention that even if there is some structure in the cipher text, so the attacker can find some structure in the ciphertext, that is some letters occur more frequent than others, it still should be hard to take that ciphertext and find the key. So if, if that's achieved, we've got confusion. So making it hard, given the ciphertext, to find the key. So make the relationship between them very complex. We saw in some of our classical ciphers, once we find the ciphertext, the, the key is easy to find. 
once we found the ciphertext on our mo monoalphabetic cipher, we've automatically got the key. Whereas with DES and other ciphers, we'll see even if you find the ciphertext for a given plaintext, it's still hard to find the key. And that's the concept of confusion. And it uses some substitution, some complex substitution algorithm. Nonlinear means it's hard to go in the inverse. And in DES, the S boxes implement this. They in increase confusion in the cipher. Let's hope it decreases confusion of your knowledge of DES. Let's go through and look at the design characteristics and summarize what we know about DES. We went through an example of simplified DES and then a comparison with real DES. And it's really scaling up. Simplified DES, we make it simple so we can do an example. Real DES just is more S boxes, more rounds, larger blocks, and so on. But the same concepts and operations. You can look through the details of DES. Again, of course, no need to remember these, and no need to remember simplified DES operations. Okay, so I don't ask you in the exam uh, to remember these S boxes or this this picture or these permutations, you don't need to remember them. The reason we went through this example was for you to see that we're using very simple operations, permutations, substitutions, but combining them together to get uh, a good cipher. So let's go and look at some design characteristics of DES. Is it good? And one of the, the measures of seeing how good a cipher is, and it's not just for DES, but for others as well, is the avalanche effect. An avalanche, what happens? At the top of the mountain, a small thing starts falling, a small rock falls, and it knocks more rocks, and more rocks, and more rocks, and at the end there's uh, the whole mountain falling down. Okay. The concept is that with ciphers, we'd like to have the avalanche effect. With good ciphers... And the effect is that small changes in the input produce large changes in the output. A small change at the start means a large change at the, at the end. And we can look at it from two perspectives, from the input being the plain text or the input being the key. To show that, we'll look at uh, two examples here. First, in summary... DES has the avalanche effect. That is, that's good for security. It's considered designed to be a good design because it exhibits the avalanche effect. And the next two slides give examples of that. The idea is that we have two different plain text values. They differ by just one bit. If you look, these are in hexadecimal, but in fact it's just the first hexadecimal digit differs, 0 to 1. In binary, just one bit differs in these two input values. So a small change in inputs, what we'd like is to produce a large change in the output ciphertext. And this shows, shows those changes. So we see after a set of rounds. So we start with plain text, this 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, so on. That's plain text 1. And the one below it, 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, is plain text 2. And of course they differ by just one bit, single bit difference. And the delta column shows the number of bits that differ. So at the start, just one bit differs. And then we encrypt through the different stages of deaths, real deaths, not simplified deaths. And what this table shows is the output after each round. DES has 16 rounds. So we take the input plain text, we apply round 1, and the output, if we encrypt plain text 1, is this 3, C, F, da, da, da. And the output, if we encrypt plain text 2 after round 1, is this 3, C, F, 0, 3, and so on. There's only one bit that differs between those two outputs. 
So a small change in the input so far has only produced a small change in the output. That's not the avalanche effect. But with deaths, we go through multiple rounds. If we do the second round, we get this output, these two outputs. They differ by five bits. After three rounds, differ of difference of 18 bits, four rounds, 34, and we keep going after our 16 rounds and our inverse initial permutation. In this specific example, 32 bits differ. And that's what we aim for. What we'd like is for two input plain text values which differ by just one bit, when we encrypt both of them using the same key, we'd like the ciphertext values to be completely different. Now, remember with DES we use 64-bit blocks. So the output ciphertext 1 and ciphertext 2 are 64 bits in length. What we would like is that the differences are random or appear random. And on average, if you have a 64-bit block, we'd like at least half of the bits to be different. 32 would be optimal. It turns out to be 32 in this case, but not in all cases. Because, as an example, let's say an 8-bit block. Let's say a ciphertext is... What's a ciphertext value which is different from C2, a uh, C1? Significantly different. We have an 8-bit ciphertext value to keep it small. What's a value that is significantly different from C1 in this case? So, an example ciphertext, C1. Give me an example ciphertext, right, let's keep it simple. What's the difference? How many bits? Just one bit differs in this case. So I would say that these are similar. They're not much different. So eight bits differ. Right? That's significantly different. But now if we have a random or another ciphertext value, then we'd like, on average, if we consider all possible ciphertext values, on average we'd expect half of the bits to change. Because what if we have all the bits change? And it's just the inverse all the time. Another random value, maybe 8 bits, how many bits differ? 1, 2, 3, 4, just two random values, four bits differ. On average, if we take two random ciphertexts, we'd like half of the bits to differ. So with DES, which has 64 bits in the block, an avalanche effect, ideally, would produce half of the bits different after encryption. In this specific instance, we do, 32 bits. In other instances, it may vary. It's not always the same. So that demonstrates that the avalanche effect is in effect in this example, and it is in general with deaths. And it, in fact, turns out after about round four, we have this difference of around 32. It goes up and down a bit. So maybe we can just encrypt uh, after four or five rounds and stop with deaths. So the number of rounds, generally the more rounds you add, the more secure the output is but the more time it takes to implement. So it takes time to do this processing. So 16 was chosen as a trade-off of, okay, we see that four may be okay in this case, but maybe in other cases we need five or six rounds. Well, 16 is, uh, gives us some more freedom some in case uh, there's some cases which don't have the avalanche effect until six, seven, eight rounds but it's not too many such that it's too slow to implement. 
So choosing the number of rounds was an important design decision. I've asked in exams or in assignments to measure the avalanche effect of different ciphers. You may see some examples later. So understand what it means. The second one is the same concept, but take two plain text values which are the same. These two values. Encrypt one with key one. Encrypt the same plain text with a different key, differing just by one bit. So going back. The second example is plain text are the same, but the two keys that we use to encrypt differ by one bit. In the first example, the plain text values differed by one bit. The key was the same. And we see in this case where we change the key, again, after six, seven, eight rounds, we're getting close to this, about half bits are differing in the output. After the entire encryption, 30 in this specific case. On average, if we try different values, we'd like 32 to be the average difference. So DES has the avalanche effect, which is good, and in fact it uh, is achieved after just several rounds, which means it's likely that the number of rounds of 16 is sufficient. It was a good design choice. What else about DES? The key size is not good. The 64-bit initial key in DES is actually split into two parts. Eight bits used for a parity check, but not used in the encryption. So only 56 bits are used in the encryption, so an attacker really only needs to, only needs to guess those 56 bits. Which means there are 2 to the power of 56 possible keys, or about 7 by 10 to the 16. In 1977, someone designed a machine, they didn't build it, they designed or estimated a machine that would break deaths in about 10 hours if it cost 20 million US dollars. So that's, what, 40 years ago. In 1998, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation built a machine that cost a quarter of a million US dollars and they broke it in three days. So a brute force, dedicated hardware to try desk keys. They did it in about three days. Today it's considered too short to withstand brute force attacks. 56 bits is not long enough. In general with desk, the algorithm is considered secure. The limitation is the key size. So the design, people have done a lot of analysis and they find in most cases it's secure. They can't find weaknesses in the algorithm. But it has the weakness of the key length is too short. So, one approach then, because many people had software and hardware that implemented DES, being used a lot, they trust the algorithm, how do we make it more secure? Use it multiple times with a different key each time. Take a, your plain text, encrypt with DES with a 56-bit key. You get some ciphertext. Then encrypt that ciphertext using DES again with a different 56-bit key. And you get your ciphertext. And now, effectively, you have 2 by 56-bit keys, or 112 bits. And a brute force against 112 bits is uh, considered reasonably secure nowadays. So the concept was reuse DES by applying it multiple times. And a popular cipher today, and uh, although no longer recommended but still widely used, is triple DES. And the, ignore this 128-bit keys. We'll look in details and see there are different options for the key length for triple DES. So, Yes, it uses 128 bits, but there are other values. We'll see that here. What else about DES? There are some theoretical attacks on DES. Timing attacks. Observe how long it takes your hardware to encrypt and decrypt, and use that information to try and 
work out what the original plain text or key was. In theory possible, in practice very easy to, de to defend against by changing the implementation of DES to have some small var variations in how long each operation takes. And that makes these attacks, these timing attacks, almost impossible. There are other attacks by observing how plain text values change over time, looking at the differences, there are some attacks. So remember brute force in DES, 2 to the power of 56 operations. That's the worst case. This differential cryptanalysis attack, they could get it down to 2 to the power of 47 operations. Much better. But it required the attacker to have 2 to the power of 47 plain text values known in advance. So they need to know a lot of plain text in advance for this attack to work. So in practice, not very useful. And another one, uh, linear cryptanalysis, got it about the same number of operations and they need 2 to the power of 43 known plain text values. So if the attacker knows a lot of past plain text ciphertext pairs, a lot in this case, 2 to the power of 43 pairs, then which is what, 100 billion different pairs of ciphertext plaintext, then they can do attacks on deaths which take about 2 to the 47 operations. About uh, a thousand times faster than a brute force attack. Still slow. Well, today, nowadays, brute force is easy against deaths. So, because it can be broken in brute force, these attacks, people do not explore them much more because you just use brute force to break it. Another issue with DES was that originally was designed in private. The people who designed it were for companies or governments and they didn't tell people how they chose all the values. These are the S boxes from real deaths. They tell us that we take some bits in and we get some bits out. Why is it chosen this way? Or the designers chose it to be this way. And there was no original motivation of, well, why did they choose these values? Why not some other arrangements? It turns out that people have done analysis and found that even though they don't know the original motivations, if you make small changes in the design, it turns out that DES is much less secure. So small changes in those S boxes, for example, means that uh, the avalanche effect is not, not as good and that there's more weaknesses in DES, which suggests that they chose the design to be strong. They knew about other attacks. So generally DES is considered a good algorithm, but poor key length. And definitely not, not suitable today. What about other ciphers? Triple DES, AES, and other block ciphers. Uh, so the next move, since DES was considered good, to apply it multiple times. We'll come back to this. We'll look at double DES and triple DES come back to these and look at an attack in some detail. But it turned out that even triple DES was considered secure. It was three times as slow as DES. Because in fact you apply the same algorithm three times. So to encrypt something was three times slower than DES, which wasn't fast uh, in the start. So the advanced encryption standard was developed, designed in the, the late 90s. The idea was to make it secure, of course, but also to work well on different types of hardware and in software. The advanced encryption standard is used and highly recommended for use today. So it's still considered secure and it's recommended by the US government, for example, and many people use it in many different implementations. In, in uh, wireless LAN, in internet communications, in file level encryption, so if you encrypt your hard disk with Windows or your operating system, it usually uses AES. 
So it's very common. It uses 128-bit blocks. Okay, DES was 64 bits. AES, 128 bits. It allowed different size keys. 128, 192, 256. Okay, so the longer the key, the, the more secure against brute, brute force. It used rounds, and depending upon the key length, it used different rounds, 10 to 14 different rounds, and used XOR and some other S boxes and some other arithmetic uh, that was a little bit more complicated than DES, but still considered secure. We're not going to cover the details of AES. We just used DES to show an example of one cipher. The other ciphers, we will not go into that detail. We just mentioned characteristics. Uh, but AES is considered a, a good cipher to use today. Generally considered secure. And others. A list of some, not all, block ciphers. Uh, some of the designers, when they were designed, and some characteristics, so the block size, the key size, uh, the design approach. The Feistel structure is similar to what DES used, those rounds with substitutions, permutations. They all use similar approaches, not the same. Some are more secure than others. Generally, AES is considered uh, highly recommended. Let's go back to DES, double DES, and triple DES. So given DES is considered secure, but the key length is too short, the idea to improve it was to apply it multiple times. Then you can reuse the software and hardware that already implements DES, so, and all the, the experience of using it can be reused. So encrypt multiple times, each time you encrypt, use a different key. Then for a brute force attack, the attacker needs to guess all keys you use and effectively increases the key length. Turns out double DES is not so good and therefore triple DES was designed. So let's look at why double DES is no good. That is, and also the general concept of double encryption. It's not just double DES. This is the idea. We have some plain text. Normally, we encrypt using some key and we get output ciphertext. So a brute force requires guessing that key. With double encryption, we take our plain text, encrypt with one key, get some intermediate value, x, then encrypt that intermediate value with the same cipher, but using a different key. And then our ciphertext is the output. So our key is actually made up of two parts, K1 and K2. And they are, they are different, say two random keys. So now what an attacker needs to do, effectively our key length has doubled. For a brute force attack, they need to guess uh, both values. They need to try all values. And therefore, if K1 is 56 bits, like in DES, and K2 is a different 56 bits, then the attacker for a brute force attack needs to try 112 bits. That is 2 to the power of 112 operations. So that was the idea of double encryption, but it turns out it has a, a severe weakness. And we'll use an example to go through that weakness show how that weakness arrives. And the example, you have one in your handouts, but I created a bigger one, which is a little bit more interesting. So take one of these and pass along. It's a cipher, but a, uh, a block cipher we'll use as an example. You don't need to do other courses. You can do other courses at other times. Try and solve this. A few more. Enough? Okay. 
just give this to you. I will show it on the screen and explain what it is. We'll use it as an example. Two more if need. First, what, what is this? This is our, let's say, our, our cipher that we've designed. It's a five-bit block cipher. That is, the block of plain text is five bits. We take five bits of plain text. We'll apply our cipher. We'll get five bits of cipher text as the output. So a five-bit block in this case, to keep it small. And we've got a three-bit key. So the way we read this table is that with a 5-bit input block, there are 32 possible plain text inputs to the power of 5. And I've listed them here on the left column. And then what I've done is said that, okay, if we're using this particular key in the next columns, the keys up the top, 0, 0, 0, for example, if we take the cipher text 5 zeros using key... 0, 0, 0, the output ciphertext will be 0, 0, 0, 1. If I used a different key, for example, 1, 1, 1 here in the last column, encrypt the same plain text, the output ciphertext will be 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. That's the right way to read this, this table. Plain text, input, different keys along the top, and the corresponding cipher text that we'll get out of our cipher when we use that key. I've just randomly created this. Okay, this arrangement in each of these columns, I just randomly mix them up. If you, you check, you'll see that this, this column with a key 0, 0, 0, the 32 values here is just a random arrangement of the 32 possible plain text values. So we have a reversible mapping. We don't map one plain text to more than one ciphertext value. There's 32 unique values here, and I've just a different random arrangement in the second and the subsequent columns. So that's our simple cipher that we can encrypt any plain text five bits long, and we'll get a ciphertext as output given one of the three bit keys. Consider this is our, uh, our, our, our cipher. Uh, and we want to increase the key length. So we have our cipher, like a desk, but we want to apply it two times to increase the key length. Our double cipher, double encryption. So what we do is we encrypt twice, but using different keys each time. So the concept is, let's call our cipher ABC. In the normal approach, what we do is we take some plain text in, our cipher, ABC, takes a key as in, and produces ciphertext as output. And the, the ciphertext it produces is given by that table. Let's say we want to do it differently and use double encryption. We take our five bit, and the plain text is five bits. The cipher text is five bits. And the key was three bits. Let's say we take our plain text in, apply ABC once with key one. And then we'll get an intermediate output, we'll call it X, and then apply the same cipher again on that X value with a different key, K2, and then we'll get our cipher text. So that's our double encryption. Let's see how that works and see how we can attack that. Just to make sure people are awake, uh, with double encryption, no, we'll see how you're awakened when we go through our example. Um, so, 
we're going to do an attack on this cipher. First, brute force attack. On the single instance of the cipher, what would a brute, how many operations does a brute force attack take in the worst case? Brute force on the single instance, well, we need to try all possible keys. We have a 3-bit key, so there are 8 possible keys, so a brute force takes 2 to the power of 3 or 8 operations. What about a brute force on our double cipher? How many operations? Calculate the number of operations. 2 to the power of 9. No. How many keys do you get to choose from? How many possible keys are there? Think of the key in the double cipher as just being a combination of those two, a, a concatenation of those two. That is, to encrypt, what I do is I choose K1, one of eight, and then I choose K2, one of eight. So how many possible values do we have? That is, I can choose a 3-bit value here and a 3-bit value here. We could say our resulting key is, let's say, K1 combined with K2. So how many keys do we have? How many possible keys? Sixty-four. Where does that come from? Mm -hmm. Okay. There is there are eight values for the first key. There are eight possible values for the second key. So let's say we choose the first value for the first key, then we can choose one of eight values for the second. If we choose the second for here, we can choose one of eight. We get eight times eight. Or two to the power of six. We have effectively six bits. Okay? Three bits here, three bits here. The resulting key is the combinate or the uh, concatenation of those two. So effectively we have six bits. We've doubled the key length. With six bits, our brute force would take 2 to the power of 6, or 64 operations. Of course, easy to break, but we'll see uh, much stronger, in theory, than our sim single cipher, doubling the, the key length. Any problems so far on this concept? So we double our key length by applying the cipher twice with respect to a brute force attack. So if I give you a plain text, oh, sorry, if I give you a cipher text, you, if I give you a cipher text output, it's five bits, you can try all 64 keys, and one of them will give you the correct plain text. Which one is going to be hard to tell? But in general, when we have a large uh, a plain text and structure in the plain text, we'll be able to find it. Now, it turns out, although a brute force attack takes 64 operations, 2 to the power of 6, there's a, what's called a meet in the middle attack, which will take much less effort. In fact, a meet in the middle attack will show we can break this cipher in about the same number of operations as a single version. So let's try it. So we're going to apply the double cipher. The meet in the middle attack assumes the attacker knows some plain text ciphertext pairs. So that's the first assumption of this attack, and I'll give you some and we'll make use of them. So the attacker now, in the meet in the middle,
let's try and attack. And the attacker for this attack to be successful needs to know some pairs of plain text ciphertext, and I'll give you some. I'll give you two to get started. So how to interpret this is this is some plain text value, this is a cipher text value. Let's call it P1 C1. And this is another plain text value, P2 and C2. Let's assume the attacker knows these values. Somehow they've discovered these values. And they don't know the key that map the plain text to the cipher text. But they know these pairs. Their aim is to find the key. Okay, so the aim of the attacker, find the key given our cipher and given these pairs. A brute force attack, we could take our cipher text and try all 64 keys, one of them would give us this plain text, and we'd know that key gives us the correct uh, plain text, and that's the key to use. But we can be faster than a trying all 64. Let's see how. So the first step for the meet in the middle attack is that we take one of the known plain text ciphertext pairs, and starting with the plain text, encrypt it using all possible key values. So we'll start with P1 and encrypt P1, so a brute force against P1, but for a single version of the cipher. So using different key values, how many possible key values are there for a single version of the cipher? that is, let's go to our picture, what we're going to do as the attacker is we've got a value of P. We're going to encrypt that using our table with a, all possible values of K1. How many values? Well, there are three bits, so there are eight possible values of K1. And that's the, the eight columns here. K1 of 000 through to K1 of 111 encrypt that plain text, and we'll get eight values of this intermediate value, x. Do that. See what you get. So you take that plain text and encrypt it with our cipher, our single version of the cipher, and get eight values of the intermediate output. I'll call it x, uh, say x, um, x1 with key 1, x11. So when we take p1, 01101, and use key Zero, zero, 0, what do we get as an output? Well, you look up the table. Our plain text, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, is here. We 
what you do is you take the plain text value, encrypt it with the first key, all zeros, and this will be the value of the x that comes out, our intermediate value. And then do it again for the second key, and you'll get this value out. And the third key through to the eighth key. So we get these eight intermediate values. That's the first stage of this attack. What we're, what we're trying to do is to find the key in less than two to the two to the power of six operations, in less than 64 operations. The first case is encrypt, uh, encrypt the plain text with eight keys, so eight operations. And you get these eight values as output. Eight x values. So I'll list them. You can check. Uh, I've got the answers in front of me, but just from that table, that row gives us the eight possible values. If we encrypt using the second key, the third key gives us one O. Fourth key Those eight values are just the row in that, that table. You check. So the row where the plain text is 01101 for the eight different keys. So we just encrypt using our single cipher that with all keys. How many operations so far? Well, eight operations, one for each key. Next step is to take, so we knew P1, and we know the corresponding ciphertext, C1. What we just did is take P1, encrypt it with all possible keys. The next step is to take the corresponding ciphertext and decrypt it with all possible eight keys. And we should get matching X values. Why? Look at our diagram. Our cipher is if we encrypt P with all values of K1, we'll get these eight X values. We know the corresponding ciphertext with P, so if we decrypt C, going backwards, C going backwards, with all possible values of the key, then we'll get eight possible X values. At least one of them, those X values, should match. Because if we use the correct key, if we're using the correct key, we take P1, encrypt with the correct key 1, we get an X. If we have the ciphertext and decrypt with the correct key, we must get the same X. So from the attacker's point of view, try C1, decrypted with all 8 keys, K2s, to get a set of 8 X1s. Encrypt the plain text with all keys, decrypt the ciphertext with all keys, with the aim of meeting in the middle. So we know C1. C1 is our all ones. If we use the correct key, if we encrypt P1 with the correct K1 and decrypt C1 with the correct K2, we should get the same X value. So let's try. So given C1, what is the plain text if we decrypt using key 000? Well, we can see from the table, if the ciphertext is all ones, where are we? The ciphertext is all ones here. 
If we decrypt using key 000, the plain text will be 10001. So we're going backwards now, decrypting. This table shows taking the plain text with the keys, we'll get this ciphertext. So to decrypt, we find the ciphertext, the corresponding key column gives us the plain text. So decrypting this with key 000 gives us 1001. So that's our first x value. And then we do it for the next key. Uh, so same ciphertext will give us this plain text 00110. And then for subsequent keys, if I can find all ones, we have it somewhere. and so on. Okay, so we take the ciphertext decrypt with all eight keys. And the values that we'll get, I have them Are those eight values. So if you look up the ciphertext with each of those eight keys, the corresponding plain text values would be these eight. And what we said is that if we use the correct key, the x values, if we come from both directions, should match. Which x values match? None of them? Yes, some of them do. Don't necessarily look in this way. That is, if I encrypt P, P1 with this key, I get this value. If I decrypt the ciphertext with any of these eight keys, these are the eight x values I get, does this x match one of these eight? And we check. Which ones match? And how many? Let's try and find them. you'll see that the first x value is not in the list. 11101 is not in this list. The second one, 00111, do we have occurrence? Yes, we do. There's a match here. And then we do it for the rest. And this one matches in two instances. Was it? I thought it was in two instances. Yep. You see, there are the, the three sets of values that match. That is, here, uh, what have I, yeah. 00111, 0011, 01000, 01000, 01000. What does that tell us? It tells us the possible keys are either K1, so K1 tells us this value, K2 this value. So K1 being 001 and K2 being 100. Or K1 is 0, 1, 1, produces this x value, and k2 being 1, 1, 1, or k1, k2. So it tells us that we've got three potential keys in this case. Let's list them. k1, the first match is... 
it's this value here and the corresponding K2 that gives us the correct ciphertext would be 100. Remember our, our final key is just the combination of K1 and K2. That's a potential correct key, but there are two others as well. K1, 100, zero, zero, K2, or 1s. So the attacker has now broken it down to being three possible correct values. How do we know which one's the real one? We use our second pair of plain text ciphertext that we know. So we assumed at the start that the attacker already knew two pairs of plain text ciphertext. Sometimes they need just one, it turns out. Sometimes, in many cases, there'll be just one correct value and that's it, you've found the key. If not, you need a second pair. And what we do now is check. If we take P2, encrypt with K1 of 001, we'll get some intermediate value, then take that intermediate value and encrypt with K2, do we get C2? If so, this is the key. If not, try this one, or this one. Which one is it? So what you do now is take your P2 and encrypt with K1, find the intermediate value, then encrypt again with K2, and the ciphertext you get, if this is the correct key pair, or set of keys, is C2. Let's look in the table. P2 is 11001. P2 is 11001. And the first possible key was 010. Is that right? 001. So we try 001. Encrypt P2 with 001, the intermediate value is five zeros. And then take that intermediate value and encrypt it with K2. So all zeros encrypt it with K2. And what was K2? 100. we get this value as an output, 11011. Is it correct? Yes, it is. So what do we just do? We took, if I could fit it in here, we took our plain text, 11001, encrypted with this key, and the output was our intermediate value of all zeros. And then we took that value, encrypted with the second key, and the output was 11011. And in fact, that matches our expected ciphertext C2. We've found our key already. We were lucky in this case. We didn't have to try the second two. But you can try the second two, and you'll see that they don't produce the correct ciphertext. Just to confirm, you'll see that if you take P2 with these two keys, you will not get C2, and the same with the second one. So we have the answer. The attacker knows the key. It's... Zero, zero, 001100 zero, zero. How many operations did we take to do that? How many encrypts or decrypts? We treat encrypts and decrypts the same in terms of the amount of effort. So how many? Well, we can count them. 
we took our plain text and tried all eight keys. Two to the power of three or eight operations there. So in the first instance we took here two to the power of three operations. And then we did the same with our ciphertext, try all keys, so another two to the power of three operations. And then we did one, two operations here, just to check. So, two in this case. So, the total number of operations, two to the power of three, plus two to the power of three, plus another two. Compare that to brute force. Our brute force is 2 to the power of 6. In this attack we had plus another 2 18 operations. Or 2 to the power of 3 plus 1 plus those extra 2. 2 to the power of 3 plus 2 to the power of 3 is 2 times 2 to the power of 3, which is 2 to the power of 3 plus 1, plus another two small ones at the end. Sometimes we don't need to go to those two at the end. Uh, it will vary. Brute force, 2 to the power of 6 operations. Meet in the middle attack, 2 to the power of 4 plus a couple of others. extend that from not a 3-bit cipher to a 56-bit cipher of DES. Our example we use a 3-bit key. Same concept applies in DES. If you use a 56-bit key, brute force in DES would take, and running out of space, but in DES, brute force would take 2 to the power of 112 with a 56-bit key. But the meet in the middle attack, we see with a 3-bit key, is 2 to the power of 3 plus 1 plus a few others. It turns out that this is usually quite small compared to this. So it turns out with and 2 to the power of 2 times 3 for brute force. With des, brute force 2 to the power of 12. With a meet in the middle on des, is 2 to the power of 56 plus 1 plus some others. And usually that's quite small it's, uh, uh, compared to 2 to the power of 56. So approximately 2 times normal deaths. A meet in the middle attack on double deaths takes about twice as much effort as a brute force on single deaths. Double deaths is about two times stronger than single deaths, which is nothing. So if single death takes two days to break, double death takes four days, which is nothing in terms of security. It's not secure. Or if it costs a thousand dollars to break death, it costs two thousand dollars to break double death. So using double death doesn't provide much advantage over single deaths because of the meet in the middle attack. Hence, double death is not used, and in general, double encryption. Okay, this is a problem with double encryption. Turns out by using three stages, not two, we can overcome this meet of the middle attack. And that's where we get to triple deaths, and that's what's used in practice today. So, we're out of time, so try and get your heads around how to do a meet in the middle attack on double encryption. But in summary, we need some known plaintext ciphertext pairs. That's an assumption. The attacker knows these values at the start. Just two normally. Even with real deaths, you don't need to know many. You take a plaintext, encrypt with all possible keys, two to the power of k, if our single single cipher is k-bit key length, and then take that corresponding ciphertext and decrypt with all possible keys, another 2 to the power of k, and then if you find the matching ones, and if you have more than one, then try the second pair. 
And usually there's not many that are, that are matching. So it doesn't take many further operations to do those second, second pair. And then you find the key. So double encryption doesn't help. Triple encryption avoids this problem. Let's stop there. Next week, we'll move on to the next topic of using modes of operation. How do we encrypt a large document? These are operating on 64 bits, 128 bits. What happens if we have one megabyte? And then move on to, I think, public key encryption. Maybe next week we'll get on to that. If you want to collect your hard copies of your quiz, you may do so. They're in alphabetical order, so you may find your name. So this topic we're going to get to very, cover very briefly stream ciphers and related to that and a very important part of many security algorithms is random numbers. Okay, so we'll talk first about random numbers and then some quick examples of stream ciphers and then return and look at brute force and other attacks on ciphers in general. With our block cipher, with AES, for example, it operates on a block of 128 bits at a time, and one mode of AES, I use a 128-bit key. And to use a, a block cipher, a symmetric cipher, the encryptor and decryptor must know the same key. Okay, so we encrypt with one key, we decrypt with the same key. That's the idea of a symmetric cipher. How do we choose a key? 
choose a 128-bit value, 128-bit key. Anyone? How are you going to choose one? Uh, what about, and I will not write all 128 bits, but what about this as a key? If I choose a key, I want it to be secret, but I'll tell you, okay? All zeros, 128 bits, and maybe a one at the end. Decimal one. I chose that as my key, and I tell you, the person I want to send a message to, and what I do is I take my data, my file, I encrypt using AES, using this 128-bit key. You know the key, so you can decrypt. Is that okay? Secure? Why? Why is it? What's wrong? All right, everyone knows, but let's say I trust you, and we don't want uh, someone from uh, IT section to know. So what can an attacker do to try and decrypt the cipher text that we get. So I take some plain text, encrypt using this key, and I get some cipher text. The attacker has the cipher text. Assuming we have a strong cipher, there are no known attacks against the cipher, what's the what can the attacker do to try and break the cipher text to get the plain text? What can they do? They don't know the key. What can the attacker do? Come on, you, you need to be think like a malicious person. I know. Brute force. Generally, brute force or try and guess keys. Okay, Brute force means guess a key. That is, take the ciphertext. Let's, as an attacker, guess, choose some r random key, decrypt and see if the plain text we get from decryption makes sense. If it does, we've found the key. Okay? If it doesn't, we try a different key. We guess a different key. And we keep guessing keys until we get one that decrypts successfully. Now, maybe as an attacker, instead of guessing random keys, maybe you'd start with some uh, structured keys. What if Maybe I'll try all zeros as a key, as the attacker. Guess that one first. And maybe try this key second. Yes, it can be a random value, but the attacker, if they have some knowledge about how you may choose the keys, they can use that to try and try those keys first, which gives them much more chance of finding the plain text. Brute force is going to take too long, but if they can try the keys all zeros, all ones, 127 zeros and one one, then immediately they've found the plain text. The point is, if you want to prevent a brute force attack, when you choose a key, you should choose random keys. Okay. If you choose a key, okay, let's just use all ones, because it's easy to write down, then it's not random. And the attacker can take that knowledge. Okay, Steve's lazy. He just chooses keys which are easy to write down and he'll try them first and find the, the plain text. So when you choose a key, it should be a random value. Similar, when you choose a password for your login for Moodle, it should be a random password, a random set of characters. Everyone chooses random passwords for your bank account, your Hotmail, your... Uh, we were, no one chooses random passwords. Okay, we'll come to that in another topic. Uh, because random passwords for humans are hard to remember, but for computers, because usually the user doesn't have to remember the key, we'll see that it's usually software choosing the key. So they can random choose a random value and store it in, in memory on, or on disk and encrypt using the random key. So we need to use random numbers to generate keys for encryption. Many other aspects of security network and, and security protocols make use of random numbers. 
And that's why we're, we're talking about random numbers now, because they are in fact used in many parts of security. One of them is choosing keys, but there are other parts where we use random numbers. How do you choose a random number? Come on, you've all had uh, almost two weeks holiday, or maybe holiday. Uh, so your all your brains are refreshed. <laughs> so who's a, choose a random number. Cho use the current time. Okay, is the time random? Sorry. Use a time to generate a fake random number. The time's predictable. It's not random. The time to now and the time in one second time, I can predict what that is. The time is not random. What can we do with it? Throw a dice. Throw a dice. Okay. So every time I want to, ch I want to choose a 128-bit key. So what do I do? Get a, a, a die. 128 side die and, and roll it. Uh, or two side and roll it 128 times. Flip a coin. Okay, not very convenient. How will you get a computer to generate random numbers? You use a function. What function? Come on, you're a computer scientist. Give me an example. RAND. Use the RAND function. Okay, great. Now, your task is to implement a new RAND function. How are you going to implement it? What does a RAND function do? It's not magic. It, it, it follows some steps. You can't just rely on that all the time. So, is it, how would the RAND function in your programming language be implemented? How do you think a computer can generate random numbers? Anyone? Use the process ID. Use the 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 ID of the the CPU or uh, of the process the software process. Uh, usually not random. Usually limited between zero and sixty five thousand or so. Uh, there's not many values to choose from. I suspect it's not very random. I want to choose a a value of one hundred twenty eight bits length. And I think there'll be some structure in the processes. The first process will always be process ID 1, say on a Unix system. Where do you generate, how do you generate random numbers? Okay, let's try easily. How do you generate random numbers? I ask you, choose a random number between 1 and 1 million. Well, too slow for my software, okay, anyone else? How do you generate random numbers? Well, it's hard to describe, isn't it? How do, how do you remember a computer just does what we program it to do? Okay, we program a computer from the very basics, the assembly language to program you know, the operations. So, to implement that rand rand function in C or in whatever language you use, we must program some function. So in most cases, we actually don't you create real random numbers or true random numbers. We use some function that approximates random numbers. And we'll go through some functions. Some are very simple. Some are more complex. But it's really just a function that takes some input and produces, hopefully, some numbers which look random. So it's not easy to create random numbers. In many cases with our computers, we generate what we'll call pseudo-random numbers. Pseudo means not quite, not, not really random, but approximately. Okay, so we often call them pseudo-random numbers, not true random numbers. So let's, let's explore that a bit further and see how computers may generate random numbers. Why do we need random numbers in security? Select keys, we need random numbers, and we need to do it fast. And so we can't just roll a, roll a dice manually. We need software to implement to choose a random number and be able to do it 
uh, quite quickly and repeatedly. And there is a number of other places. So generating keys, uh, we'll use them in stream ciphers, authentication, we'll see these concepts or technologies later. They all make use of random numbers. So we need random numbers. What do we mean by randomness? A uniform distribution is one measure. There are others, it's not the only one, but think of a sequence of numbers. Then we'd expect, if it's a binary value, we'd expect on average for a long sequence we'd have the same number of zeros and ones. So a long sequence, say if we consider many, many random numbers, binary, say millions of bits, we'd expect not all of those bits to be zero. If all of those one million bits were zero, I would guess that that's not a random number. Okay. So we'll have to expect uh, the same frequency of ones as zeros if we consider a, a, a binary value. But not necessarily 500,000 ones followed by 500,000 zeros, same number of ones and zeros, but we'd look at subsequences. Instead of looking at all one million, look at 500,000, we'd expect approximately half of them to be zeros and, and ones as well. So of different subsequences, we'd expect a uniform distribution of our zeros and ones. That's one measure or one th way that we, we try and interpret randomness. Another one is the independence. Take a sequence of numbers, the next number in the sequence should not depend upon the previous numbers. Or at least it should be very hard to see the relationship. We'll see with pseudo-random numbers. Let me generate a random sequence of numbers. I'm going to write some numbers. Let's say I have a random number generator. And I call it many times. Okay, My code calls the rand function many times and it returns these values. The first value it returns is 10. Let's work in decimal. The second value it returns is 20. The third value is 30. And then 40. What do you think the... And then 50. What do you think this value is going to be? we'd say that this value is not in independent of the previous values. It's actually dependent on the previous value. We see there's a pattern here. Is this a random sequence? No. There's some structure here. This, the next value in our sequence, was dependent on the previous values. And in, here it's quite obvious it was dependent. What about this? What's the next value? A sequence of numbers generated by the RAND function. The first time I call it, 17, then 26, then 93, 1, 52. What's the next value? What's the next value? What do you think? And I'll give you a hint. It's be between 0 and 100. I don't know. That is, there's no pattern in this case. I tried to uh, choose them randomly in my head in this case. So we'd say that we have a sequence and we cannot see any dependence between the numbers. Whereas in the first sequence we could see the dependence that they're increasing by 10. In this case we cannot see the dependence between the numbers. And that hopefully this next one is inde independent of the previous ones. It doesn't depend upon the previous values. If so, then we generate a random sequence of numbers. So we'd like independence of our numbers. So that 
given one value, we cannot infer what the next value would be. So you couldn't guess what this would be. Well, you couldn't correctly guess uh, because you, there's no dependence between those numbers. So that's what we'd like in a random number generator. And that another way to interpret that is it's hard to predict the next value. Okay. And that's an important property for security. We'll see why soon. So we distinguish between true random number generators and pseudo-random number generators, sometimes shortened as PRNG. Pseudo-random functions, let's, let's ignore that. Let, we'll not talk about that. Keep it simple. A true random number generator uses some physical source, some non-deterministic source, to generate random numbers. Non-deterministic means it's not predetermined. We do not have some algorithm for generating them. Some examples of such sources, something that measures radiation events. It's in, in the physical environment, uh, radiation me measurements of radiation from some source is, in, is considered to be random, or as close as random as, as we know in, in physics. Similar, if we have capacitors on some electronic uh, set of, uh, on a motherboard, for example, or on, on a circuit board, the measurements from those capacitors usually exhibits randomness. Some noise from different electronic components. It's considered that the, the noise is not predictable, it's random. Uh, or some noise from some audio system. Okay, some, the noise that come, comes out of the, the speakers through the, the audio system is often considered random, truly random. So yes, we, we can use in computers some of these sources. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, okay, and then maybe a little bit less so, but still often considered true random is different physical activities if we think about a computer, uh, measuring uh, the difference between the times of I.O., input-output operations on a hard disk, okay, the, the writes and the reads on the hard disk uh, over different periods of time, uh, in some cases exhibits true randomness or interrupts. In fact, usually combining these together, not just one, but looking at the time in which software or interrupts occur on a, from a piece of hardware, uh, disk read-write operations, activity on a keyboard, even on a mouse, can start to exhibit true randomness. All of these true random number generators usually require some physical device to measure them. Okay. How do I get random numbers out of some radiation or leaky capacitors? I need some special de device to measure the input and then convert it into binary for our random numbers. And usually they generate just a small number of values over a period of time. So because they need physical devices, to implement random number generators using true sources on, on computers is usually costly or inconvenient. So it's not so uh, common. Who has a, a radiation measuring device on their laptop? No one, okay? Uh, so how do you get random numbers on your laptop? How does the RAND function work? Well, we use what's called pseudo-random number generators. We use some algorithm or function to calculate numbers and output a sequence of numbers such that hopefully, if it's a good algorithm, those, that sequence of numbers appears to be random. It's not truly random, but for most practical purposes, it's random enough. A relatively random sequence. But note, it's a deterministic algorithm. The algorithm is implemented follows some steps. So in theory, you can determine the next value. Okay, you can determine what the values are going to be in the sequence. In practice, it just needs to be hard to predict the next value. 
So in practice, most computers use pseudo-random number generators. Some special cases may use true random number generators. Uh, for example, you buy CPUs now, like an Intel or an AMD C CPU, and they have inbuilt their own uh, operations to generate random numbers. And it's thought that they take some measurements of what the CPU is doing to get some input of randomness. And that can be used as a true random number generator. So, to use in a computer system where we need a, a generate a random number or a sequence of bits, if we have a tr source of true randomness, we can measure that and then convert it into binary and we get our random stream of bits. But that requires some physical measurements usually, it is inconvenient. So in a pseudo-random number generator, what we do is we just have some algorithm that takes some initial input, some initial value, and with random numbers it's called the seed value. And that algorithm takes that seed, produces an output, and usually has some feedback, the next value is fed back and produces the, the, the next value. So we generate a stream of bits if we look in binary. And that's a pseudo-random number generator. Let's go straight to an example. We'll come back to some of the things we skipped. The linear congruential generator, LCG. An example of a simple pseudo-random number generator. Simple to explain and go through a few examples. Uh, here it is. The idea of random number generators is they generate a sequence of numbers where that sequence should appear random. So this function or algorithm is defined here where it takes several parameters. The idea is that we have three constants, A, C and M. A is a multiplier, C is just some uh, uh, value that we add, and we take the current value of our random, our current random value, and multiply by A, add C, and mod by M, the modulus. And that produces our next random value in the sequence. And to generate the next value, then we use the, the previous one again and use the same function and generate hopefully a random sequence. So just let's see how that works in practice and then we'll come and discuss some of the design issues. So what we need to do is choose values of these constants A, C and M, so the constants for this algorithm, and we have an initial value, x0. We need to start with some value. That's called our seed value. So we choose a seed value. So I'll give you some parameters and you'll calculate some of the values in the sequence. Let's say to get started we choose... Uh, we're using LCG and the parameters you can try just keep it simple a is 1 c is 1 m is 100 and we start with an initial value a seed value x0 of let's say 23 no significance of the seed generate the next few numbers in the sequence using the LCG function. See what happens. So use those three constants in that algorithm, in that equation, and the initial value x0, and see what x1 is and x2. And that will be our sequence generated by this pseudo-random number generator. So find x1. When you have x1, you can find x2 and x3.
Anyone have the values of the, the first 10? X1 through to X10? So simply look at that equation, xn plus 1 equals axn plus c mod m. You have the constants a, c, and m. You have x0, so from that you can calculate x1. n equals 0, so you'll get x1 as the output. Then do it for the first few values. What do you get? 20. Keep going. Values? Come on, come on. Give me some random numbers. No need to use your computer to calculate. I think you can calculate addition and multiplication by yourself. Uh, but fine, use your computer. See if this random number generator is as good as the one that the Mac OS uses. X1, 24. Keep going, X2, X3, X4. Let's see. So simply A times Xn, the current value, plus C mod M. M is 100, C is 1, A is 1. So in fact we forget about A because it's multiplied by, by 1. So it's the current value plus 1 mod 100. So the current value plus 1 mod 100. 24. X2 be 24 plus 1 mod 100. So we could say X, our sequence, we're starting with X0, our C was 23, and if we write the sequence of numbers, I think you'll see 24. 25, we just pl add 1 all the time, up to where? Mm, 99, what's after 99? 0, mod 100, and eventually we'll get back to 23. That's a comma. Okay, all right. Not a very good random sequence. So this is our random number generator, but with the set of parameters we've used, it's not very good. Okay, so we'll, we'll change the parameters in a moment. Uh, so we just increment by one, so uh, not a good random sequence. But we, the aim is to generate a sequence of numbers which is, appears random. This one doesn't appear random, it's obvious in this case. Now, uh, but some characteristics. Note that when we get back to 23, if we kept going we'd be back to 24, 25, and we just repeat all the time. We'd get back to 23 and repeat. We repeat. So the set of unique values is called the period, or the length of those unique values is the period of this sequence. What's the period of this sequence, or how many values? So the period in this case goes from here up to 22, in fact. So 23 all the way through to 22. And how many values there? 100. So 
the period of this sequence, we have 100 different values generated here. We'll return to what we, why that's significant after we see a few other sequences. Let's try again, but with some different parameters. And see if we can get a better random sequence, one that it looks more random. Let's try our LCG, same algorithm, but let's try A is 7, C is 0, and M is 32. And a seed of one. Generate the, the set of sequence numbers with this configuration of the LCG. Easy task. Same algorithm, different parameters. A is 7, C is 0, M is 32. x1, what value do you get? Remember we have a times x0, 7 times 1 plus c, all mod m. Seven and X two <coughs> keep going. Keep your brains working. I know some simple mathematics. X2, 17. Someone's got 17. That sounds familiar. X2, 17. Again. 7, A times our previous value, sorry, A times our previous value, which was 7 plus 0 mod 32. 49 mod 32, 17. X3, and you'll do the same, 7 times 17, which is 119 mod 32, 23, good. You can check. X4, 7 times 23, which is 161 mod 7, 32, is 1. Okay. X5, it's 7 again. We're back, we're repeating again. Okay, because if we have 1, we've already got to 1, so from 1 the input will be 7 again. We repeat. So we can say this sequence, in this case, x, we start at 1, 7, 17, 23, a period of 4. There are just 4 values generated with this sequence and then we repeat. In the previous sequence, we had a period of 100. We'll see the longer the period, the better. But not necessarily the better random sequence. Okay, we saw would we have 23, 24, 25. Definitely not random. Looks a little bit more random. It's not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But can we do better? Well, 
if you change the parameters around, you can start to get more random se looking sequences. So it's all about, with this algorithm, choosing the correct parameter values. Uh, we'll not go through it. I'll give you a, a one that you can check later. Another configuration... Uh, A is 5, C is 0 again, M is still 32. With the same seed of 1, we get, and I've calculated it before, 1, 5, 25, 29, 17, 21, 9, 13. And then we go back to 1. A period of 8. So, we have a very simple algorithm with several parameters. And it turns out with this algorithm, if we choose the parameters well, so some parameters are not good. The first set were terrible because we just got incrementing numbers. If we choose them well, though, we can generate quite good random sequences. This sequence, 1, 5, 25, 29, 17, 21, 9, 13. Can you see any structure there? Nothing obvious, okay? There is structure because it comes from an equation, okay? But the sequence, at least very simple uh, example, it looks to have some randomness, especially compared to the first sequence, which was just incrementing numbers. The third one compared to the previous one, all right, there's only four numbers there. In general, the longer the period, the better. We desire a long period. That is a large number of numbers before we repeat. With LCG, how do we make the period longer? What's, all right, in theory, what's the maximum period? Uh, it's M. Okay. This equation takes some value mod m. So the answers are always going to be between 0 and m minus 1. We can never have an answer which is larger than or m or larger because we mod by m. So the period is limited by m in this case. So if you want a large period, make m large. And some recommended values for using LCG in practice is to make M as large as possible. And it turns out it's good if it's a prime number. Modding by a prime number uh, will give us more distinct values in, in the result. So choose the, the, a prime number as large as possible. Well, that depends upon your, your computer. Say if you've got 32-bit numbers, uh, a large prime number is 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. People have found that before. Which means the maximum possible period, if you use this value of m, is about 2 to the power of 31. Okay. About uh, 2 billion. So you can have up to about 2 billion different values in your random sequence. Then you'll have to repeat. Guaranteed you'll have to repeat. And you need to choose values of A and C which are good. The first values we chose were not good. Some people have done analysis and found out if C is zero, some, there are several good values of A. One is, turns out, 16,807. Try it. Set C to zero, A to 16,807, M to 2 to the 31 minus 1. Choose a seed, choose X zero, and start calculating the sequence of values and you'll see you'll get a very long sequence of different values before they repeat and they will look random.
So there's the first example of a very simple algorithm to generate random numbers. So your random function in your programming language will use a pseudo-random number generator, not necessarily th this one, maybe, maybe a different one, will use a pseudo-random number generator to generate a sequence of numbers. And they will always have a period, a finite period. Which means if you keep calling that random number generator, eventually you'll get back to the first value and repeat the sequence. Unless you change the parameters, and that's where the seed is important. By changing the seed, you'll get a different sequence to start with. So if you're using the random function in your programming language, then often there's a way to change the seed for that random number generator. And that will produce a different sequence of random numbers. Let's go back and see some of the general concepts we've, we've missed. So what would we like with a pseudo-random number generator? We want to be able to generate a stream of numbers, a sequence of numbers. Usually we think about binary. Right? Our examples, we use decimal, but usually we want binary values for security or for security applications. We generally like such that we can generate some stream of random numbers, but if you don't know the seed, that initial value, it should be hard to determine the sequence. Okay, so if you don't know what the seed is, an attacker, even if they know that algorithm, shouldn't be able to determine what the sequence is. It should be unpredictable. Forward and backward unpredictability means that given some value, you cannot predict the next value. Okay, you cannot predict forward. Or given uh, some values, you cannot predict previous values. So given subsequent values, you cannot predict what happened in the past. There are different tests. So we've just said, we said, this sequence looks random. Okay. There is a mathematical test to start to consider a sequence and give some measurements of how random it is. Okay, so there are different tests to, to be more scientific than just saying it looks random. Like looking at uh, the frequency of numbers, of bits that occur in there, how often they occur, the subsequences, things like compressing, if it compresses well, it's not random. If it doesn't compress well, then it generally exhibits randomness. So what we'd like is when we use random numbers for security purposes is a generator such that if the attacker doesn't know the seed, they cannot predict other values in the sequence. And for that to work, we normally need to keep the seed secret and often to choose a seed, we don't just choose x, 0 equals 1, we choose a seed which is random. And a common way is then to use a, pseudo, a true random number generator. Use a true random number generator to generate a seed, and then yet use that seed in a pseudo-random number generator to generate a larger sequence. It's more convenient because True random number generators generally just work or only produce a small sequence of values in a fixed period of time. So a common use of random numbers uh, for security purposes, you have, it says, an entropy source. But think of some physical source, some measurement of uh, the CPU operations, the, the disk operations, the... Uh, noise from circuits, you have different sources, you have some device that can measure those sources and generates some random number. We'll use that as a seed into our pseudo-random number generator which l generates a large sequence of random numbers. True random numbers 
uh, typically generated only a small sequence of values in some period of time. Pseudo-random number generators can generate many random numbers in the same period of time. So this is a common way to, to use it. Often your operating system may try and implement this in that your operating system provides a facility for generating random numbers in that your computer measures different characteristics and you can use a combination of physical sources CPU operations, hard disk operations, uh, keyboard input, mouse movements different physical operations on your computer are measured and used to generate a, a true random number generator which is then used as a seed in a some function, our pseudo-random number generator, which is then made available to applications by your operating system. What's another random number generator? There are many others. Okay, we've just gone through a simple one that we can de demonstrate. LCG. Turns out it's not very secure, LCG. So it's not commonly recommended for when you want strong security. There are other algorithms which are better. Blum Blum Shub, developed by three people. A different algorithm. Uh, it's considered secure when we use it for, for cryptographic or security applications. Uh, you can see the example on the next slide, but we take some large prime numbers um, and this may not make sense to you yet, but we will in the next few topics, such that they, those large numbers, when we mod by 4, give 3. Calculate some large n by multiplying those prime numbers and we take our initial value as uh, some random s squared mod n and then go through a loop and generate xi based upon the previous value squared mod n and extract the last bit in that number to get the the sequence of random numbers but not so important to go through that have a look if you want so an example of some initial parameters we go through and generate these values using the equation and we take the last bit from that and our random bit stream is 11001110001 and keep going. Okay, so that's the output in this case. Not these numbers, but those bits are the output. And we just keep running that loop. Okay. It's a for loop. It can run forever. Just keep running that and it keeps generating a stream of bits. This is our random bit stream. If we want to generate our 128-bit key, we run it 128 times, iterations. Uh, I think somewhere else, maybe I don't, but there are many other algorithms. And I think that will stop for us on random numbers. There are different algorithms. We can all use, so use block ciphers like DES and AES to generate random numbers. Because encryption, the idea of encryption, takes some structured plain text, produce some random looking ciphertext. So encrypting something produces a random number. So we can use encryption to generate random numbers. So it works quite well. The problem is often it's quite slow to encrypt something compared to using the algorithms we've seen. So we can use encryption if needed. Let's have a look at an example, or several examples. Uh, let me just check. Uh, say on a Unix operating system, the operating system has its own random number generator. So it measures, and there are different implementations, but 
it commonly measures different inputs from the hardware and think of that as the true random number generator and generates a sequence using some pseudo random number generator. In Unix or Linux operating systems it's called a special device called random or urandom and it just keeps generating random numbers uh, but it generates a sequence, a binary sequence, so if I look at the contents of u random, which is generated by my operating system, I will see random bits. But if I display it on the screen, it will come out as uh, garbage. So I will just display a selection of it using this program XXD. XXD takes the binary value and converts to hexadecimal. Okay, so this displays the output of the operating system random number generator, a sequence of bits. Head minus one just takes the first line of output, okay, because it keeps going. And XXD takes that first line of output, which is a sequence of bits, and converts it to hexadecimal. So I can show it on the screen. 7, 5, 8, B, da, da, da. this is the, the random hexadecimal digits. Okay, so uh, that's produced from the operating system. Just an example. And other operating systems would have their own implementations of random number generators. Some are more secure than others in terms of the ability to predict the next value in the sequence. If I want in binary, doesn't show as well, but we can convert instead of hexadecimal into binary and we get our binary sequence. Do it again. Uh, let's zoom out a bit. If I keep doing it, you should see, it's not easy to see, but if you compare all those values, you'll see that they're, they're different. There's no structure in there. But they, if you do tests on the randomness on those sequences of zeros and ones, you should see that uh, they exhibit those characteristics of uh, unpredictability and uh, distribution of zeros and ones. The next part is related is stream ciphers. But let's, let's finish with something else. Let's not cover stream ciphers today and go back and look at uh, in the last 10 minutes, something that we skipped is attacks on block ciphers. And the last slide, or one of the last slides, returning the block ciphers, DES, AES, triple DES, and others. How secure are they? Well, there are two types of attacks, brute force and cryptanalysis. Brute force, try all keys. So the security depends upon the length of the key. So with DES, the key space with a 56-bit key is 2 to the power of 56. So an attack on DES, the time it takes, if we measure in number of operations, we need 2 to the power of 56 operations to find the key. Brute force, try all keys in the worst case. So we talk about the time for a DES attack. The best known method is in fact brute force. Takes 2 to the power of 56 operations, which is feasible today. With the right hardware, that's possible. Triple DES if you use three different keys, three different desk keys of 56 bits, gives us a key length of 168 bits. So the key space is 2 to the power of 168. A brute force attack on triple desk would require 2 to the power of 168 operations. Okay. So if you do the calculations, that's going to take forever. But we can still use the man-in-the-middle attack on triple DES 
but we need to do it two times because we have two values in the middle. Triple DES, double DES had encrypt, you get an X value, encrypt again. With triple DES, encrypt, we get X1, encrypt, get X2, and get our ciphertext after the third encryption. We can do a man in the middle, but it, it takes much more effort because we need to do it two times effectively. Turns out the amount of effort required using a man in the middle attack on triple DES requires 2 to the power of 111 operations. Brute force, 2 to the power of 168, but with a man in the middle, we cut it down to just 2 to the power of 111. There are other known attacks. One of them by Lux, who wrote a paper about it, takes a little bit longer, 2 to the power of 113. So we measure attacks based upon how many operations they, they would take. We compare them to brute force. If it's slower than brute force, then it's not a good attack. If it's faster than brute force, then, then that's better. How much faster we care about. So brute force on triple DES, 2 to the 168, but there are better known attacks which bring it down to much uh, less. But still, 2 to the power of 111 still would take a long time. And we've got some slides earlier that I think we've seen how long that would take. But with these attacks, the other thing to measure how good they are, remember with double deaths, we assume the attacker knew some plain text ciphertext pairs in advance. To perform the attack, the attacker needed to know something in the advance. So we often measure how much data is known in advance. The more you need to know, the harder it is for the attacker. Okay? So with a man in the middle attack, you only need to know four different values. That's nothing. That's easy. But with this other attack, you need to know about four billion different values, which is much harder in practice to know those values. So we can compare them based upon how much data they need to know and how much memory they consume when we do the attack, how much data we need to store. So with a man in the middle attack, we require to use memory of up to 2 to the 56, which is a lot of memory. Okay? So if you do the calculation in bits or bytes or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, so in theory we can do these attacks, but in practice, uh, well, we can't because of the time, but if we could because of time, in practice, the memory becomes a limitation. We don't have enough memory to perform these attacks. AES is re recommended today, and there are three modes with AES. They have different key lengths. Two are listed here, 128-bit key, key space, 2 to the 128. The best-known attack at least in the last few years, was this one called by click attack. And the amount of time it takes is 2 to the 126.1. So brute force, 2 to the power of 128. This Krypton analysis, this other attack, about 2 to the power of 126. About four times faster than brute force. So not very effective. Because if brute force took a billion centuries, then this attack would just take uh, 250 million centuries. Still doesn't help us. It doesn't require much memory, but it requires a lot of known data. Uh, I can't remember, but billions of terabytes. Okay, so again, not practical from memory, uh, from data perspective, or from time. With a 256-bit key, the same attack brings it from 256 down to 254. So there are different attacks. This just lists some of the, the known attacks on the, the real ciphers. The attacks we measure compared to brute force, usually in terms of number of operations, amount of memory needed, amount of space to store the data, and the amount of data you need in advance to perform the attack and they differ in each of those. So today, 
AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, even with 128-bit key, is considered secure. Okay? There are no known attacks that we're aware of that uh, are practical. And even in the future, it's still considered secure with 128 bits. But if you want to be safe, use 192-bit keys or 256-bit keys. Okay, so uh, maybe in, a, in the future, come, someone will come up with better attacks, but it's unlikely that there'll be a significant advance that reduces this to be manageable. Maybe down to... 2 to the power of 100 or 2 to the power of 80 may be possible in some cases. The problem with longer keys is that it's slower to encrypt. And you're, we're going to introduce over the next few lectures some software to do the encryption called OpenSSL. And I'll just give a quick demo now. It does encryption using different ciphers and it actually, I will not do an encryption, I'll just show a speed test. It gives us some how fast my computer is to encrypt using different ciphers. Uh, if I use AES with a 256-bit key with a different mode of operation, it does a speed test of takes many random inputs and encrypts them using AES with a 256-bit key and at the end it will give me some, some performance benchmarks. It doesn't take long. It tries different input sizes. Don't worry about all of this. This is saying that it takes, just fo focus on this number, 60 million bytes per second it can encrypt. Okay, 60 megabytes per second is the speed, so if I have 60 megabytes of data and I encrypt with AES, in this configuration my computer can encrypt 60 megabytes per second about. Different computers will be at different speeds and different algorithms different speeds. Uh, I think we have triple S. Different name, DES ED3. So you can try different ciphers and see which ones are faster than others. I made a mistake in the previous case. DES EDE3 really means triple DES encrypt, decrypt, encrypt. 20 million bytes per second. AES was 60 million bytes per second, triple DES 20 million bytes per second. It's, triple DES is three times slower than AES. So there's the advantage of AES. It performs much, much better. One last one. By default, they use software to encrypt the CPU, just normal software. I've set an option to tell my tell the program to use my special instructions on the CPU that does AES encryption. Before AES was 60 million bytes per second, by using hardware encryption, so the CPU has special operations to encrypt AES, it's up to 176 million bytes per second. So hardware encryption can be much faster than software-based encryption. Okay. We'll see some more examples of OpenSSL uh, over the coming lectures. Let's stop there. So again, our symmetric block ciphers operate on a small block of bits at a time. 64 bits, 128 bits are common. The modes of, <coughs> the modes of operation are ways to use that same cipher on a larger input, larger than the block size. ECB is the, the basic approach and what you would expect in a very trivial approach. You take your plain text, say a megabyte, you break it into 
blocks that match your cipher. So my plain text P is broken into blocks of P1, P2, up to Pn. Then I use my cipher, AES, DES, whatever, I use my cipher to encrypt each block of plain text using my key, my chosen key, and get ciphertext C1 as output. Then I use the same cipher, the same key to encrypt, and I get C2 as output. And I do that for each of the input P's, P1 to Pn. I get C1 to Cn out. The output resulting ciphertext is just a concatenation of those C values. Okay, so that's the basic approach. Split your plain text into blocks, encrypt each block one at a time. Same key, same cipher. Ciphertext is a combination of the output ciphertext blocks. The problem with ECB is that you can get repetitions in the output ciphertext. And you may have seen that in some of your quiz questions. Actually, I don't think you'd used ECB. Uh, if uh, you, you may or may not have seen the repetition, but if you have two blocks which are the same on input, because we're using the same key and the same cipher, we'll get the exactly sa exact the same ciphertext blocks output. If two blocks are the same on input, then the two blocks in the ciphertext will be the same. So let's say you have a large file and you want to encrypt it, you break it into blocks. If it turns out that there's some repetition in the file, then there'll be repetition in potentially in some of the blocks and repetition in the output ciphertext, which is bad from a security perspective. Any repetition in the ciphertext is some structure in that ciphertext, and it, it makes a potential opportunity for an attacker to exploit that structure, to work out, okay, there's some structure in the ciphertext, work backwards to find out the corresponding plain text. So ECB, two blocks are the same on input, we'll get the same output ciphertext. So that's not good from that perspective. So other modes of operation are used. And these all work for different ciphers. Doesn't matter if it's AES, DES, or something else. And the two you saw in the quiz were CBC, cipher block chaining, and counter mode, CTR. Let's just have a quick look at them. Cipher block chaining, we chain the output of one step to become the input of the next step. So we take our long plain text, break into blocks, P1 through to Pn, and we start with another value, our initialization vector, IV. We choose some other value. So we have a key chosen plus an IV. We use that to start this encryption. And with CBC, the approach is take your plain text block, XOR with the IV value, then encrypt the answer of that. The output ciphertext is C1, but that C1 is fed into the next stage. So we don't use the IV again, that's used just once to initialize. The ciphertext is fed into the next phase. P2 is XORed with C1, then encrypt. So we're not encrypting directly upon the ciphertext, we're encrypting the ci sorry. We're not encrypting the plain text, we're encrypting the plain text XORed with the previous value. And then we keep going in a chain like that. So this is a way such that if we have two plain text values which are the same, P1 and P2 are identical, it's most likely that C1 and C2 will be different. Because P1 XORed with IV is going to be different from P2 XORed with C1 even though P1 and P2 are the, the same, that we XOR them with different values. Here we XOR with the initialization vector, here we XOR with C1, which uh, with high probability will be different from the initialization vector. So two input plain text blocks will produce different output ciphertext blocks, and that's our goal here, to, to mix things up on the output. That's a common mode of operation use. 
I think in many encryption algorithms or products, if you don't specify, usually they'll use CBC. So there are others, but this is a common one. What about XOR? Exclusive OR. We'll see it again when we look at stream ciphers in a moment. Take your plain text, XOR with a random value is a form of encryption. And it's equivalent, if you have a good random value, equivalent to a one-time pad. So XOR is a good operation. Note the ciphertext should be random, or random looking, random appearing, because the idea of encryption takes some structured plain text, encrypt, and get some random looking ciphertext. XORing this random looking ciphertext with our structured plain text P2 should produce some random looking output, which is good for dispersing the structure from the plain text. Encrypting that should give us more randomness in the output. So XOR is a common operation used in encryption. We'll see it in these modes of operation and in other, in the details of ciphers. Note for decryption, you need to go sort of in the reverse steps so that you get the original plain text back. And I think in the, the quiz you had to attempt some of these. With a, in your case, you use that small 5-bit block cipher. So the table that I gave you, the table I gave you, you use in this block here. So you took, actually I gave you decryption, I think. You took your cipher text, you took your key, if you're using CBC, and you look up in the table for that ciphertext using that key, what was the original plain text? And you got the output here, then you XOR that with your initialization vector, which was given in the question, and then you got P1. And then C1 was fed into the XOR in the next stage. There are other modes of operation. And the other one you saw in the quiz was the counter mode. Let's go back, sorry. CBC. Cipher block chaining. One stage depends upon the output of the previous stage. Okay, you look at the second stage here. To encrypt, let's say we know all the plain text values. To encrypt P2, we must have C1. In terms of an implementation, that means this must be done in serial. We cannot implement it in parallel because to encrypt P2 we need C1 and to encrypt and to get C1 we must first encrypt P1 so we cannot encrypt P1 and P2 at the same time with ECB we could with ECB if we have P1 and P2 let's say I have two cores on my computer I have a quad core processor I could send P1 to be encrypted on one core and P2 to be encrypted on a different core and they could happen in parallel at the same time. Because they, P2 encryption doesn't depend upon the output of the encryption of P1. So we can implement this in parallel depending upon how many processes we have. With CBC we cannot because to do the encryption here we need the result of the previous phase. So we cannot uh, put it in parallel. So that's a disadvantage in terms of performance. If we want to encrypt things quickly, we cannot implement CBC in a parallel mode. Counter mode's another approach. It's very simple, and it has the advantage that you can encrypt in parallel quite easily. You choose a counter, uh, an initial value, so another IV, let's say zero in binary. You encrypt that value with your key and then XOR with the plaintext. The plaintext block and you get your ciphertext. For the second plaintext block, the counter two is just counter one incremented by one. So if counter zero, uh, counter one was value zero, counter two would be value one. That's a counter, we just keep incrementing. 
where the initial value of counter 1 is your IV. Remember, even though the counter is predictable, encrypting the counter value with your key produces a random output, some ciphertext. We cannot predict the value. And XORing that random value with the plain text produces random looking output, our ciphertext block C1. So very simple in that we just encrypt the counter and XOR that output of the counter with our plain text. And an, ad an advantage compared to CBC is that we can implement this in parallel. There's no dependence upon the second block compared to the first block. So what I can do is I take my plain text blocks I generate my counter values because I know them in advance. Counter 1 is going to be 0, counter 2 is going to be 1 and so on. And all I do is on one core or one CPU encrypt the first block and at the same time on the other CPU encrypt the second block. So they can be encrypted at the same time in parallel and we'll get our, plain, our ciphertext out. And we can do that uh, for as many cores or as many CPUs as we have or as, as many uh, entities that we can uh, execute in parallel. So this has an advantage in terms of performance compared to CBC. CBC and counter mode are considered practically just as strong as each other. Okay? They're both considered secure. And CBC is more commonly used because it's been around longer but counter mode is starting to be used or is, is being uh, increasingly used. And there are other modes of operation. Some are generic for all ciphers. Some are specific to selected ciphers. Some are specific to AES, trying to take advantage of AES structure. Effectively with counter mode, what we do, take some fixed predictable input encrypt it and the process of encrypting produces a random output. That's the idea of encryption. Take some structured input, encrypt and get some random ciphertext as output. Random looking or pseudo-random. And then we do that for each phase. To encrypt our plain text we take that random output here and XOR with P1 take this random value, XOR with P2, and so on. So really all we're doing is taking our plain text block and XORing with a random value. And it turns out that's what stream ciphers do. So this is a block cipher, but stream ciphers use the same concept. Last week we spoke about random numbers, and that random numbers are important to computer security. Uh, generating them is not easy, we need some algorithm to generate random numbers and a block cipher is an algorithm to generate random numbers. Our encrypt block here takes some counter as input and a key and the output is a random sequence of bits or a pseudo random sequence of bits and same here. So XORing that pseudo random sequence of bits with a plain text is a form of encryption and it can be implemented very fast. We'll show some examples of different block ciphers in use uh, later. Uh, just notes, counter mode encryption, decryption. What's the difference? Almost nothing. So the same algorithm, it's just encryption, P1 here, you get C1 out. To decrypt, C1 here, P1 out. You can use the same code, the same software, the same hardware to in implement encryption and decryption with counter mode. It's just the reordering of those that input. Then let's look at stream ciphers quite briefly. Uh, so we, st well, actually, we're skipping this one. We can use block ciphers like AES, DES, and so on to as pseudo-random number generators. If I need a random number for security, 
I can encrypt some value with a, a block cipher. And there are different ways to do it. One is using counter mode. We take some counter, uh, and here we're using it in the opposite approach. We have some, some value, we XOR and encrypt to give us our bits here, so we have a key. So we can do it in other ways. Output feedback mode is one that we skipped over in the slides, but another mode of operation. And there are other ways to use, and this was an example of using triple desks for generating a random sequence of bits. Stream ciphers effectively do what we just saw with counter mode. We take our plain text, think of it as a stream, a continuous sequence of bits. Okay, so imagine you uh, using Skype or a voice over IP application on your computer. You're talking. And the microphone takes your voice and converts, the software converts it to bits, bits that represent your voice. And as you send them across the network, you want them to be encrypted. So you want an encrypted voice call. So think of the bits coming in here as the bits representing your voice, the stream of input bits, continuously coming in. You have a key. You have some pseudo-random number generator. It's called a byte generator here because it's generating a byte at a time, but it generates random numbers. This is the seed to the pseudo-random number generator. It produces a random number as output, represented in binary. We XOR that random number with the first, in this case, byte of your plain text. The re result of the XOR is your ciphertext. So if this is your voice coming in, that is, you're talking on the computer, the microphone sends it to a codec which generates some bits representing your voice. Then the encryption software XORs those first eight bits of your voice with some pseudo-random number. The output eight bits are the ciphertext which are sent across the network. And that continues to happen as you keep generating input bits, you just keep XORing with this, the next random number in the sequence and keep going. Keep sending a stream of ciphertext. And decryption is easy. Note XOR. If you XOR the plain text with this value K and get C, to decrypt, we use XOR again. Take C, XOR with the same K, gives us the original plain text back. So at the decryptor, we have the same input key, uppercase K here, generate the same sequence of pseudo-random numbers, and XOR the first eight bits of ciphertext with the same lowercase k as was used for encryption here. This lowercase k, k is called a key stream. It's, a, it's the key streams used to XOR with the input plaintext stream. That's the common structure of stream ciphers. And the difference between different stream ciphers is how they generate random bytes. There are different ways to do it. Uh, so algorithms have effectively different pseudo-random number generators. One of them, uh, we'll come back to that, RC4 is a common, commonly used example of a stream cipher. It has an algorithm shown on the following slides, but we will not go through it to this, in this lecture. There's an algorithm that effectively implements this pseudo-random byte generator. And it's relatively simple. And a key advantage of stream ciphers compared to block ciphers is that usually they're faster to implement. So it doesn't take long to generate this random value, and it doesn't take long to do an XOR. In hardware or in software, XOR is very easy, very fast. Whereas if you want to encrypt something with DES or AES, it can be quite slow. So stream ciphers are generally much faster to encrypt than 
block ciphers. Therefore, they're mainly or commonly used when we're, we need small delay. We can't wait a long time to encrypt our data, like real-time voice communications or real-time communications of some media. So some common applications of stream ciphers is encrypting real-time media. For the stream cipher to be secure, the pseudo-random number generator must be good. It must produce a good sequence of pseudo-random numbers. A long period. We spoke about our random number generators. The sequence of numbers we generate, there must be a large variety there. We shouldn't repeat those numbers. So a large period is required there. So as random as possible the output should be. The less random the output is, uh, the, or it should approximate a true random number generator. So some algorithms don't generate uh, uh, as good random numbers as others. That is, it's easier to determine what the next value will be or what the previous value came from. And as with any cipher that we have a secret key, there's a secret key in this case, this key K must be kept secret, uh, it must be long enough to withstand brute force attacks. Often simpler to implement and faster than block ciphers. The problem with stream ciphers is that you cannot reuse the keys. You need to use a different key when you have a, a next set of plain text. With block ciphers you can reuse keys. With a stream cipher, if you, let's say you encrypt some voice call using one key, and then you reuse that key the next day, and the next day, and the next day, you keep reusing the same key with this stream cipher, it becomes very easy for the, the attacker to get the ciphertext, and from multiple ciphertexts work back and get the key. Okay, so. With stream ciphers, it's important to change the key on a regular basis. So often those keys would be generated and updated automatically. And that's about all we want to say about stream ciphers. There's an example of RC4 here. I'm not going to go through it this semester. Uh, note, it's developed by Ron Revest. Remember the name because he comes up later. Uh, it has different key sizes, it's very simple to implement, so simple that you could implement it yourself in a, in a couple of hours. It's a for loop, another for loop, and a loop with a few basic operations. So it's very simple to implement. Uh, it has a few weaknesses that people are starting to identify, but for the purposes it was used for, it was uh, quite good as a stream cipher. It was used, for example, in wireless LANs. Uh, there's only a few, few known attacks which are, are practical. But there are other stream ciphers which are now considered stronger than RC4. We're going to move on, give some other examples, and move on to a new topic. But we've, we're starting to finish this topic about our traditional ciphers. Up until now, after going through things like Caesar and Visionaire and the classical ciphers, those and then DES, AES, are block ciphers. And they're symmetric block ciphers, in that both sides must have the same key. And the stream ciphers are also symmetric. Both sides must have the same key. So all of the ciphers we've considered so far have that same characteristic, the symmetric, symmetric key ciphers. There's symmetry between the keys on both sides, the encryptor and decryptor. The next topic is going to lead us into an alternative approach where we have two different keys at the encryptor and decryptor. And that requires some new, new concepts to talk about. 
before I, I close this and move on, any questions? Block ciphers, modes of operation, stream ciphers, random numbers. Any questions for the upcoming quiz? So the slides that I skip over, we will not cover in the exam or the quiz, so RC4, for example. Uh, and because we missed a lecture, I, I need to move on a little bit. Uh, as, or alternatively, we, we, have, we can have a make-up lecture. Do you want a make-up lecture? Hands up if you don't want a make-up lecture. Okay, I need more than half. So I, you can't put two hands up. That doesn't count as two. Okay, well, at this stage we don't need a make-up lecture because we missed just one. Uh, but we'll see how we go with progress. Let's encrypt. So far we've just looked at algorithms. Of course, if I give you a one megabyte file and you want to encrypt it with DES, you cannot do it by hand. We need some software implementation to do so. And implementing the ciphers and making sure they're implemented correctly is important for security because if you implement the cipher and you make a mistake in the implementation, some bug, then it opens up an, an avenue for an attack. So when you write your software and you develop a website that needs encryption, you probably won't implement your own cipher. You, you will not design your own cipher, nor will you implement an existing cipher. You'll probably take a library that someone else has developed that implements the cipher. So many people don't implement their ciphers themselves. They use something that others have used and tested a lot. And one library that's common and open is called OpenSSL. I'll show you a few examples and I'll point to some on the website that you can see more details of those examples, but we'll ask you in some homework to use this software to do some encryption and to solve some problems. The software is called OpenSSL. Open SSL. It, it's a standalone application that we can run on the command line. It's also a library in that you can write your own code and link to the operations provided by OpenSSL. We'll use it in command line mode. There are many different things that we can do with OpenSSL. We can encrypt with different ciphers, we can generate keys, random numbers, uh, and some key management that we'll see in later topics. There are some different versions, that's just to show the version. I'm just going to show a few quick examples of encrypting with uh, symmetric key ciphers. Let's start with some message. And so I want to encrypt some plain text, so let's create some plain text. Uh, let's Don't look. And I'm just creating it long enough so we can use it in the example here. So that's just my, my plain text, and I'm going to write that to a file. Let's call it plain text. So there's our message, our plain text for our example. Uh, how long is it? Um, the size of this file is 72 bytes. Okay, so that's the size of the file, 72 bytes. There are 72 characters there, one character, one byte in the storage. When we use our ciphers, we're encrypting on the binary input. So not like Caesar where we're going to change H to another letter, we just treat 
this text as a set of zeros and ones. So it's 72 bytes in this case. Let's look at those bytes just so we know what we're dealing with. And to look at the binary view of a file, I can see the ASCII contents. To look at the binary contents, we need some special program. I have one called XXD. It will show me the, the contents of the file in binary. Minus V for binary. Show me across eight columns the plain text. And I'm going to have to zoom out a bit. All it does, this program XXD, and I'll zoom back in in a moment, is shows this file in its binary form. Okay, just to the sequence of bits. So the first eight bits and the last eight bits here. Let's encrypt. And we'll encrypt using a symmetric block cipher. Uh, we'll start with DES, okay, just normal DES, and we'll use ECB mode of operation. And to encrypt with DES, we need a key. How do we choose a key? I'll need a key for DES. How do I choose a key? Someone choose a key for me? How long should the key be for DES? 64 bits. DES actually has a 64-bit key, although only 56 bits are used. DES takes a 64-bit key. Someone choose a 64-bit key. Well, we want a random key, preferably. I don't want to choose a key that someone can guess. So we actually, to generate the key, we'll create, generate a random number. So let's generate a random number first. And then we'll use that as the key. And luckily, OpenSSL has a way to generate random numbers. It has a RAND operation. R generate a random number, eight bytes long. Eight bytes is 64 bits. And instead of outputting binary, we'll make it a little bit easier and output in hexadecimal. No need to remember these operations. Uh, there's links to a detailed description of them in, a we in the website. I'll show you later. Uh, just demonstrating what you can do. Generate a random 64-bit or 8-byte value output in hexadecimal. There it is. 16 hexadecimal digits. Now let's encrypt using that as the key. Open SSL, ENC to encrypt. And we need to choose our cipher. And the cipher we're going to use is E is DES. And we should choose the mode of operation as well. So ECB, CBC, counter, and others we can choose from. To start, I'll just choose ECB, the very basic mode. And to encrypt, we'll specify minus E tell it to encrypt. The input we want to encrypt, the plain text file. I want to produce an output, let's call it ciphertext.bin. Sorry, it's wrapping around, but encrypt using DES and ECB mode of operation. The plain text file, output into a file called ciphertext.bin. Doesn't matter about the extensions. And now let's specify our key. And I'll copy the key from the random number and use that. So OpenSSL will allow us to give a key in hexadecimal instead of just binary. Encrypt using DES and ECB, this plain text using this key producing this ciphertext. Normally with modes of operation we'll also include an initialization vector. It's not needed for ECB but I'll just so we can repeat this later I'll include it here. 
and it needs to be 64 bits or 16 hexadecimal digits. That's in hexadecimal. That's a bad initialization vector. All zeros, you shouldn't choose that. You should choose another random value. So it should choose a random value here for my initialization vector. But just for this example. Done. Encrypted. The output ciphertext. Eighty bytes. Input plain text, seventy two bytes. Output ciphertext, eighty bytes. What happened? Is that correct? What went wrong? What we'd expect is that if I have an input of 72 bytes, plain text, I get 72 bytes output ciphertext. All of our ciphers take the same length input, same length output. Okay. 64 bits in for one block, 64 bits out. Combine the blocks, same length in, same length out. Here it's different. 72 bytes in, 80 bytes out. It turns out that with many ciphers, they add some padding in there and even some error detection to be able to detect if something goes wrong. And that's what these extra eight bytes have been added in this case. OpenSSL has, has added some padding in there. It wasn't really needed. So let's add an option, encrypt again, but say no pad. Let's not pad, just to make things a little bit simpler in the output. And now our output is 72 bytes. Okay, that's what we should have or we expected at the start. 72 bytes in, 72 bytes out. But in practice, we'll often allow padding uh, in case the input is not uh, integer multiple of the number of bits of our block. We need to do some padding. Now, let's look at our ciphertext. And it's binary. If you take those ASCII characters and try and view them, they'll produce some strange characters. Let's look at them with XXD. And I'll look at them in binary. So I'll zoom out a little bit. Let's look at the ciphertext. There it is. Okay. So the binary ciphertext and it's hard to see, of course, but if you look closely, you should, shouldn't see any structure in here. Or should you? And this is the corresponding ASCII representation of this. Where you see a dot, it means it's a non-printable character. Okay, so this is the actual binary after encrypting. Anyone see any structure in the ciphertext? What I'd like is my structured input plain text, this message, when I encrypt it, I get some random looking output. If you can see structure in the ciphertext, then that's bad for security. Anyone see any structure? Anyone? All right, here's a hint. There is some structure. There's a problem. Can anyone notice it? Maybe look at the ASCII representation of the ciphertext. I'll zoom in a little bit more, sorry. Uh, sorry, I can't zoom in very easily uh, without getting the right-hand side. I'll point it to you because it's hard to see. I've seen it before and it's not obvious. If you look at these two lines of binary and this line of binary values in the ciphertext, you see the ASCII is the same. In fact, if you look closely, the binary values are the same. This line, this 64 bits, and this 64 bits are identical. 
So we have some structure in the plain text. That's not good. That is bad for security. What's the problem? So, was it the fourth line and the seventh line? All right, you can see some of the bits here. Identical here. Same eight bits, same eight bits, same eight bits, and so on. Why? Bonus one mark for the next quiz for a quick answer. Quick, correct answer. Why in the ciphertext do we get some structure? In this case, the structure is a sequence of 64 bits which are identical. Translate, no. Uses the same process. Uh, be more specific. Yep. Both plain texts are the same. Be more specific. The both blocks of plain text are the same. Therefore, the output cipher text is the same because of in same key. But then one more step. Yeah. ECB, I think half a mark each bonus. Yeah, ECB mode of operation, the same. That's the, the, the problem in this case. Let's go back and zoom out. Uh, look at the input plain text. And Remember, our blocks are 64 bits, so effectively each line is one block input. So with our mode of operation, P1 is hello dot space T. P2 is his space is space O, and so on. Look at the fourth block, space secret space, and the seventh block, space secret space. The same two blocks, so P4 and P7 in the mode of operation are the same. Let's go back and just make that clear. We're using ECB as the mode of operation, although we don't list them here, but P4 and P7 are the same. We encrypt with the same key using guess, therefore we'll get the same ciphertext as output. And indeed we do. These two blocks of ciphertext are the same. And that's bad. And that's the problem with ECB. When you have same input blocks, you'll get the same output ciphertext blocks. And the attacker can try and take advantage of that. So ECB usually should not be used, especially when we have large plain text input. I will leave it for you as your homework, and I'll set a homework uh, soon that it requires you to use OpenSSL and encrypt some plain text, decrypt some cipher text, just to get some feel with the software and to see what it can do, and maybe do a little bit of analysis of the outputs in some cases. You can do many more ciphers. We can change to AES, different modes of operation, and in fact, uh, even symmetric uh, public keys cryptography. Since everyone's so excited about OpenSSL, we'll stop there and try a new topic. Any questions before we move on about that concept of the, the poor security of ECB? Then if you're happy with 
block ciphers and symmetric key encryption, let's try an alternative approach. I can close this. Wrong one. This is from one of our earliest uh, lectures. We've seen this before. This is the, the general model for encrypting for confidentiality, where what we do is we take our plain text input and in a cipher, take a key, the output is a ciphertext, we send the ciphertext, the decryptor, the receiver, applies the decryption algorithm, a key, and gets the plain text. Up until now, key 1 and key 2 have been the same with symmetric key encryption. Uh, shared secret key. K, key 1 and key 2 are the same. There's some problems with that. It can be very inconvenient for some purposes. So people have developed an alternative where there's two different keys. And that's the, what the next form of cryptography we're going to cover. But to understand some of that, we need some refresher, in some cases some new material on some of the mathematics that supports the new form. So that's the next topic that we'll start on today. And it's some very simple mathematics that we'll just uh, cover with a few examples that will set us up for the next form of cryptography. So I call it number theory, it covers a, a few different things. Some of it should be easy, that is it's just refreshing your memory, some of it may be new but still easy. just remind you something about prime numbers and division. So this you should follow and if you don't understand then, then have a read, ask me a question, otherwise we'll go through quite quickly. Uh, just some re remind you of some terms. Okay, division, we all know about how division works, uh, but we can talk about some a divisor and B divides A. We can say B divides A if a equals some integer times b. And sometimes we write this, so just the terminology, we sometimes we write this as b and a vertical bar a. So this is the topic on number theory. b is a divisor of a, we could say. And we know about greatest common divisors of two numbers. The greatest common divisor of those two numbers can be found. Anyone unclear so far? GCD, greatest common divisor. So the greatest common divisor of 7 and 15 is 7 and 15 is 1. Okay. The greatest common divisor of 8 and uh, 20 4. Okay. All right. So look at the divisors of 8. 1, 2, 4, 8. Look at the divisors of 20. 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, 20. And look at the, the greatest common values. Simple. There's, there are efficient algorithms for finding greatest common divisors, especially large numbers. For small numbers in example, it's easy. We can do it in our head. But if you have very large numbers, there are some algorithms uh, for finding the greatest common divisor. We say two integers are relatively prime if the greatest common divisor of those two integers is 1. So our example 7 and 15, the greatest common divisor of 7 and 15 is 1. So we say those two integers are relatively prime. Not prime, relatively prime. So that may be new to some of you. Is 8 and are 8 and 20 relatively prime? 
8 and 20 are not relatively prime. So if they have a greatest common divisor which is greater than 1, then we say they are not relatively prime. That will come important later. And we'll see it in use a little bit later. Prime numbers. Everyone remember prime numbers? What are the first 10 prime numbers? Give me a prime number. 7. Okay, give me a smaller prime number. 3. Another one. 1's confusing. Let's not cover 1. One's not really considered a prime number. Two is. Two is a prime number. Uh, two, three, five, seven. No more even numbers, of course, are prime. And then the numbers. How do you define the prime number? Their divisors are one in itself. Okay, the divisors of that number are one in itself. So prime numbers, I think you're aware of, fine. Uh, some integer p larger than 1, we define prime numbers larger than 1, if and only if its divisors are plus or minus, or really 1 and p, 1 in itself. And uh, any integer, any integer, not necessarily a prime, can be factored in it, into its primes where some integer a can be written as some the second pri or prime 2 powered to some exponent and multiplied by different primes. So any integer can be written as multiplying a set of primes out. And that will become important later. Uh, very simple examples, just to Keep going. What is 15 written as multiplication of primes? Or let's start easier. What are, what are the divisors or factors of 15? The divisors of 15 are 1, 3, 5, and if we count 15 is, is a divisor. Therefore, the prime divisors are 3 and, fifth, 3 and 5, less than 15, so 3 times 15. All right, what are the divisors of 24? One, oh, we're not, all right, one, two. Six, eight, twelve, twenty-four. Twenty-four is written as primes, prime factors. How do we write twenty-four as in, as a multiplication of primes? which means take the prime numbers and multiply them t together to get 24. Well, two is a prime. 24 divided by two is 12. Divides by two gives us six divided by two or Two to the power of three times by three to the power of one. So we can write any integer as if we multiply the prime numbers and select an exponent here, an integer exponent. So in this case it's two to the power of three times three to the power of one times five to the power of zero. We don't write that because five to the power of zero is one times all the other primes to the power of zero. That is sometimes useful. Or simply the prime factors of 24 are 2 and 3. So we'll see, we'll be interested later in finding the prime factors. 
In this case, we found them as two and three. Okay, and that's what this equation states. In general, we can write any integer as multiplying the primes together where those exponents are integers, zero or higher. And a list of some prime numbers, the first, or the under 2,000. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Modular arithmetic. We, in some of the algorithms we'll use for public key cryptography, the next uh, form of encryption, we'll use modular arithmetic. And normal arithmetic, it's normal arithmetic, uh, but we mod the answer effectively. And it has some useful properties uh, when we use it in encryption. So very basics, you know about mod. Uh, a mod n is the remainder when a is divided by n. Okay, we write a mod n. n is called the modulus. So n is the modulus in this case. We can say two numbers that are equivalent or congruent modulo n, equivalent in mod n. If when we take those two numbers and mod by n, we get the same answer. So we often write that as a is equivalent to b in mod n. Uh, Easy one. What's the answer? Three. In mod 10, 13 and 3 are the equivalent of congruent modulo, modulo 10. Because 13 mod 10 is 3, 3 mod 10 is 3. That's all. When we mod by the same number and get the same answer, we say they're equivalent in that modulus. Uh, do we need more examples? Not really. Negative numbers we'll uh, ignore for the moment. What's next? So the mod n operator maps all of our integers, so the infinite set of integers, into some finite set of 0 to n minus 1. Okay, so when we mod by n, the answer is always between 0 and n minus 1. That's all we're saying. So it maps it to a particular set denoted as Zn. So Z8 is 0 up to 7. Take any integer, mod by 8, and the answer will always be in that set of 0 to 7. Modular arithmetic performs arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division within the confines of some set Zn. So we talk about uh, a set Z8 means the answers of our arithmetic will always be between, be between 0 and 7. So when we do 10 plus 15 in mod 8, then the answer is always going to be between 0 and 7. So always, the answers of the arithmetic operations are always in this set. Uh, let's go through some simple examples. Uh, make sure we don't get some useful ones. Alright, let's start, keep it simple and operate in 10. Yell out the answers. Anyone? Answer? 4 plus 3. Don't all yell at the same time, okay? This is a hard one. 4 plus 3, again? Seven, okay, not bad. 
four, pa four plus seven. Louder. One. No, we're using Z10 here. In other words, to be precise, everything is mod 10. So, what? our modulus is always 10, so I'm not writing the mod operator here. We're using modular arithmetic. In this specific example, uh, the mod So this is our operation for packing. We just want to add in the two first the plus two and then the two. So if we want to swap the sum to the second line of reading, we just want to set the sum to the inverse of the second line of reading. So this is the reading of the second line of reading. So we start with adding the two to the reading of the line of reading. So that's a normal process. plus b is equal to zero by then. So we're saying it's our normal reading. The additive inverse of three is the number such that the additive three is equal to three. Three plus minus three is equal to three. So we say the additive inverse of three is minus three. The modulo arithmetic we don't want any of that. Sorry.
So we're at the stage of just doing the last operation for our modular arithmetic logarithms. Exponentiation is easy, well, easy in terms of concept. That is, it's repeated multiplication and in terms of how we think about exponentiation, you take uh, your number, raise it to the power, mod by n, you get your answer. So conceptually easy. In practice, time consuming sometimes to calculate. We'll see some examples when we have big numbers. Last one, logarithms. And the concept we have is a discrete logarithm. In normal arithmetic, if we have b equals a to the power of i, i is the index or the exponent, then the log in base a of b is i, that index or exponent. But now we have everything mod n, or in this, this uh, equation mod p. So if we have b equivalent to a raised to the power of i, all in mod p, then we say, in the same concept, the logarithm in base a with mod p of b equals i, the index. So we're trying to find the index of this ex exponentiation, the opposite of the exponentiation operation. And we call it, for modular arithmetic, a discrete logarithm. If we go back to multiplication, in modular arithmetic we can do multiplication for all numbers, but we cannot do division for all numbers. And similar follows, we cannot do logarithms for all numbers. There's only special cases where we can determine the unique exponent. So we need to introduce a primitive root to explain that. So a primitive root is of some so we define a primitive root of some prime p, a prime number p, if a number is a primitive root of that prime p, then a raised to the power of 1, 2, 3, up until p minus 1 gives us distinct values. And that's best shown with some examples. So we'll go to, straight to some examples to introduce the concept of a, tr a primitive root. and then see the discrete logarithm relies on uh, a primitive root being found. I have some better examples, I hope. Let's say our modulus is... Everything is mod 7 for this set of examples, mod 7. So in our equation, mod p, well, p is 7. Let's look at the numbers when we take some number a and we raise it to some power i. where i ranges from, for mod 7, 1 up until 6. Let's start simple, a equal to 1. So, we're trying to give an example of a primitive root. A primitive root of some prime or some number p is that if we can take that primitive root, raise it to the powers of 1, 2, 3, up until p minus 1, if the answers are distinct, different values. Let's try some values. So, what we're going to do is take our value a, raise it to the power of i, and then mod by our modulus p, which in this case is 7 for this example. So, a to the power of i mod 7. So 1 to the power of 1 mod 7, we get what? 1. 1 to the power of anything, we're going to get 1. So this is going to be a simple case. We'll write the answers here, just to demonstrate. a equals to 1 i equal to 1, 1 to the 1, mod 7, answer is 1. 1 to the power of 2, mod 7, also 1. 1 to the power of 3, mod 7, 
You can see what we're going to get as answers. We'll come back to that one and let's try for a different value of a and then explain what they mean. What if a equals 2? So what we do, when we're mod 7, consider 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3, and so on, mod 7. What are the answers? 2 to the power of 1, mod 7, is 2. 2 to the power of 1 is 2, mod 7, we get 2 as the answer. 2 to the power of 2, mod 7, How about we, uh, I'm very lonely up the front. Come down closer, everyone. Small, small group of students, large room. Move down the front. It's okay to eat. Everyone move down the front. Front two rows. It's okay. We've got time. Off you go. Yeah, everyone move. I can't move the screen closer to you. Come on. The front three rows. It's okay. It's all right. Just for today, front three rows. Yes, everyone, not not just uh, two or three people. Just try something different. It's okay. Bring your laptop. It's not too hard. Just just move down the front. The front a little bit closer. There's so many seats to choose from. Okay. Now I can ask a question and hear your answers. 2 to the power of 2 mod 7. What's the answer? 4. 2 to the power of 3 mod 7. 2 to the power of 3 is 8, mod 7, we get 1. 2 to the power of 4, mod 7. Try it. 2 to the power of 2, mod 7, we get 4. 2 to the power of 3, mod 7, we get 1. 2 to the power of 4, mod 7. 2 to the power of 4 is 16, mod 7, the answer is 2. 2 to the power of 5, mod 7. 2 to the power of 5 is 32, mod 7, 4. 2 to the power of 5 is 32, 4 times 7 is 28, remainder is 4. 2 to the power of 6, mod 7. 1. Check. 2 to the power of 6 is 64. 9 times 7 is 63, so the remainder is 1. Okay, easy. Maybe it's so easy when you're sitting down the front too, so let's do this one. What if a is 3? 3 to the power of 1, mod 7. Easy, 3. 3 to the power of 2 is 9, mod 7. 3 to the power of 3. Mod 7, 3 to the power of 3 is 27, mod 7, 6, 3 to the power of 4, I will give you a calculator. You can use your head, fine. What do we have? 3 to the power of 4, mod 7. Sorry, that's four. What's the next one? Three to the power of five, mod seven. Five, 
Okay, so this is doing it for us. So the, this one was 3 to the power of 4 mod 7, we got 4. 3 to the power of 5 mod 7, 5. 3 to the power of 6 mod 7, let's use our calculator. 1. Okay? Nothing hard there. Now, why do we do that? Our modulus is prime 7, p is 7. A primitive root of 7 is a number when we raise it to a power of all the integers up until that number 7, but less than, we get distinct answers. So we say 3 is a primitive root of mod 7. With 2, we get non-unique values in this set of answers. 2 occurs twice, 4 and 1 occurs twice. With a equal to 3, when we mod raise to the power of i and mod by 7, we get this distinct set of 6 values. So we say a is a primitive root. Two and one are not in this case. And then we can try for other numbers. So that's the definition of primitive root. We use it to do to work out when a discrete logarithm is possible. The idea is that a discrete logarithm, coming back, remember logarithm. Find the find the exponent or index. That's a logarithm. Given the base. And the answer, find the index that when we raise the base to that index, we get the answer b. Same with discrete logarithm, but everything is mod p. With some base i, if we mod p and get the answer b, what is the index i? Sorry, some base a. Base is a, mod is p, the answer is b, then the index is i. Well, we can only solve such value and get a unique exponent i, that is, get an answer that's unique, if a, the base, is a primitive root of prime p. So that's the conditions when our discrete logarithm will work. Let's give an example. we got what is this discrete log in base 3 mod 7 of 6 the way we read that is that 3 raised to some power, to some index, mod by 7 give us an answer, gives us an answer 6. So what is that index? 3 raised to some number, then we mod by 7 gives us 6. What is that number? Where do you get the number from? We just calculated it, didn't we? Three raised to the power of some number mod seven. This table we calculated, or these values calculated with mod seven, gives us an answer six. So what's the index that gives us an answer six? Three. So the answer of this is three. And we can check, you can check that, that is 3, the base, to the power of the answer, 3, mod 7, 3 to the power of 3 is 27, mod 7 gives us 6. Okay, that one's fine. Discrete log of base 
2, mod 7 still, of 4. The discrete logarithm of 4 in base 2 mod 7 means 2 to the power of some number, 2 to the power of some number mod 7 gives us the answer of 4. What is that number? What is the index? What, what do we have as possible answers? Yeah, we just calculate it again. We just calculated it for the values when we mod by 7, we calculated it. The base is 2, raised to the indexes of 1 through to 6, mod by 7, we get the answers 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 1. In this question, we have, what do we have? 2 to the power of discrete log of 4. So what index gives us an answer of 4? There are two possible values. 2 to the power of 2 mod 7 gives us 4. 2 to the power of 5 mod 7 also gives us 4. We don't have a unique value and therefore we cannot determine what the index was originally. There's no way to know which index was it if we want to do uh, a discrete logarithm. There's no unique answer here. Why? Because the base is not a prim primitive root of 7. So when the base, this value, is a primitive root of the modulus, then we can get a unique answer because we have a distinct set of values here. But when the base, like 2, is not a primitive root of 7, then we will not get a unique exponent because we have multiple instances of the answer. So what's the answer? Well, we say there is no answer, or no unique answer. Not of interest to us. Well, there are two possible answers, but generally we'd like to get a unique value, especially when we apply to encryption. So when we want to use the discrete logarithm, we normally need to have the base to be a primitive root of the modulus. In this case, it's not. And we'll see algorithms, cryptographic algorithms, that use this concept. So again, all we did was, for our example, when we're using mod 7, we said, well, given the values 1 up until 6, the set of exponents, if a to the power of i, these are the possible values of i, when we mod by 7, if we take all values of a, which values, when we raise to the power of i, give us a unique set here? 3 does, 2 doesn't, 1 doesn't, and you can check the others whether they do or not. If they do, it's called a primitive root. And if we have a primitive root in this case, we can solve the discrete logarithm with a unique answer. Not all. Okay, and some useful values. The only integers with primitive roots are listed here. 2, 4, and some prime raised to some integer. Any prime raised to the integer. p to the power of 1, p to the power of 2, and 2 times that value. So there's only some numbers have primitive roots and that restricts us when we want to find a discrete logarithm. So when we want to use the discrete logarithm in a cryptographic algorithm, we must choose our numbers carefully. So for now, just be aware what is a primitive root. A primitive root of some prime p is a number such that when we raise it to the powers up until p minus 1, we get distinct answers when we mod by p, what is a primitive root? And that for a discrete logarithm, we can only find a unique exponent if the base, a, 
is a primitive root of the prime P. So that's what we need to know for now. Now, we say we can find the answer. Another thing we'll see later, maybe not today, solving the discrete logarithm can be complex. Complex enough if you use large enough numbers, practically impossible. That is, if you spend your uh, 10 million years trying to solve it, you will not get an answer. It will take too long. So that will be a property that we take advantage of later. But we'll return to that when we use it. This is using mod 19 as a different example. We had an example of mod 7. If we have mod 19, what are the primitive roots of 19? And this is a table similar to what we calculated. This is the values of a, and then a to the squared, cubed, up to a to the power of 18, up to p minus 1. How many primitive roots of 19 are there? There are six. And this, these grey boxes highlight. Look at the, the answers. When we raise the power in mod 19, the grey boxes highlight the unique set of values. A primitive root is one that gives us a unique set of values which is distinct amongst all 18 in this case. One, two, three, four, five, six possible primitive roots. They are 2, 3, 10, 13, 14 and 15. And in mod 19, some discrete logarithms. So the answers have been calculated for us. So in base 2, base 3, 10, 13, 14, 15, base of the primitive root, mod 19. So for example, <coughs> log in base 13, mod 19 of 8 is 15. That's how we read this table. The log, or the discrete log of the top row, the answer is the, the second row. And the base is 13 here, mod 19. The base here, 14, mod 19. So the base are the six different primitive roots. Generally, I do not ask you to solve a discrete logarithm in a quiz or an exam unless I give you some extra supporting information. So, especially with large numbers, they're not solvable with large enough numbers, there are no known algorithms that can solve the discrete logarithm in reasonable time. With small numbers you can do it with trial and error. Okay, you can find a way to do it, but if it's large enough it will take too long. And this, actually this is the last point on this slide. With certain problems when the numbers are large enough, it takes too long to be able to solve those problems. And we'll take advantage of that fact when we use some of this mathematics in, in public key cryptography. Three problems that we will see that arise, which are what we see computationally hard, meaning if the numbers are large enough, it'll take forever to get the answer. Interfactorization. That is, given some integer n which was calculated by multiplying two primes together if n equals p times q p and q are prime numbers large prime numbers if I give you n it'll take you forever to find p and q if you don't know them that's the problem there there's no known algorithm that will take n and factor it into its two primes in reasonable time. Uh, one example of a large number, uh, one maybe five or so years ago now, a number n which was, the number n was 768 bits long, or 232 decimal digits. So write a number 232 digits, given that number, <coughs> factor it into its two primes p and q, Several years ago, it took someone uh, something like 2,000 uh, computer or man years to, to do that factorization. 
So if you make it longer, it will effectively take forever. Sorry? Yes, yes. Uh, NP, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know for all of them. I think interfactorization. Uh, Euler's totient, I'm not sure. Uh, in practice, um, too large. Whether it's NP, uh, what's the difference? NP complete, NP hard. Uh, I don't remember for all of those algorithms. So there's some slight subtle differences in the, the non-polynomial algorithms. Uh, and effectively they are. But there's some variations. So some are easier than others. Okay. But yes, effectively, all of these algorithms, we cannot solve them in reasonable time if we have a large enough input. The input for Euler's Totion is, or the problem is, given n, just n, a non-prime n, a composite n, find the totient. Remember the totient was the, the count of numbers less than n which are relatively prime with n. We could do it, we could, okay, if n was 20, the 1, 2, 3, up to 19, check which numbers are relatively prime with n. But now make n a thousand bits long, like hundreds of digits, and then find the answer. It's considered harder than inter integer factorization. With the same size n, it will take you longer to do this and this. So this one may take a million years, this may take two million years, but effectively unsolvable. Similar discrete logarithms with large enough values, finding the index is considered unsolvable. So if you know the base, the modulus, and b, finding the discrete logarithm uh, is impossible. We'll come back to them and see how they're used in cryptography. And that's our next topic. So let's get to it. Any questions before we move away from the theory onto the application in, in security? Next topic, public key cryptography. What have you done? Crashed. So all of the security schemes we've seen up until t today have been symmetric key cryptography. Encrypt with one key, decrypt with the same shared secret key. Now we're using to, moving to a different approach, public key cryptography. Let's look at the principles and then an example. So it's reported that around the 1960s, the NSA in the US discovered the concepts or developed the concepts for public key cryptography. Similar organization in the UK uh, uh, around the same time or the 1970s, that's the first known report but it was only made public in 1976. Two guys, Diffie and Hellman, come up with this idea of public key cryptography. So that was the first that the public knew of this concept. Uh, and it was only till later that NSA and, and uh, the government headquarters in, in the UK started to advertise that they already knew about it. So it's only been around for 40, 50 years. Caesar cipher has been around for, what, 2,000 years. So it's relatively new. The idea is to use two different keys for our encryption and decryption, not using a shared secret key. The motivation of Diffie and Hellman to come up with this idea was to, when you use secret key encryption, you often rely on someone generating the key for you and giving you the key. You often need to trust someone else with a key to make it easy to distribute. They wanted to develop a way to avoid relying on other organizations to, to trust with your key. And so you can do it just direct between two users. And to do things like digital signatures, which is someone can take some document, say electronic file, and attach their signature to it, 
such that at a later time anyone can prove that it came from that person. That's your idea of a signature. You sign a document, the concept is that later someone can see that document and prove that it came from you, that you have approved that document because it's got your signature on it. They wanted to, to provide this functionality and they come up with public key cryptography. So the principles. Symmetric algorithms use the same secret key for both encryption and decryption. Asymmetric algorithms, which is another way for public key cryptography algorithms, asymmetric, use one key for encryption and a different but somehow related key for decryption. So two different keys, they're not random keys, but they're related in some way. Usually they require that asymmetric algorithms that it's hard, computationally infeasible, practically impossible, if you know the algorithm and you know one of the keys, to find the other key. Sometimes it's useful to have to be able to use the keys in opposite orders, but we'll ignore that last point. We'll come to it when we need it. So we have now have two keys. Encrypt with one, decrypt with the other. And the requirement is that if I know an algorithm, I know one key, it should be hard for me to be able to determine or calculate the other key. So in fact we have two keys, we talk about a key pair. And one's a public key and one's a private key. So we talk about a public-private key pair. And in most systems, the way that it works, each user in that system has their own, care, own key pair. So we denote that for user A, they have two keys, the public key of user A and the private key of user A. So the private key of Steve and the public key of Steve. I have my own key pair. You have your own key pair. Everyone has their own key pair. Often created by yourself. And we'll see the ways for creating them later. They're not random numbers. Okay, the, the key values are not random numbers. They are uh, related somehow. A public key, as you guessed by the name, it can be made public. That means if I have my public key and private key, the two values, I can tell all of you my public key. It doesn't matter. It's available to everyone, anyone who wants it. My private key, again, should be secret. It should be private to me. So I have my key pair, I tell everyone you I tell everyone my public key, but I keep my private key secret. I don't tell anyone. That's the assumptions that uh, our keys rely on. And then, all right, let's see these for secrecy and authentication with some pictures. Uh, to explain how we use those keys. So the concept, let's say I want to get a message from A to B confidentially. We have a message M, the plain text. This is user A on the left, user B on the right. We want to get a message from A, from a to B such that no one else in between can read the message. We want confidentiality. Both users have their key pair. So we can say user A has a key pair, user B has a key pair. To achieve confidentiality, what we do, user A on the left takes the message, uses a public key encryption algorithm, E, and uses the public key of the destination. So if user A is sending to B, and they want this message only to be read by B, then user A encrypts the message using the public key of B in this encryption process. And the result we can write as we encrypt using the public key of B, message M, and we get some ciphertext as output. We send the ciphertext across the network. 
the destination B receives the ciphertext, and to decrypt, they use their corresponding private key. If a message was encrypted with B's public key, our algorithm should be such that it will only successfully decrypt with B's private key, or the other key in the key pair. So what B does, they take the ciphertext C, their private key, PRB, and decrypt using our algorithm. And if our algorithm is designed correctly, they'll get the original message as an output. So we'll get the plain text back. So if we want to have confidentiality with public key encryption, and this is an important point to remember, the concept is always encrypt with the destination's public key. We'll look at the algorithms for E and D uh, in this topic, but the concept in general is you encrypt with the destination's public key, and the destination decrypts with their private key. And because... Why does it work? Well, the keys should be related in such the way that it will only successfully decrypt if we use the other key in the key pair. We have a key pair, P-U-B, P-U-R, uh, P-R-B. Public key of B, private key of B. If we encrypt with the public, B of, public key of B, we can only decrypt with the private key of B. That's the, the requirements of our algorithm. Now, why does this provide confidentiality? Let's say a malicious user intercepts the ciphertext. They have C. They want to find M. So they have C. They need to decrypt C using some key. But the nature of the algorithm should be such that we can only decrypt the ciphertext using the other key in the key pair from which it was encrypted. This ciphertext was obtained by encrypting with the public key of B, therefore it will only decrypt with the private key of B. And by definition, the private key of B is known only to B. It's private to B. So a malicious user cannot decrypt because they don't have the private key of B. So no one can intercept and find the original message M unless we know that private key. Only the pro person with the private key can successfully decrypt. For this to work, we need to design an algorithm such that it will successfully decrypt and a way for generating the keys such that it will work in this manner. So this is just the concept. How does it actually work depends upon the algorithm. But people have designed algorithms that meet these requirements, so it does work. We'll come back to authentication. We can use the keys in the opposite order, but we'll come back to that after we go through an example of an algorithm to see that in use. What have we got? Let's go direct to an algorithm. We'll come back to the applications after we see a detailed example. Let's get to one. And the most common and maybe the first algorithm or one of the first few algorithms that was developed and still used widely today, RSA. We're going to go through it in detail, see how it works, and we may see another algorithm in a little bit less detail a little bit later, maybe after the midterm. So RSA is one algorithm for public key cryptography. There are others. But this is one of the most widely used algorithms. Where does the name come from? It was developed by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Len Edelman. R, S and A. Okay, so the name comes from the three people who developed this algorithm. So in 1978, these three researchers developed this algorithm and then they started a company to sell products that implemented the algorithm called RSA Security, eventually sold to some other company, so still part of another company now, RSA, uh, EMC I think is the company. 
It's the most widely used public key algorithm. And the way that we think of the plain text and cipher text is uh, integers, numbers. It's a block cipher. We take a block of text, an integer, and we encrypt it using RSA. And commonly it's just used on small inputs, but we'll come to that after we go through how RSA works. So going back to our general approach for public key cryptography, we need an encryption algorithm, we need a decryption algorithm, and we need some way to get the keys. Unlike symmetric key cryptography, the keys must be generated and they're related in some way. In symmetric key cryptography, we normally just create a random key, a random sequence of bits. But here, we have an algorithm for generating the public and private key, because for the decryption to work, those keys must be related. So with RSA, there's a key generation algorithm, we'll go through the steps, then there's an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. And we can describe the whole algorithm of RSA on this single slide. Remember back to DES, simplified DES even. If you remember back to that lecture, DES, there are many different algorithms of uh, the, uh, the generating the subkeys, the S boxes, the, uh, the different rounds, and we repeat the rounds with DES, uh, the 16 rounds. Uh, the many large S boxes and so on. That was quite complex. Encryption with RSA is simply take our message as an integer, raised to some power, mod by n. So conceptually, it's very, very easy. It's just doing exponentiation in modular arithmetic, modular exponentiation. And decryption is just as easy. It's the same algorithm, just we vary the numbers that we use. To decrypt some ciphertext, we take the ciphertext, raise it to some power d, mod by n, and we get the original message back. Very simple algorithms conceptually to implement and to uh, a little bit more complex, but compared to our block ciphers, our symmetric block ciphers, uh, much simpler. For this to work, we need to generate the keys correctly, and that's what we'll go through first, the way of generating the keys, and then we'll look at an example that uh, shows how it works. So what happens is that each user in the system generates their own key pair. So imagine every user goes through the key generation steps, and at the result of the key generation, each user has a key pair. Once each user has a key pair, we can encrypt and decrypt using the correct key. So let's go through key generation first. First step to generate your own key pair, what you do is choose two primes P and Q, two prime numbers, and then you calculate N as the multiplication of those two primes. Let's do it in an example. Actually, I don't want that. Let's go through an example where we generate our keys. For the example, we're going to use very small values, just so I can calculate them. We can always do it in our head, but we'll talk later about in practice. So first, RSA key generation. And you think each user does this, they do it independently. So the first step is to choose two prime numbers. P and Q. 
two prime numbers, okay? I'll choose two that I can calculate easily. P17, Q is 11. Okay. We'll talk later about what are the recommended values, especially regarding length. But the concept is the same. And then we calculate N, which is P times Q. We hit 187. So that's the first step in generating our keys. The next step, we're going to need the totient of n. We're going to use the totient of n to find some other value e. But so let's first work out the totient of n, Euler's totient. What's the value? The totient of n, n in our case is 187. Quickly find the answer. The totient of 187. The totient, remember, that the number of numbers less than 187 which are relatively prime with 187. So we, in the very basic form, we say, all right, number one, is it relatively prime with 187? Or what does relatively prime mean? It means are the two numbers have a greatest common divisor of one. One and 187, greatest common divisor, one. Okay, relatively prime. Two and 187, what's the greatest common divisor? If it's one and relatively prime, 3 and 187, 4 and 187, and so on. What's the answer? How many numbers less than 187 are relatively prime? 160. 160, okay. He calculated quickly. We don't do it the manual way. Okay. We've got a formula that will help us solve this quicker. If we go back to our number theory, one characteristic of the totient of n is that the totient of, I'll just write it here, the totient of a prime number is p minus 1. Because the number of numbers less than that prime, which are relatively prime with that prime, is all of them. So the numbers less than p, there are p minus 1 values. So the totient of a prime is p minus 1. And it can follow from that the totient of two primes multiplied together, remember P, n is just p times q, is the totient of the primes multiplied together. So let's write that. 187, we know, because we just calculated it, is 17 times 11. So do it on the full way. 17 is a is a prime, 11 is a prime because we just chose them that way, so it's equivalent to the totient of 17 times the totient of 11. That's true if they are prime numbers. And the totient of 17 is 17 minus 1, and the totient of 11 is 11 minus 1. So the fact that we chose the primes means we can quickly solve the totient of the multiplication of those two primes. That's going to be needed in step two. Step two is select some value e, some integer e, such that it is relatively prime with a totient of n. And it's stated on the slide here is that e and the totient of n, the greatest common divisor, is 1. Or in other words, the two values are relatively prime. So find an e which is relatively prime with 160. And it should be less than the totient of n. There may be multiple values. Find one. 
Start small. Find an, a, a number that is relatively prime with 160. Small as possible. Uh, sorry, E should be greater than 1 and less than the totient of N. Okay, so not 1. Th there are multiple answers. Okay. So it needs to be a number which has a greatest common divisor with 160 of 1. 7, yeah. So greatest common divisor with 160, it's not going to be an even number. 2 has a greatest common divisor with 160 of 2, so that's not an answer. 3 and 160. 4, 5, 6. Try some numbers. Let's try a few. So uh, we have the totient of 187. Find an E. We want the greatest common divisor of E and 160 to be 1. So an E should be greater than 1 and less than 160. That's the condition. So you can test them, okay? In, in a very simple form. 2 and 160, no. They don't have a greatest common divisor of 1. 3 and 160, yes. That one's okay. 4 and 160, in fact, all of the even numbers have a greatest common divisor, or have a divisor of at least 2. So the, the, we can rule out the even numbers. 5 and 160, greatest common divisor, is it 1 or higher? It's higher. 160 has a divisor of 5, so we cannot use 5. 7? Check. It's OK. 160 will not divide by 7. 7 is a prime number. And we can keep going. 9? I think you'll find 9 is OK. 11? is also okay. There are multiple answers here. Many or multiple numbers between 1 and 160 which are relatively prime with 160. Choose one of them. That's the step 2. And that's the value E in our algorithm. And I would choose because I've got the answer 7. Next. So that was step two. Step one, choose your primes, calculate n. Step two, calculate the totient of n and find e. Select an e. Such that it is relatively prime with the totient of n. Step three, find some d, or calculate d, such that D is the multiplicative inverse of E in the in mod the totient of N. So D times E mod the totient of N should be 1. That's our requirement. Find D. E, I chose a 7. Find D. In other words, E and D are multiplicative inverses. Multiply them together, we get 1 as the answer. When we mod by the totient of N, which is 160. So, E, you're correct, E times D mod our totient of n, 160, should equal 1. E is... 
Let's get rid of E. E is 7 in our case. 7 times D mod 160 equals 1. What value of D? And you can manually try some different values. Okay, so the, the very basic way, 7 times D mod 160 equals 1 means 7 times D should be either 161 or 321 or 481 or some other value. Why? Because when we mod by 160, we'll get 1. So that's the basic way. That is, if 7 times D, if it equals 161, then 161 mod 160 gives us 1. Is there an, and remember we're dealing with integers here, is there a D such that multiplied by 7 we get 161? Well, in other words, 161 divided by 7, do we get in an integer? Yes, D equals 23. So we've got our new parameter D. There are in fact algorithms for the computer to do this, to solve it quite quickly. To find such a D, it's not so hard to find with, a, with an algorithm. There are algorithms that will do it for us. If you want to do it manually, then basically you look at what number when you multiply with E gives us 161 plus 1 or 2 times 160 plus 1, or 3 times 160 plus 1, because all of those numbers mod 160 will give you 1. We're done. We've generated our key pair. The values which are generally considered our key pair, the public key is E and N, the private key is D and N. <coughs> But in practice, some other values are often stored as well, especially P and Q. They are also private. It depends upon the implementation. But P and, P and Q must be kept secret. One way to keep them secret is to delete them. You generate them using a computer, two large primes, go through these steps, get your value of E, D and N, then delete P and Q, so then no one can find it. But it turns out to help with the implementations, it's usually useful to keep those values. We use them later. But in, in theory, you don't need them. In practice, we often do. So let's write down our key pair. And I'll denote as the public key of our user what do we get? E was 7, N is 187, and the corresponding private key in this pair, D, is 23, N is 187, the same N. A little bit conflicting in the words or the terminology here. We said the public key is made public. Okay, we can tell everyone. My value of E is 7. My value of N is 187. I can tell everyone once I've generated these. The private key should be kept private. I should keep it to myself, not tell you. But often, because we use N, we also write it in the private key. N is not private. N is public because it's in the public key. But we often write it as part of the private key as well because we use it when we do the encryption and decryption. So be careful. There are really three values here, E, N, and D. D must be secret. Don't tell anyone your value of D. E and N can be public or, and are made public. But often we write the private key as also including N. So I generate those values. I tell you my public key. Yep. Like if you know E and M, can't you calculate D? 
If you know E and N, can you calculate D? Uh, no, if the numbers are big enough. And, and I think we'll run out of time today, but in the next lecture we'll go through and see, well, what can an attacker do when we have large enough numbers? For today we'll just get to, let's use the algorithm. The next lecture we'll analyze and see, well, why does it work? For now I think we won't get time to see why it works. We'll just see how it works, uh, how to use it. But you're on the right track that we need to start asking, well, what does an attacker do? We will come back to that. So for now, we've generated a key pair. Everyone does that, generates their own key pair. You tell everyone else E and N, you don't tell anyone D or P or Q. They must be kept secret. Now you want to encrypt some message. Where are we? Here, sorry. Let's say this is the key pair that we've generated for user B. User B did this. And A wants to send a message to B. And we want this message to be secret, to be confidential. What do we do? We have some message, we want to send it to B. What we do is we take that message and we encrypt it using the RSA algorithm and to keep the message secret we encrypt it with B's public key. Okay. So to send to someone else, use their public key. What's the message? My message is a complex one. It's 88. The plain text in RSA are just integers. So let's say you have a sequence of bits, like an ASCII message, a hello. You must somehow represent that as integer, just as one number. Because the encryption operation operates on that integer. And that's easy to do. If you have an ASCII, you can create the, uh, the binary form of each letter, H, E, L, L, and O, get it in 8-bit values. And then you can combine those uh, five 8-bit values, you get 40 bits, and that can be your integer. So you can convert any message into a single number. The constraint is that the, the integer m, your plain text that you want to send, must be less than the number n. Our n is 187, so we have must have a plain text which is less than 187. So I've chosen 88. What does 88 mean? Nothing in this context, but uh, with a larger example it could have some meaning. And then we use this equation to encrypt. Take your message, raise to the power of E, mod by N, and you get C. So A does that. A wants to send the message to B to encrypt, they use B's public key. The value of E is 7 and N is 187. What's the answer? You can go and do it on pen and paper. Remember last week we showed you how to do the modular multiplication or exponentiation. You can break it into 88 squared three times and then times by 88. You don't need to do it. I've got the answer for you. I don't know if my calculator will do it. 88 to the power of 7, mod 187, 11. Okay, so we can calculate that. We send that across the network, the value 11. Again, I know it's hard to, to visualize, but the value of 88 is our plain text. 
It has no meaning in this example, but if we had a much larger numbers, we could have the integer to represent any information just by converting that information to binary. We send the ciphertext across the network. B, the receiver, decrypts. And the decryption algorithm is that you take C raised to the power of D mod by N and you should get the message back. Let's try. So B receives to get the message back, let's say M prime, the received value, they take C, 11, raise it to the power of D, D, it was encrypted with B's public key, therefore we decrypt with B's private key, in this case D is 23. N is 187 again. And I need my calculator. 11 to the power of 23 mod 187. Any guesses? 88. Magic. It works. That is, with these numbers at least, when we took 88 raised to the power of E mod by 187 and then took that value and raised it to the power of D, this other number, mod by the same N, we get the original message back. And that's what we need for encryption. We need to be able to encrypt, get ciphertext, and decrypt and get the original plain text. Otherwise it's useless. It worked in this case. It will work in all cases because of the way that we chose those keys, E and D. Why? All right, before we go through why will it work, any questions on the steps so far? Not on how we attack it, but just on how we generate the key and how we encrypt and decrypt. Any questions? So when we have a quiz on Thursday, if we have a quiz then you can encrypt with RSA, decrypt with RSA, generate RSA keys, at least for small values. All right, you need a calculator for this step. Well, you don't really. I could ask you, I wouldn't in a quiz, but I could ask you to solve it manually uh, by expanding it out. You could, but I'm not that mean. Uh, not in a quiz, in an exam, I'm meaner than that. So you may have to solve these manually, but the steps. You should be able to generate your own key pair using small numbers like I've just chosen. Any questions? First, well, the last thing today. Yeah. Why does it work? If we change M to a different value, will it always produce, when we get the ciphertext and decrypt with D, will we always get M back here? Well, yes, it will. Why? Let's have a quick look. Let's look in general, the equations. Sorry, C we start with. The first equation we have is C equals M to the power of E mod N. And the other equation we have is M, the decryption, is C to the power of D mod N. So let's start with the right one. Let's start here. M, so they are the two equations we have. We want to see if we start with M, encrypt, and then decrypt, will we get the original M back? Start with the right equation and do some substitutions. 
So that's just the right equation, the right-hand side. Now let's replace this C with this C. Okay, we know C equals m to the power of e mod n. Let's call this m m prime, meaning the, the decrypted m. We take our ciphertext, decrypt, and we get m prime. Now let's replace C with the top left equation. C is in fact created by taking m to the power of e mod n all to the power of d mod n. So I've just done a substitution in that case. We can expand this, that is m to the power of e mod n all to the power of d. We have the same properties in normal exponentiation. m to the power of e all to the power of d is what? m to the power of d all to the power of e in normal arithmetic. Equals with normal arithmetic m to the power of e times d. The same applies in modular arithmetic. And you can check and go back to our properties to see that. m to the power of e to the power of d is the same as m to the power of e times d. Mod n. Mod n. Well, we don't really need that. All I did was effectively bring this d inside here m to the power of e to the power of d is m to the power of e times d mod n, and we have the second mod n. But note, if you mod n multiple times, it's the same as modding n one time. 12 mod 10 is 2. Mod 10 is 2. Mod 10 is 2. If you keep modding 10, you'll still get 2. So it doesn't matter how many mod n's we have here, it's equivalent to just to 1 mod n. So it simplifies to m to the power of e times d mod n. So, if we take our original message m, raise it to the power of e times d mod n, we get m prime. Our encryption and decryption will work if m equals m prime. That's our requirements for successful decryption, to get the original m back. So, it leads to the question is, in what conditions does m equal m prime? If you take some number, raise it to the power of e times d, and mod by n, you get that same number as an answer. If we have those conditions, then our decryption works. And I'll write that a different way. Uh, yeah, one of our theorems from the previous topic is going to help us. Let's write it differently, but just change the variables. Instead of m prime, we require m prime and m to be equal. Let's say we require something like this. a equals a to the power of something, e times d, mod n. When do we have such a condition? And this will be our last thing we look at. I have to go back to last topic, which will give you the answer here. When does a to the power of something equal a in mod n? When that something is the totion of n plus 1. 
So we will use this theorem to find the conditions when RSA algorithm works. But we've run out of time. So the next step, what we'll do is we'll take this algorithm and we'll use it to find the last two conditions. That if we think of that as the Toshin out the the theorem was like this. Toshin at the end. Almost the same. When are when are these two equations the same? When are these the same? When E times D equals the totion of N plus 1. If we have E times D equals the totion of N plus 1, let's finish today. I mean, let's spend another minute to finish. Those two will be the same if this is true. When is this true? Well, when E times D mod the totion of N equals 1. That is, mod this by the totion of N, and you get the left side. Mod this side by the totion of N, divide by the totion of N, the remainder is 1. The totion of N plus 1, mod the totion of N, there's one left over. So that's our condition for when RSA will decrypt. And if you go back to the key generation, we have this condition. We chose a D such that when we times by E and mod by the totion of N, we got one. So the way that we generated the keys made sure that this condition was true which makes sure RSA decrypts successfully. So that's the way to show that RSA always works if you generate the keys in that that's approach with the algorithm we, we use. That's a bit involved. Try and understand, make sure you know the key generation, encryption and decryption, and then try and understand the concepts behind why RSA works. What we'll do next lecture is attack RSA. If we're the malicious user, how can we find the plain text given the ciphertext, or even better, how can we find the key, the private key, given just the public key or the ciphertext? We'll do look at that next lecture. Everyone's awake? Good. If you're interested in RSA, uh, you may have seen, or in security in general, sorry, I've got it somewhere, you may have seen in the news last week and this week and the technical news that people have come up with ways to break RSA. Researchers cracked the world's toughest encryption, they're referring to RSA, by listening to tiny sounds made by your computer or your CPU. The setup is a laptop here, decrypting with RSA, a microphone, it listens in to the CPU, actually listens to the noise it makes and it comes out of the fan of the, the, the laptop and then from that they determine the secret key just by listening to the CPU from a distance of one to four meters. It works and if you're interested this week I'm going to give a presentation, maybe at a lunchtime break, where there's no one, no one has any free time, about how it works. So I'll send out an announcement tomorrow, maybe. It's not required to attend, only if you're interested in knowing how, knowing how it works. It will most likely be Friday lunchtime. Then we'll, I'll give some plots and some results from their paper that show how that works. Okay, that will be breaking RSA. It's not needed for the lecture, only if you're interested. So again, this is our RSA encryption, decryption, and the other part, which is a bit harder to remember, but you should, and it would have helped you solve 
uh, that part C of the first exam question is the, the key generation. Now, with RSA, the security comes from using large numbers, not from using small numbers like in the exam. Of course, we can break that. It's using large numbers. And therefore, we need software to do the uh, encryption and decryption for us, and also, importantly, to generate the keys. With symmetric key ciphers, there's a shared secret key. How do you generate a key for a symmetric key cipher? Random, okay? You and I, we want to use AES to encrypt an, our data between us. We both need the same key, so what may happen is I choose a random number, a 256-bit key, a 256-bit random number. I generate it using some software, OpenSSL. I give you that random number, and that's the key that we will use. It's a shared secret key between the two users. But with public key crypto, the keys are generated according to some algorithm, not a random uh, number. So with RSA, here's the algorithm. So we can use OpenSSL to generate these keys. And again, the idea is that every user has a pair of keys, public and private key. So you generate your own pair. I'll show you how to do that with OpenSSL. And there are some notes on this I'll point to on the website. So I'll just go direct to the command. Uh, you can zoom in. We can use different software to generate the keys. And this is just one way to use OpenSSL to generate a public, or in this case, a public-private key pair, the operation GenPKey. We're using, sorry, we're using the algorithm RSA. There are other algorithms that we can use, but for this one, just RSA. And then we we don't have to, but in this case, I'll specify two key options. This dash, it continues across the next line, dash P key OPT. An option for the key. We can specify some optional parameters. The first optional parameter is the key length. With RSA, the key length is really the length of n, the modulus n. So I specify I want n to be 2048 bits. And oh, right. uh, we may have seen in the slides there are three typical values for n in common use, 1,024 bits, 2,048, and 4,096. The larger value, the more secure, but the slower it is to encrypt and decrypt. The second option is the public exponent. I specify in this case the public exponent, E, to be 3. So I can choose the value of E. If I don't give these options, OpenSSL will choose default values. And from memory, I think the default public exponent is 65,537. It's a common value. And it's probably best to use that compared to 3, but I just use it as a different example here, 3. And I can't remember the default size. Maybe it's 1,024. Everyone watch and see how long it takes. So I'm going to generate my key pair. Right, almost instantaneously. It took a bit of time. You see some dots and so on. It takes some time because what just happened then was my computer chose two primes, P and Q, such that when those two multiplied together, we got a 2048-bit number n. Then it selected some value e. Well, that was already selected, 3. But it calculated d, which is uh, the multiplicative inverse of e in the mod notation of n. So these steps were performed by OpenSSL in that case. And we get a public and private key. Let's look at the values. 
it was saved in a file called I call privkey.pm. PM is just the format commonly used. So my key pair is saved in this file. It's 1704 bytes long. Let's look at the contents. Should we have a quiz next week on the contents of this file? I think you should be able to do this. You can try it at home. Zoom out. Try again. There's my key pair. Now, we need to explain the, the format of this. I generated the key pair. We'll see the detailed values in a moment, but what OpenSSL does by default in this, this format of the output is it, it encodes the, the values into some form that can be printed on the screen and, for example, included on a web page. So this is not encrypted. This is what we say is encoded. In the same way that we have ASCII encoding to encode uh, our different characters into some decimal or some binary value, we can have different encodings, and this is one encoding uh, called base base 64 encoding that takes some binary values and encodes them using, uh, I think it's one of 64 different characters, and that's the combination here. So it makes no sense here, but that's all the information needed because a decoder will find the original values. So often you'll see not private keys, but when we look at public keys, you'll see some encoding like this, say, attached to the bottom of an email or on a web page. Let's look at the actual values. Let's decode this. And the way to do it, OpenSSL has an option. We can output it in some nice-to-view text format. Take our input private key and produce an output in a text format and so I can scroll through or pipe it into less. Gives us the original form and we scroll down then it gives us end and now it gives us the human-friendly form. A little bit more human-friendly than the first one. It gives us the private key, the modulus, end. Okay, there's the value of n. It's 2048 bits, but it's represented in hexadecimal here. So if you convert, you'll get this as a 2048-bit number. The public exponent, e, so e is 3 in, in decimal. The private exponent, d, is the next value. Don't look at this, because this is private for me. Again, a another large number. So this should value is the secret value that it should be specific to you and not shared with anyone else. Right? It's just a demo in this case. So really we have three values, E, D, and N. D must be kept private. E and N we make public. But for performance reasons, for the implementation, we also store some other intermediate values. So we just really need E, D, and N, but OpenSSL and other software store some other values to, to help the, the speed up the encryption and decryption. So we see prime 1 and prime 2. Recall what happens in the key generation is that we have a prime P, a prime Q, we multiply together to get N. This is P and Q, I don't know which order, it doesn't matter. There are two prime numbers here. So they are our large primes. Again, must be kept private, because if someone else knows these primes, then they can easily break uh, anything encrypted using your public key. And then some other intermediate values are stored. Not so important for you to know about these. Uh, there's two other exponents, some other coefficient. Again, just for implementation purposes.
those values which are stored in your key are listed here on, on one of the slides. You can go back and check that. But there's a modulus n, the public exponent e, the private exponent d, now the three values that we always think of, where, and we write it, where we often write that the public key is E and N, modulus and public exponent. The private key is D and N, private exponent and the modulus. The remaining values are there for uh, speeding up the encryption and decryption when we use these keys, the two primes and these other exponents and coefficients. Not so important to rem remember or worry about these. They should be kept secret. When you have them, you shouldn't show anyone else what the values are. Otherwise, they can defeat the RSA. So really, the public values that you can tell anyone else are N and E. The other values are kept private or secret. So I have a private key. Your next homework task is to generate your own keys, key pairs, and we'll need to exchange some values and do some encryption and authentication using those key pairs. So the private key, from that, we can extract the public values only. So the, the values in the file so far are all of these. We can extract just N and E. And the way to do so with OpenSSL, we can extract just the public values. We take out, sorry, we take our input private key, which contains all values, and output to some file I'll call pub key, and specify to just output the public values so that we hide or don't uh, display any of the private values. So our private key contains all values privkey.pm public key contains just n and e and what you'll do in your homework is once you generate these, the public key you can then tell anyone else. You can send anyone this file, for example, attach it at the bottom of an email, put it on a web page, because it contains your public values. And we can look at them. Output into some text format. So take my public key, specify it's a public key coming in, and display the output as text. And just so we can scroll through, I'll pipe into less. And here's the encoded format of my public key. So if you want to attach your public key to your email, when you send someone an email, you can attach just this encoded form, because software will be able to decode it. But here are the actual values. The public key, 2048-bit modulus in hexadecimal. And the exponent E, E equals 3. So the two public values of N and E. That's all we'll attempt to cover today because no one's too concerned. So next week, we'll move on to the next topic. There's another algorithm for public key crypto, Diffie-Hellman, that we need to cover, and then uh, authentication. Focused so far on confidentiality, encrypting messages so no one can see the contents. But another key part of security is making sure that we can confirm 
Who did the message come from? You receive a message. Did it come from Steve or someone pretending to be Steve? Like a masquerade attack. So we need techniques to confirm that. And we will use public key cryptography again to do that, as well as some other t techniques. So that's the next topic. So we got to this approach of using a public key authority. But before we, we come back to this authority approach and look at the another one, let's just make sure everyone understands the problem. I'm just going back to our man in the middle attack. This was a scheme we used to distribute a secret. And that's what we'll, we're trying to do. A wants to communicate with B. To do so, they want to encrypt their communications and using a symmetric key algorithm. So they want to encrypt everything using some secret key and in this scheme it's denoted KS. So KS is their secret. But they don't know it yet. So they haven't communicated in, in the past. So this scheme uses public key cryptography to exchange that secret where A sends its public key to B saying I am A I want to communicate with you let's create a shared secret so that's step one we send our public key to A uh, sorry we send our public key to B B generates a secret it creates KS let's say generates a 256-bit random value and that will be the secret that they use for AES to encrypt the data. So B creates KS and is going to send KS back to A but of course we cannot send the secret in the clear. It must be encrypted because if we send it in the clear across our network then someone can intercept and find our secret. So what B does is encrypts the secret KS using the public key of A so that if someone intercepts this message, message number two, they need the private key of A to try and decrypt and get KS. Without the private key of A, they will not be able to learn KS. And who has the private key of A? A does. That's our uh, understanding of public key cryptography. Only A has the private key of A. So the idea is that B sends this encrypted message back a receives it, decrypts using the private key of A, and learns KS. And from then on, they use KS to encrypt their data. KS and some symmetric key cipher. So this is a common technique that we use a public key and public key encryption to encrypt a shared secret key. And once that secret key is shared, we use that secret key, secret key to encrypt using a symmetric key algorithm. Because symmetric key algorithms are much faster than public key algorithms. But we saw that there's a problem with this. We went through, and I don't have the picture here, but we went through and you went through and tried to work out, well, what could an attacker do? And come up with this man-in-the-middle attack. A sends the message to B, but someone in the middle modifies that message, in particular uses a different public key. Just to remind us of what, what it is, the man in the middle attack involved A sending a message as per the original scheme, public key of A and the ID of A but the man in the middle, that is C, intercepting and modifying such that they send, so this is C receives that. You've drawn this before. They change the public key to theirs. They don't change the identity. B receives that. So C is somewhere in the middle of the, the path for the network. They receive the message before it gets to B and modify the public key. B thinks it got a message from A, 
B chooses KS and sends that KS back to A encrypted with the received public key. B thinks the public key of A is this value, but it's in fact the public key of C. So B encrypts KS using the public key of C, not knowing that, thinking it's the public key of A. As a result, when C intercepts the reply, it can decrypt and learns KS. C can decrypt because C has the private key of C. And then C sends back that same KS to A, but encrypted with A's public key, which is of course known. And when A receives this reply, they decrypt with their private key and they learn KS. So we've gone through this attack of this man in the middle attack, just to remind you that someone in the middle intercepts the messages and changes the public key. So this is not good. So the, what we're dealing with now is ways to make sure that the public key we have, when B receives a public key, B needs to know this is A's public key. They need to be sure whose public key it is, otherwise such attacks are possible. So what we're dealing with is ways to prevent these attacks. And so to prevent a man-in-the-middle attack on the public key, we need some secure way to, to distribute public keys. And we went through this scheme first. The way to securely distribute public keys is to get someone else to confirm they are indeed someone's public key. So in this case, we introduce this new entity called the public key authority, who everyone trusts. So it assumes that this authority is trusted. And that includes that everyone knows the public key of the authority. If you know the public key of the authority, when the authority sends you a value and signs that, so in message 2, this public key of B was signed by the authority, A can verify that. Because when something's signed with a private key, we verify that with, a, with the corresponding public key. So this scheme is really a way so that A and B can exchange public keys and they're sure they are the correct public keys. It's not a man-in-the-middle attack like in the previous uh, approach. And the way they do that is that the public key of B is signed by the authority and the public key of A in message 5 is signed by the authority as well. And since they are signed by the authority, both A and B can verify them by decrypting with the public key of the authority. And that comes back to our assumption that A trusts the authority, which really means A has the public key of the authority and knows for sure it is the public key of the authority. It's not someone pretending to be the authority. So we, we have that assumption. Maybe what happened is that A physically went to the authority confirmed their, their identity and got the public key then. So this is just one scheme for distributing public keys so that if someone tries to send a public key pretending to be someone else, we can detect that. It involves, if A wants to talk to B, A sending a request to the authority and getting the public key of B, identify contacting B, saying, I want to communicate with you. B does the same to learn the public key of A. And the last two steps are just to confirm that these messages are, are recent and not been replayed by someone else. And the end result is A knows B's public key and B knows A's public key. Easy. One of the problems with this approach is that Every time A wants to communicate with a new entity, we go through these steps of contact the authority, get the key, and the, the receiver contacts the authority, gets the key. Imagine there are thousands of entities in the network 
they all need to communicate with each other. There's many contacts to the authority and it becomes overloaded, it becomes a bottleneck. Many packets are sent to the authority which must respond quickly. If the authority cannot respond, then uh, A and B cannot communicate. So the next scheme is one way to improve that, mainly from a performance perspective, not from security. And it's called public key certificates. So we'll go through the general approach. Again, the same objective. A and B want to learn each other's public key. And they need to be sure that they're their public key, not someone else's. Similar approach, we have some third party to confirm whose key it is. And in the previous scheme it was called a public key authority. Here the more common name is a certificate authority. What happens is that A and B are issued certificates, denoted in this diagram as CA and CB. A certificate will contain the public key of that entity signed by the authority. And this is a bit confusing when we compare this diagram to the previous one. These four messages sent between A and the authority and B and the authority, note there's no numbers on them. They actually happen before the communications need to take place. So they happen manually. Whereas in the previous scheme we didn't draw the ones that happen manually. All seven messages happen automatically across the network in this case. Contact the authority, get a response. Whereas with, if we want to draw the equivalent to what we have here, a and B want to communicate using certificates. Let's draw it. The scheme is quite simple. A sends its certificate to B in the first message and then B responds with its certificate. So if we want to compare those schemes of using the, authority, the public key authority versus using the certificate authority, compare this diagram with this one. When we use the public key authority, every time A wants to communicate with someone, we go through these seven steps. Contact the authority, get a response. Contact B, who contacts the authority, gets a response. The problem was that there was many communications to the authority. When we use certificates, it's this approach. A wants to communicate with B. Quite simply, A sends its certificate to B and B responds with its own certificate. And we get the same security as in the previous scheme. So we need to go through what is a certificate and what does it mean and, and why this is secure. Now this diagram compared to this one, it's actually these two steps, step one and step two. That's all. It's just that this picture uh, it's a bit confusing. It includes the prior steps that must happen manually in advance, whereas the public key authority didn't include them. So note when we use certificates, every time A wants to communicate with someone, it's very easy. A sends its certificate to the destination, and that destination, let's say C, sends back its certificate, and then they're done. What's a certificate? In the same way that the, the public key authority signed A's public key, a certificate is A's public key 
signed by an authority. When we say signed by someone, we mean encrypted using th that signer's private key, confirming it came from that particular entity. So the certificate of A includes the public key of A signed by someone else, signed by the authority in our scheme. And in our diagram, back to the lecture notes, it's captured in these steps here, these two. So what happens at the start is user A goes to the authority and say, I want a certificate. Here's my public key. And the authority confirms that this is user A and this is user A's public key. So in a simple example, let's say I'm the authority and all of the users are the students in this class. So one student comes to me and say, here's my public key. And I look at your public key, I look at your ID card to confirm this is you. It's not someone pretending to be you. And I confirm, yes, this is you and this is your public key. Therefore, what I do is I issue a certificate. That's what the authority does. They create a certificate which contains the public key of that user, PUA in this case, the identity of that user, some timestamp, so T1 here is a timestamp saying that this certificate is valid from right now, maybe until six months in the future. And I sign that information. So the authority encrypts that information using their private key. So that anyone else who has the public key of the authority can verify. So think of a certificate as the public key of a user signed by some authority. And we'll see that a different format, this is the general concept, we'll see a more specific format in a moment. Similar, B does the same. B goes to the authority saying, here's my public key, and the authority creates a certificate for them. CB in this case. Now, note that these steps happen in advance. That is, whenever A wants to communicate with someone, all it does is sends its certificate. So once A has CA, its own certificate, if it wants to communicate with B, it sends CA to B. It doesn't have to contact the authority. If it wants to send, communicate with C, some other entity, it just sends its certificate to C. So it doesn't matter the destination, we don't have to contact the authority except in the very first instance. And that really cuts down on the communications because it's only that first step of being issued a certificate that we have to contact the authority. What is the certificate? What information is, is included inside? Here's one representation which is on the slide or on the, the diagram before where we said it includes the public key of A, the identity of A, some timestamp, because instead of having certificates which are valid forever, we have some time limitation on them. And importantly, encrypted using the private key of the authority. And that allows someone to verify it if they have the public key of the authority. So again, this comes back to trust. To be able to verify a certificate, you must have the public key of the authority, and you must know it is indeed the public keys, uh, the, the public key of the authority. It, it can't be someone else. So we must trust the authority. The certificates, this is the general concept, but we'll go through a, a more detailed view and, and look at some specific examples of how to store that information. That's what we'll do today. When we sign something, what do we do? When you sign, if you're using public key cryptography, when you sign something, how do you sign a message? How do you sign a message? Encrypt with something. Okay, you get an F in the exam if you say that. 
Anyone else? Encrypt with encrypt with a private key, still not enough. F for you, maybe a D plus because it's a bit closer. Encrypt with more specific. If you want to sign something, what do you do? All right, hash is, is, is good. You'll get an A if you say hash, but even if you just want a B, you encrypt w with the private key of who? You. That is, if you want to sign something, you encrypt with your private key. So make sure you're clear, because remember, everyone has their own private key. Think of all users have their pair of keys. So to sign something, you encrypt with your private key. Now, more specifically, we encrypt a hash of the message using your private key. The hash is there, there for performance reasons, not for security. So let's write that down. Here we haven't shown the hash function, but in practice we usually use a hash function even for certificates. So one way we can write CA We have the identity of A. That is some, something that identifies this user in the system. We have the public key of A. So the actual public key of the user. We usually include some timestamp. So denoted here T1, meaning some information about when this certificate was created and how long it's valid for. And all of that information is combined with the signature. And we create the signature by encrypting using the private key of the authority I'm going to run out of space the hash the hash of what? Um, I'm running out of space, you'll find more space the hash of all of this okay so this is our message This is the information we want to sign. Think of this as our message M. We take the message and combine it with a signature. This part is if we M is here, this part is the signature. The message is the information we want to communicate to someone, our identity, our public key, some timing information, a timestamp. We take that message and it's signed. We actually take the hash of the message and encrypt the hash value using the private key of the signer, the authority in this case. So someone else signs this message on A's behalf. So, message, signature, where the signature is the hash of the message encrypted with a private key. That's the same as we've seen all through the, the content on public key cryptography. So really a certificate is the public key and identity and some other information signed by an authority, signed by someone else usually. When B receives this certificate, so in the first message, these values are sent from A to B. When B receives it, what does B do? 
B receives the certificate, what does it do? Decrypt. Decrypt what? The signature. Okay? We the, the general process we say we verify. Okay? So we to verify we decrypt the signature S. We decrypt it using which key? The public key of the authority. Okay? So if it was encrypted with the private key of the authority, we decrypt with the public key of the authority, we get a hash value and we compare the hash value with the hash of the message. So this verification step. So we say the verification, verify, what do we do? We decrypt using the public key of the authority the signature component S here and we take a hash of the message component and then we compare them. So that's the verification step. Decrypt the signature, we should get a hash value, take a hash of the message and compare those values. If they're the same, everything's okay. If not, don't trust it. Okay, so this is the same as we've seen with all of our signatures. To do so, we need the public key of the authority. So for B to do this verification, it must know the public key of the authority and that's when we say we must trust the authority, including we must know the public key of the authority, and it, we must be sure it's, it's the authorities, it's not someone else's. Because remember, that's our problem. Our problem is, if you get a public key from someone, how do you be sure it's theirs? So we're saying that we have some initial trust that we are sure that the public key of the authority is indeed theirs. If we can do that, we verify the signature, meaning we now know the public key of A, and because we trusted the authority, we know that it is indeed the public key of A, because if it wasn't, the verification would fail. B, of course, does the same thing. It sends back its certificate and A verifies that. So same steps. Any questions? Yeah? How does an entity become a trusted authority? How, do, how, do we become, how does an entity become a trusted authority? So in, in a generic system, say, then an entity must be trusted by the users. How does it become trusted by the users? Well, it depends on what system. Let's say the system is we want to allow all students to communicate then one way to get a trusted authority is to choose someone that you all trust, maybe me, and I become the trusted authority. Of course, that assumes that you all trust me. If you don't, then that system won't work. So, in practice, in the internet, uh, how does someone become a trusted authority? Um, how do you trust me? Why do you trust me? Yeah, do you? Why would you, why do you trust anyone? Well, based on past experiences. Okay, if your past experiences are, with them have been positive, then you build up trust. Uh, so in t practice, certificate authorities in, in the internet usually are based upon organizations that people have dealt with in the past and have done things that have built up their trust. Um, but there's no absolute way to become a trusted authority. You must trust someone, otherwise uh, there's no way to, to bootstrap to start this off. Any other questions so far? This is important because when you open up your 
computer and you open a, a website, in particular a website using HTTPS to secure a, create a secure connection to that website, that web server is sending you its certificate. And we'll see some examples of that. So secure web communications uses digital certificates and therefore it's important to understand what they are, what the limitations uh, of them are, and how they provide security. Let's try our man in the middle attack. See what conditions a man in the middle attack would be successful. Yes, the, our assumption is that when we say we trust the authority, it means we know the public key of the authority. And our man in the middle, let's call them M. Uh, let's call them, because we may use M for the message, let's call them something else. Uh, D. Oh, I've got to choose a letter that we won't use. C we use for a, a certificate authority sometimes. F. Just so we don't get confused with some of the other letters we use. Remember our man in the middle? A sends data to B, but F intercepts. The malicious user intercepts and makes some changes. So A sends its certificate to B, but F intercepts. What can F do? Well, can F learn A's public key? Yes. The public key is included in the certificate, so F knows the public key of A. F wants to forward on a message to B, think, making B think it came from A. What can F do? Let's try. Some different things that F can try. Let's say F tries to create a new certificate containing its own public key. I'll call it CA prime. It's not CA, it's going to be modified. And how is it modified? Let's say CA prime contains the public key of F, the identity of A, a timestamp, just denote T, and the signature component. And again, I will not try and draw the rest, but the signature component is the entire message hashed and signed. So we'll, we've got some missing parts here, we'll come to them in a moment. So the certificate, remember, public key, identity, timestamp, and then take all of those values inside here, hash them, and encrypt with a private key. Who's private key? 
Whose private key do we encrypt with? Whose can we not encrypt with? Normally we'd encrypt, well, the signature is using the private key of the authority. But the malicious user F doesn't know the private key of the authority. So CA, maybe we can draw CA so people are clear. The original certificate, CA, public key of a, identity of A, timestamp, and then encrypted using the private key nah, of the authority. the hash of all of those three values. That's the original certificate. Public key, ID, timestamp, hash it all, encrypt with the authority's private key. But when F tries to send a fake certificate to B, they've modified the public key of A to be the public key of F hoping that B will receive this and use this instead of the public key of A. They don't change the ID, the timestamp, they copy from the previous one. They take a hash of all those values and encrypt with the private key. Well, the important point is that they cannot use the private key of the authority because they don't know it. It should be private just to the certificate authority. So let's denote, they use some private key X, the private key of X. Hoping to fool B into thinking this is the public key of A. B receives the certificate and verifies. So try the verification steps. Remember to verify, we take the hash of the received message, decrypt the signature. try to verify. Do we have a volunteer to come and do it on the board? Yep. What is X? Good question. F received the certificate CA. They want to change the public key. See, between CA and CA prime, the thing that's changed is instead of PUA, PUF. This is trying to do a man in the middle attack. So they change that. But they want to also change the signature. Remember, the message must come with a signature. So what they've attempted to do, they take the hash of these values and they encrypt using someone's private key. They should use the private key of the authority, but they don't know it. So I'm saying that they use some private key of X. It may be F's private key, but it's a private key which is not that of the authority. So it's a private key. B receives this. B verifies. And the verification steps are the same as always. We decrypt the signature component and compare to the hash of the message component. Remember, message component, signature component. 
try the verification. This is the message component and this part here is the signature component. So the verification by B decrypt the signature component which was the hash value encrypted with the private key of X and we're going to compare that to the hash of the message component. When B verifies, which key do they use to decrypt? No. The public key of the authority. B receives a message, a certificate. This certificate should have been signed by the authority, therefore to verify it, you use the public key of the authority to verify. So you decrypt the signature component with the public key of the authority. And again, our basic assumption is that every entity knows the public key of the authority. And it is indeed the public key of the authority. What happens in the first step when we decrypt and then compare to the hash of this value? Why? What happens? Are they the same? So once we decrypt here and compare to the hash, we need to check, are they the same? No, they will not be the same. Why not? A, a different key was used between the encrypt and decrypt. Here we use the private key of X to encrypt some hash value. The hash value was in fact the same as this but we decrypt that ciphertext using the wrong public key, using the different public key in the pair that was used to encrypt. And therefore, the resulting output will not be the same as the original input. It will not be the hash value. So they will not be the same. And when we compare them and find they're not the same, then there's an error. That is, the certificate fails the verification. We don't trust it. So when B receives this CA prime, as a result of the verification steps, it finds, I don't trust this certificate. Maybe report the error, or at least don't use the public key in, in future communications. So again, this is using the same concepts that we've looked at when we look generally at signatures. Any other ways to attack? What can F do? What can F do to try and fool B into thinking this is the public key of A, but it indeed is the public key of F? What we did was we changed the public key and then we tried to regenerate a signature but we didn't have the right private key to generate the correct signature so that was a failure here. Another way would be to change the public key but re just reuse the signature from the previous approach, the previous, the real certificate. But again you'd find out that the hash of this would not match the hash of the original value and therefore it would be detected. So changing just the message but not the signature would also be detected. So it turns out by using this signature then B can verify changes of the, of the message and therefore because we have the public key of the authority at B 
When we receive a certificate, we can be certain that we have the correct user's public key if it verifies. And B can do the same in the opposite direction. How did B get the public key of the authority? I know many people are thinking of that. Any suggestions? How does B get the public key of the authority? Could they use certificates? Yeah, if... So how does B get the public key of the authority? Because that's a key, an important part here. That is, to verify we use the public key of the authority because we assumed the signature was created using the private key of the authority. So, what if we... If the malicious user F created this signature using the private key of X and then F got B to think that the public key of the authority was actually the public key of X. So that would be a successful tack in that case. So we need to be sure then we, when we have the public key of the authority it is indeed theirs. If we use certificates we could do that but it means that we need another authority to confirm that this is the public key of the authority. Okay. Remember, all a certificate is doing is confirming this is the public key of a particular user. And it's doing so by having a, another user, the authority, confirming that by giving its signature. So to be sure that it's the public key of the authority, we could include the public key of the authority in a certificate and have it signed by someone else, by another authority. But for that to work, we must know the public key of that other authority. And we have this infinite loop. So we must trust one public key of one authority, at least. But we can have a hierarchy. It can be such that the public key of the authority is in fact signed by a higher up authority and that makes things more convenient in large networks. It turns out in practice usually public keys of authorities are stored in certificates as well. So we could say the certificate of the authority is the public key of the authority their identity a timestamp t some some indicator of how long this certificate is valid for and then a signature Again, we take a hash of those first three values in the signature. I just never have space to draw them. So this could be the certificate of the authority, including its public key, its identity, a timestamp, the hash of all of those values, and encrypted using the private key of who? of another authority or itself. All right, let's do another authority first and we'll see the, the hierarchy. Let's say it was encrypted using the private key of someone else. I'll say authority 2. You can see that. Someone else, some other authority meaning this public key is signed by a higher up authority. But then we have this same issue that the public key of this higher up authority, what is that? Well, it could be a certificate.
the certificate of this second authority, we don't have to be limited by a single one, is its public key, its identity, a timestamp, we haven't said too much about that, we'll come back to it later, encrypted, using someone's private key of the hash of all those values. Same structure. Public key, identity, timestamp, signature. Where the signature is those values hashed and encrypted with a private key. Whose private key? Who's private key? Hmm? Another authority, authority three. Okay? And you see where we get this, this continuation that someone needs to sign the public, public key. So we could have the private key of authority three. And then we'd need the certificate of authority three. Signed by authority four. And we'd go forever. Well, at some point in this hierarchy, we need a root. And the root authority has a special case certificate where it signs its own certificate. Let's say authority 2 is the root authority. It's signed by itself. Check the the public key and the private key, same entity. And we get what's called a self-signed certificate. So this is how the, the root authority distributes its public key it creates its public key, identity, timestamp, and signs it itself, saying, I confirm that this public key is my public key. And that's what we need to trust. That is, the other users need to trust this one so that they can confirm the lower level certificates. So if we trust this certificate, then we can confirm the certificate of the first authority, which in turn can be used to confirm the certificate of user A and other users that it's signed. So we can have this hierarchy of certificates, and at the top of the hierarchy is a root CA, and that has a certificate which we call is self-signed. The private key used there is the corresponding key of the public key inside the certificate. Self-signed certificate, it's like saying this, this piece of paper contains my public key and I sign it to confirm it's my public key and I give it to you. How do you confirm that it is my public key? Well, you cannot with a self-signed certificate. It's me confirming that it's mine. But anyone can do that. Anyone can say Here's my public key, and I confirm it's my public key by signing it themselves. So there's no security uh, measure in that. It's not secure, a self-signed certificate, because anyone can create a self-signed certificate. But in, in the digital certificate system, we need to be able to trust at least one self-signed certificate. So how would we trust it? then let's say it's an organization or an entity that everyone else trusts in that system and they, they implicitly trust that it is their correct public key.
we'll look at the X509 certificates. Uh, just some notation, just to summarize uh, this hierarchy. In this picture, we use some notation saying that a certificate of X is issued by some authority Y by denoting it as shown here. So let's use that in our example. Some shorthand notation that says we had the certificate of A was signed or issued by our authority. And the certificate of the authority, not good names, but our first authority, was signed by authority two. And the certificate of authority two was self-signed. Just a, a shortened way to, to write down who signs particular certificates. To verify one certificate, we must trust the certificate of at least one other entity. So to verify a certificate, we must trust or we must have the public key of the authority. And to verify that, we must have the public key of authority too, and we must, in this case, uh, trust the self-signed certificate of authority too. So we can build up a chain of trust amongst these certificates. So long as we have the root in the hierarchy, we can verify the others. Open up your web browser. People always sit in my classes with their laptops. Open your browser, do something useful, and access the Moodle website. Log in. If you're already logged in, log out and log in again. And I'll do it here for those that don't have their computers. So my browser, I access the Moodle website and I need to log in. Well, uh, here somewhere the login button. Log in. Now note the URL. Note in the top of the address bar there the URL ict.sit.tuacth slash Moodle. What protocol was used to access that website? HTTP, so accessing a, a web server, HTTP. Now I log in. And maybe you can see, I cannot zoom. When you hover over a link, usually your browser shows you the, the destination URL down the bottom. Note that the destination is HTTPS. What's going to happen when I click on the link? Those with the computers, click on the link. this connection is untrusted. If you didn't get that, then you've been hacked. Okay? Then your login to Moodle is insecure. So this is a warning message presented by my browser. And let's see what it says. You have asked... That, so this connection is untrusted. You've asked your browser to securely connect to ICT, SIT, TU, ACTH, but we cannot confirm that the connection is secure. Normally when you try to connect securely, sites will present trusted identification to prove that you're going to the right place. This site's identity, however, cannot be verified. So this is a message from my browser saying 
I cannot confirm, I can, uh, cannot verify that this is in fact ICT server. And HTTPS, which is what we're using here, uses digital certificates for servers to verify their identi identity to browsers. When you access a website, you would like to know that it is that website that you're setting up a secure connection with. It's not a man-in-the-middle attack. And this message is saying, well, we cannot be sure. Maybe someone between my browser and the ICT server is performing a man-in-the-middle attack. Because what's happened, and we'll see in details later, that the server has sent its certificate to my browser. And my browser has tried to verify the certificate, but reports this error saying it cannot be verified. So this is an example of receiving a certificate that is not trustworthy. So let's not trust that, and let's not go to that website. Let's try a different one. I open up a different website, again using HTTPS. Let's hope my internet works. Slowly. It's coming. Using HTTPS, and HTTPS uses digital certificates, and it's connected to this website. No warning. Which implies that the server, this fsf.org, has sent their certificate to my browser, and my browser automatically goes through the verification process. It tries to compare the signature with the public key and identity information, and if they're verified, it allows me to access the website. If it doesn't verify, then it presents that warning. And since it didn't present the warning, it was successful. Here I can see this little lock up the top, the padlock, and if I click on that, I can see more information. And it gives me a summary. Uh, the lock here. It says, you are connected to fsf.org, the domain, Verifi verified by Gandhi SAS. So this is giving me summary about the authority that has verified the identity of this website and more information. And your browser will show you, if you look into the details, the certificate of the web server. So here I'll view the certificate. And it gives me a summary of the certificate sent by the server to my browser. Remember, a certificate is a public key and ident identity of some entity in the network issued by someone else, signed by an authority. So it summarizes, it's issued to fsf.org and it's issued by some other organization. The common name is just the, the field which in, indicates the domain for this certificate. Also includes optionally organization, organizational unit, and some serial number for this certificate. So in practice, we don't just include the public key and one field for the ID, we can include other values. Issued by is the identity of the authority some organization called Gandhi Standard SSL CA. CA is short for Certificate Authority. And some organization name. And the timestamp. Here it's stored as or represented by two values. The date when this certificate was issued and when it expires. So certificates have a, a fixed lifetime or a finite lifetime. Let's look at the details. And again, my browser represents and shows that this certificate 
is actually part of a hierarchy. So the certificate for FSF.org was signed by an organization, Gandhi Standard SSL, and that certificate was signed by some other authority called UTN User First Hardware. It's just a short name for those authorities. So in fact, here we have a hierarchy, one certificate signed by another, which is then signed by a third. Similar to our example where we had a certificate signed by the authority, which was signed by authority two. So there are in fact three certificates here. The web service certificate, the first authorities, and then the topmost authorities, or the root authorities. The details of those certificates are included here. And the format is referred to as X509. There's a standard that says what, what's the contents of a certificate. And the name of that standard is X.509. So it's commonly used in, in certificates. There have been some different versions. And we'll look through some of the fields in there. It's on the slide here. It shows the different fields, but we'll use the example to see them. We have something identify the version of the, the certificate, that it's a standard used, X509, I think version 3, we'll see. A serial number that identifies the, this certificate, so each certificate gets a, a different serial number. Remember we sign, sign, the, sign the certificate, so we drew, generally we encrypt the hash value. Well, what algorithms do we use for the hash value and for the encryption? So it gives some values here. The issuer is the authority who signed this certificate. Validity is like our timestamp, not, be not valid before this date, not valid after some date, and the subject is whose certificate it is. And we'll have the subject public key information. Version 3, that's just the version of the, the, the format for this certificate. Some unique serial number, so another certificate would have a different value. The algorithms used in this certificate. The authority who issued the certificate, so some values to identify that organization. It's usually an organization can be a person, not valid before some time and date, not valid after some time and date, so after that date, whoever receives this certificate should treat it as untrustworthy, so they should be updated over time. The subject, and the important part is the common name which identifies in web browser, in web service certificates, the domain. So here, anything.fsf.org. So this certificate is, that, is for that domain. When you visit a website with that domain, this certificate applies. The others are just, I think, the common name, the organizational unit, are just uh, optional values. Then the public key information, the algorithm used, RSA, and the actual public key. Remember RSA, we have a public key which is E and N, and the private key D and N. So in the public key, N is the modulus, so there's the value, 2048 bits in hexadecimal, and E is the exponent. 65,537. So this is the actual public key, the RSA public key, for that subject, for the web server. There's some extensions, some extra optional information that can be used to support by the 
uh, the certificate authority. We'll not look at them. The algorithm used for signing, SHA-1 with RSA. That refers to, we find it, the hash algorithm, H, is SHA-1, and the encryption algorithm is RSA. So the signature algorithm refers to the two algorithms used here. We may use different algorithms, sorry. And finally, the actual signature. So this is the 2048-bit signature used, which is that S part when we draw it on the screen. That's the certificate of the, of the web server, fsf.org. It was issued by an organization called Gandhi Standard, SSL, CA. To verify this certificate, we need the issuer's public key, which is stored in the next certificate up in the hierarchy. The subject is Gandhi Standard, SSL, CA. The issuer, in this case, is UTN User First Hardware. So another authority. To verify this certificate, we need this UTN user first hardware certificate. And we see that up in the topmost of the hierarchy, subject, and the issuer. Anyone want to guess? Who's the issuer of this certificate? Who? Itself. At the top of the hierarchy, we will have a, a root certificate, and it's a self-signed certificate. So the subject is UTN user first hardware. The issuer is the same, UTN user first hardware. So this is a self-signed certificate. It's the same as this example where we had, think of this as the server's certificate, issued by one authority. That authority certificate was issued by a second authority, but that second authority certificate is self-signed by itself. It doesn't have to be two levels all the time. It can be a single level or it can be multiple. Let's go back to our first example just to finish. When I connected to ICT, what happened? It gave me a warning saying my browser could not verify the received certificate. Let's try again. Untrusted connection. Technical details saying the certificate is not trusted because it is self-signed. So the browser says, I've received a certificate from a server, but it's signed by the person whose public key is included. And if we want to access this website, we must manually trust the certificate. So I understand the risks, and we can add an except exception. We can actually view the certificate. In fact, since I run the ICT server, I've created a, a self-signed certificate because I haven't gone to the effort of creating a real certificate. And you can see it's out of date as well, okay, 2012. So this is the issuer and the subject are the same in this case. So be careful when you access such sites. If we confirm the exception and we manually trust it, then we get access to this site. Okay. I'm sure you've seen others like that. Next week we'll discuss some of the issues. Well, why do we have that? Why is there a self-signed certificate? And other issues of where did the... Why did the browser trust these other authorities? So whose certificates do we initially trust? Some of the practical issues 
to finish off on certificates, and that'll be next week. Any questions on certificates so far? We'll see a few more examples next week. You'll see some in your homework, which is yet to be released. It will be today or tomorrow. Any questions? You follow the certificates on your laptop? So the informal ho homework, when it access some websites and check the certificates from your browser, just so you can get some examples and see the, the general structure to start to understand what's happening. A formal homework will be assigned soon. <laughs>